Material and methods. A five-year-old boy presented uh, to our college with chief complaints of difficulty in breathing since one day. The patient's attendant gave history of aspiration of pearl from her necklace accidentally one day earlier. Management investigation chest X-ray PA view shows a radio opaque foreign body at the level of right main bronchus. This is a chest X-ray PA view showing foreign body at the level of right main bronchus. And treatment bronchoscopy was done using jet ventilation technique. Foreign body pearl visualized at the level of right main bronchus. Telescopic bronchial foreign body forceps was used. The surface area of foreign body was almost equal to the surface area of glottic chink. And the thickness of optical forceps prevented the removal of foreign body. And foreign body was slipping with optical forceps at glottic chink. Foreign body visualized at the right main bronchus. We have used a digit bronchoscopy with dormia basket. Uh, as the foreign body, we cannot remove it with optical forceps. We, we have used a dormia basket. And the thickness of this dormia basket guide white is, uh, was very thin, which facilitated better grip and successful removal of foreign body. Foreign body removed by dormia basket. Uh, this is the final picture of the foreign body with dormia basket. And discussion, foreign bodies in tracheobronchial tree may present with varied symptomatology. Not very often the history is contributory and diagnosis depends on high index of clinical suspicion, clinical signs and symptoms and radiological findings. Conclusion, foreign body aspiration is a common finding in children as the right main bronchus is wider, shorter and more straight than the left one. The foreign bodies are more likely lost in the right. Early diagnosis and removal of foreign body is essential to reduce complications and mortality. Reference, these are my references. Sir. Thank you. Okay, may I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is the, the most investigation you missed in this radiologically? Uh, radiologically. Actually, chest X-ray is enough to confirm the uh, no, no, foreign no, body. No, Later, no. after chest X-ray, we can do CT scan and. Uh, ah, that is the CT virtual scan. bronchoscopy. CT scan is. But uh, actually, in our case, sir, it is uh, uh, it is important. But in our case, we it is emergency, sir. The uh, uh, patient came with a uh, high uh, degree of difficulty in breathing and also choking and. Uh, uh -huh. uh, already it has been one day, sir. So we don't have uh, time and we have uh, immediately done a diagnostic uh, bronchoscopy and uh, we have okay. tried to remove the foreign so, bones. While doing bronchoscopy, yes, while yes. entering into the right bronchoscopy, what is the head position you tell me? 
head position should be like a rose position sir it is we should keep oh. the yeah yeah rose position. position okay but yes, to, to enter into the right pronkas what is the head position head head, head should be turned to which side that is most important while yes, you enter yes. left side it should... yes Yes. So head turn to the left side yes, sir. to enter into the right bronchoscopy. Yes, sir. That is the most important. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yes. So tell me the one one foreign body which requires uh, tracheostomy and removal, even though you have a upper bronchoscope. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, most, like common. most common, the bull, some metallic objects. Uh, oh, no, sir. So, one seed, which See, uh, peanut, uh, or not peanut, because it will swell. No, sir. I mean, oh, no, no, not peanut. Uh, the seed which is bigger than a peanut, which is very common uh, foreign body. It is uh, It is the tamarind seed. Uh, tamarind seed is. It is, uh, after going to the trachea, it yes, swells sir. like anything. You yes, cannot sir. remove through the bronchoscopy, through yes, the through yes, ocal cart. It is a Yes, sir. Okay. Ramesh? Asha? Sir, next. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next time. Next time. Already. Yes, next, sir. Next, Dr. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. I am stopping, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next candidate. Dr. Pujita, please respond. One second, Dr. Once the candidate finishes, other candidates should be ready with presentations. Share the screen and ready. Dr. C.H. Ravali. Dr. Prasad Reddy. Anybody of ready? Dr. Lochna Prasad Reddy. Arsha, Panjay, message with the chart. The next candidate ever ready. Well, respond to the next candidate. Okay. Message is good. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning, sir. I'm going to present a case of unilateral tonsillar enlargement presented as a large B cell lymphoma. It is a case report. A 56-year-old female patient, uh, Ramanamma, resident of Medchal region, came with a chief complaint of sore throat with enlarged tonsils since six weeks, which was not responding to her medication. She has no history of pain, fever, weight loss, nice sweat, respiratory distress, and no comorbidities. No history of family history and no history of addiction. There are no other ENT complaints. Local examination revealed a unilateral smooth non-tender mass on the right tonsil reached up to the midline with no symptoms of tonsillar congestion or any constitution some symptoms like ulceration or induration. A neck examination showed no enlarged lymph node. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy was done, showed no pathology or no mass in the nasopharynx. Uh, video laryngoscopy showed Video laryngoscopy showed no pathology and the ear examination was unremarkable. Uh, CT was done which showed a uh, solid tumor mass of the 
right palate and tonsil with no signs of lymphadenopathy and CT areas are normal. In other areas are normal. Based on the etiology, no significant family history in accordance with the clinical parameters. She was in a stage 1A. The, according to the patient symptoms and tonsillar hypertrophy, tonsillectomy was performed and the tonsil tissue was sent for the biopsy. And this is the biopsy report. Dr. Ali, can you share your screen? Dr. Poojita has unnecessarily interrupted her, sir, so I have expelled her from the presentation. We have clearly informed them not to disturb the presenters. Now, can you see, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. So this is the patient, sir. The, the local examination showed the right tonsil is enlarged and they reached up to the midline with no constitution symptoms like ulceration and induration. Neck examination showed no enlarged lymph node. DNA was normal and VLS was normal. Other uh, ENT examination was unremarkable. And uh, CT showed a solid tumor mass in the right palate and tonsil with no signs of lymphadenopathy and uh, other uh, CT areas are normal. Uh, based on the etiology and uh, no significant family history, she was in a stage 1A. According to the patient symptoms uh, with uh, tonsillar hypertrophy, so we went ahead uh, to do a tonsillectomy and uh, tissue was sent for the biopsy. This is the histopathological report, uh, which came as a diffuse non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and also undifferentiated carcinoma. Again, further, we went, uh, has sent for the tissue was sent for the immunohistochemistry. We stayed positive for uh, CD45. CD20 and negative, negative for uh, CD30, CD3, CD4, 5, 8, and 10. So patient was treated with the chemotherapy based on the arch of treatment, which includes rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxyribucin, benchristin, and prednisolone, along with the radiotherapy. Each cycle was given three weeks apart. Total of six cycles were given. And the patient tolerated well for the treatment and she would remain disease free during the eight months of follow up. So the lymphomas are broadly classified into the non Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma is further classified into the B cell and T cell. B cell includes diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell, Burkitt's, and marginal, lymph marginal zone lymphomas. In T cell, we have cutaneous, extra nodular, nodular leukemic, and T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are primary disorder of the lymph node and 40% of all these non-Hodgkin's arise from the extra nodal cells. So uh, DLBCL primary involves the lymph node and the extra nodal sites. In the extra nodal site, it, uh, GIT is most commonly involved. Next is the head and neck and the skin soft tissue. So in the head and neck, lymphoma occurs mainly in the valdius ring. So most of them arises from the tonsil, nasopharynx and the tongue base. So tonsil lymphomas occurs predominantly in the elderly males and majority are uh, tonsil lymphomas originates from the B cell, less from the T cells. So it is most uh, common histological type in its aggressive variety. Clinical signs and symptoms are non-specific occurs as a result of asymmetrical tonsillar enlargement. This may include a sensation of fullness of throat, dysphagia, odinophagia, otalgia and cervical lymphadenopathy. And uh, systemic symptoms such as fever, weight loss, and night sweats are uncommon and may develop in advanced disease. So early stage disease and small lesions had. Uh, yes, sir. I'll just skip this. Uh, so the patient further uh, ch chop has been used uh, standard therapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and uh, this is the drug and dosage where the rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxyribicin, vincristin, and prednisolone are used. So I would like to conclude, uh, finally, as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of Valdez lymph is uh, rarely, relatively a uh, rare identity, and uh, diffuse large B-cell type is a vast majority of them. Early stage disease and combined therapy consists of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which leads to satisfactory outcome in a patient with this uncommon neoplasm. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Sir, any questions from the judges, sir? Uh, for my side, no questions. Okay, sir. So we'll move on to the next presenter, Dr. Lochna Prasad Reddy.
Good morning, sir. Am I visible? Yes, please start your screen share. You are yes. audible and visible. Yes. Sir. Good morning, sir. Today, my case is an extensive rhabdomyosarcoma of ear with intracranial extension. So, rhabdomyos, uh, the temporal bone is the most complex anatomical region in the body and it contains the sensory organs of hearing as well as cranial nerve 7 and 8, internal carotid artery, and jugular bulb. Malignancy of the temporal bone is a rare entity, and 20 to 60 percent of temporal malignancies are from the auricular neoplasms. Another 25 percent is from EAC, and 12 percent is from the middle ear and the mastoid region. Rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common malignancy of the temporal bone in the pediatric population, and it has a locally aggressive spread with a propensity for distant metastasis. In the middle ear, it can also invade the fallopian canal and it can cause facial paresis and it can spread into the internal auditory canal and impinge on the other cranial nerves and meninges as well. The treatment of temporal bone rhabdomyosarcoma is multimodal therapy with surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In our case report, we have a case of a four-year-old female child who came with a history of a right ear discharge since two months, which was purulent in nature and it was blood tinged occasionally. There was a mass in the right ear canal since two months, which was gradually progressive in size. There was a swelling behind the right ear since one month with pus discharge since the last 15 days and deviation of angle of the mouth to left with difficulty in closing the right eye since one month. There were no nasal or throat complaints. Past history, birth and developmental history was normal. General and systemic examination was normal. And cranial nerve examination, all cranial nerves were normal except for right side facial nerve palsy, lower motor neuron, grade 4. On ear examination, as seen in the photo here, in the right side, in the preauricular region, there was fullness. The pinna was normal. In postauricular region, there was a swelling of 6 into 3 centimeter size, extending from the postauricular groove to 3 centimeter behind it, and superiorly from the roof of the EAC to inferiorly up to the angle of mandible. There was pus discharge and tenderness. In the EAC, there was a mass occupying the entire EAC, which was soft in consistency, and it was bleeding on touch. Tympanic membrane was not visualized on the right side and facial nerve showed lower motor neuron grade 4 palsy. On the left side, ear examination was normal. The nose examination, oral cavity, oropharynx and neck examination were normal. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy which was done under sedation was also normal. Imaging studies, HRCT and MRI temporal bone was done and there was a large ill-defined uh, enhancing soft tissue lesion on the right temporal bone which was extending into the middle ear causing the dehiscence of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. It was extending into the external auditory canal, parotid, masticator space, parapheryngeal space and it was also extending superiorly into the middle cranial fossa and impinging on the temporal lobe. This is the MRI and uh, HRCT, sir. So for management of this patient, the child was taken for surgery under general anesthesia after consent. A post-auricular incision was given, extending superiorly into the temporal region, and the tumor margins were delineated on all sides. It was excised from the parotid region, and the involved part of the parotid gland and facial nerve branches also were removed, and it was cleared from the EAC, the mastoid region, and the middle ear, and up to the petrous apex. It was also cleared from the parapharyngeal space, and the tumor had an intracranial but extradural component. So after removing the squamous part of the temporal bone, it was cleared from the temporal lobe, and the dura was repositioned, after which a blind sac closure of the external auditory canal was done, and the suturing was done in layers. Immediate post-op, there was improvement of facial nerve status to grade 2. Histopathology and immunohistochemistry were sent of the intraoperative specimen, which was reported to be rhabdomyosarcoma. These are the intraop pictures, sir, with the uh, uh, tumor excision. This is uh, after excision of the tumor, and this is the blind sac closure. After uh, Post-operatively, the child is undergoing chemotherapy and three cycles of chemotherapy have been completed with vincristin, actinomycin and cyclophosphamide. A whole body PET CT was done and there were no other metabolically active lesions anywhere else in the body. This is a picture of the child three months uh, post-op. Rhabdomyosarcoma is a common sarcoma in the pediatric population with head and neck being the most common place. More than 77% will present below the age of 12 okay. years. Uh, and also it is embryonal, alveolar and undifferentiated type and um, 
the protocol is a surgery followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So children who are presenting with otitis media, polyps, cranial nerve palsies, they should be evaluated for the same. And early diagnosis and multimodal therapy offer the best outcome. These are my references, sir. Thank you. Okay. Ramesh. Hello? Yes, sir. No, oh, it's okay. Uh, uh, next case. Oh. Should I leave the leave the uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, continue, Doctor. Carry on. Start. Okay. Good morning to all my professors my seniors and my colleagues. Today, uh, I'm going to present a case report uh, regarding the unusual presentation of cystic swelling of heart palate. A 33-year-old female came to ENT OPD with chief complaint of swelling over right side of the heart palate since one month. Patient was apparently asymptomatic one month back. Later, she noticed a swelling over right side of the heart palate, which is insidious in onset, non-progressive in nature, and not associated with pain. And there was no history of uh, ill-fitting dentures uh, or uh, any uh, history of trauma or radiation to the patient. Personal history, there were no addictions. Menstrual history, uh, it was regular cycles. Family history and past history are not significant. And general examination was normal. Coming to the ENT examination, oral cavity, mouth opening is adequate. Lips, gums, teeth, buccal mucosa, gingival buccal sulcus, gingival labial sulcus, bilateral retromolar trigone, and anterior two-thirds of the tongue were normal. Coming to the heart palate on inspection, approximately 1.5 into 1.5 centimeter swelling was present over the right side of the heart palate and mucous membrane over the swelling had a blue, bluish discoloration and surface appears to be smooth, margins appears to be regular and there were no sinuses or tracts. Extend vertically 1 cm away from the inner gingiva, extending from first premolar to the second molar, and horizontally 0.5 cm from the alveolar ridge and 0.5 cm away from the midline. On palpation, inspectory findings were confirmed. 1.5 into 1.5 cm swelling is present, and the mucous membrane over the swelling is bluish in color. Cystic, it is cystic in consistency and non-tender, and it doesn't bleed on touch. It is immobile. It was immobile. Surfaces were smooth, and margins were regular. Oropharynx was normal. Indirect larynx, laryngoscopy, neck examination, ear examination, nose examination were normal, and systemic examination was normal. My provisional diagnosis was mucosal over the heart palate. Coming to the treatment, after written informed consent, we have uh, taken the patient for the surgery, and the one we have done, transoral excision of the cyst under general anesthesia. We have taken an inverted U-shaped incision above the swelling, uh, and the flap was uh, separated from the periosteum and we have uh, removed the cystic wall uh, completely until the bare bone was visible and we have noticed a notch over the bone. Then we decided to send the sample cystic wall uh, for the histopathological examination. This is an intro picture after repositioning the flap and securing it with the sutures. And we have placed a palatal obturator over the palate to secure the sutures and to prevent the infections. 
coming to the histopathology report, uh, we have noticed uh, the section studied, we have noticed cystic spaces lined by low pubertal epithelium and subepithelium uh, showing chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates, uh, which, uh, which, suggest, which suggest to of necrotizing CLO metaplasia. And we have also noticed coagulated necrosis of the lobular SNA and there, there was uh, mucin pooling in the uh, section studied. These all, these all features are suggestive of a necrotizing CRLO metaplasia. Uh, coming to the discussion part, necrotizing CRLO metaplasia is a benign, self-limiting inflammatory reaction in salivary gland tissue, which may mimic squamous cell carcinoma or mucoepidermoid carcinoma, both clinically and histologically. Most commonly affected site is minor salivary glands of the palate. It can also be seen involving other sites like retromolar pad, gingiva, lip, tongue, cheek, nasal cavity, sinuses, larynx, and trachea. Coming to the differential diagnosis, uh, mucous Last one minute. squamous cell carcinoma, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, subacute necrotizing adenitis, major aphthous ulcer, and syphilitic ulcer. These are my references. Thank you. Any other differential diagnosis of a cystic swellings of soft palate other than this? Of dental. Sir? Dental origin. Dental or um, oroandral fistula. No. Common dental cysts, they can occur on the heart palate also sometimes. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay. Okay, next class, please. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'd like to present uh, my case uh, next, sir. Carry on. Yes, sir. I'm sharing the screen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Vasima Unisa. Uh, my case report today is unusual presentation of the mass on the base of the tongue, a case report. A 27-year-old female presented with chief complaints of swelling at the base of the tongue since two months. The swelling was insidious in onset, gradually progressive and attained the present size. The swelling was associated with difficulty in swallowing more to solids than liquids. It was not associated with any pain or any discharge. Patient was also not complaining of difficulty in breathing. There was no history of tobacco chewing or smoking. Past history was not significant. Family history was not significant. General physical examination was normal. Systemic examination was normal. Coming to the local examination, a single well-defined oval swelling, which was measuring 2 into 2.5 centimeter, 2 into 2.5 centimeters uh, on the midline, posteriorly one third of the tongue extending to the left valliculate. The surface of the swelling was smooth and covered with whitish slough. The margins of the swelling are irregular and the base was pedunculated. On palpation, the swelling is firm in consistency, non-compressible, non-tender, non-fluctuant, and there was no local rise of temperature, and the swelling was not bleeding on touch. The swelling was not moving with deglutition or protrusion of the tongue. The movements of the tongue are normal. No induration is noted. The teeth showed no dental caries. And the oral hygiene was maintained. Oropharynx was normal. On neck examination, neck examination was normal with no neck nodes palpable and the trach and the thyroid gland was normal. Ear examination was normal, other nose examination was also normal. Indirect laryngoscopy was done. The mass was present at the base of the tongue and the rest of the structures appears to be normal. 
to confirm the uh, to confirm the findings on indirect laryngoscopy video laryngoscopy was done the mass was present at the base of the tongue and the rest was normal so my provisional diagnosis was lingual thyroid so we have undergone the general investigations which was appear to be normal and t3 t4 dhs was also within the normal limits uh, ultrasound neck was done uh, we can see a well defined solid hypoechoic avascular lesion on the base of the tongue with well defined margins thyroid gland was present in the normal anatomical position to confirm the findings contrast enhanced ct scan neck was done we can see a lesion with a rounded dot lesion uh, measuring 17 mm non enhancing lesion with mildly enhanced rim present at the base of the tongue there was no infiltration into the surrounding tissue uh, surgical management uh, for this patient with the informed consent patient was prepared for transoral resection of the mass under general anesthesia in rose position boil davis mouth gag with a shorter blade was placed and we have confirmed the uh, swelling that a solid swelling was present at the base of the tongue and uh, we have exist with uh, excised the swelling with the radio frequency procedure and the swelling was sent for the histopathological examination we can see here the base was cauterized in this diagram in this image sorry histopathological report uh, suggested of an ulcerated lesion with proliferation of smooth muscles with fibrocollagenoid stroma and tissue composed of oval to spindle shaped cells with uniform nuclei so the diagnosis uh, turned out to be irritation fibroma of the base of the tongue coming to the discussion part Traumatic or irritational fibroma is a common benign exophytic and reactive oral lesion that develops secondary to injury. Fibroma is a result of chronic That's repair process. Next. Chronic repair process that includes granulation tissue and scar formation, resulting in a fibrous submucosal mass. Recurrences are rare and may be caused by repetitive trauma at the same site. The lesion does not have a risk for malignancy. But the other most common sites of traumatic fibroma are the sites of the tongue, buccal mucosa, and the lower labial mucosa. Coming to my references. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next, next case, please. Dr. Harish. Dr. Patna will be presenting next. Okay, okay. Ramesh, you know, huh? Sir, uh, I'm unable to do stop. Sir, okay. No problem, no problem. Thank you, sir. Can I start, sir? Yes, uh, you can start. Patna. Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Aparna. Uh, today, I'm going to present a case report that is Cartagena syndrome. Uh, it's a rare hereditary autosomal recessive disorder described by Sievert in 1904. And a Swiss pediatrician Cartagena recognized the clinical syndrome in 1933. And Eliasson et al. first coined the term immotile cilia syndrome for Cartagena syndrome to categorize infertility with chronic sinopulmonary infections. It's a triad of chronic sinusitis, bronchiectasis, and cytosine versus. It occurs as a result, direct result of congenital defects in motile cilia covering the respiratory epithelia leads to impairment of the mucociliary clearance causing recurrent sinopulmonary infections and the incidence is approximately 1 in 30,000 live births. Coming to my case report, a 12 year old male came to ENT OPD with complaints of bilateral nasal obstruction and nasal discharge since 3 years associated with cough with sputum for the last 4 months. Nasal obstruction was aggravated on exposure to cold and air on consuming cold items and partly relieved on taking medication. And the nasal discharge is bilateral, mucopurulent, continuous, non foul smelling, non blood stain, and activated on taking cold items and partly relieved with taking medication. There are no other complaints and there is no history of uh, bilateral ear pain or ear discharge. Uh, coming to the ENT examination on anti rhinoscopy, a smooth, pale, grayish mass seen on both nostrils, not sensitive to touch and not bleeding on touch. On posterior rhinoscopy, mass is filling both the coina. Olfaction is absent. Cold spatula test, cotton wool test, both are decreased on right side. And the other examination is normal. And these findings were confirmed uh, with the diagnostic nasal endoscopy. These are the pictures of uh, direct nasal endoscopy of both the right and left nasal cavities showing uh, nasal polyps. 
Then we advised a CT PNS for the patient, which showed a mucosal thickening in bilateral frontal, ethmoid, and uh, maxillary and uh, uh, sphenoid sinuses uh, with uh, extending into the nasal cavities up to nasopharynx, which is suggestive of sinonasal polyposis. And as a part of routine examination, we advised chest x ray for the patient, which showed a dextrocardia. And the pulmonology opinion was taken in view of chronic cough with sputum. And they advised HRCT chest, which is suggestive of bronchiectasis. And we also did ultrasound abdomen to rule out the situs inversus, which showed a left side liver and right side spleen, noted with the right side cardiac apex, which is suggestive of situs inversus. Based on these uh, investigations, we came to the diagnosis of cartaginous syndrome. And the counseling was done about the nature of the disease after uh, informed and written consent. Patient underwent uh, uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery involving removal of polyps from maxillary, anterior and posterior ethmoid, bilateral frontal, and left sinoid sinus. And the specimen sent for uh, histopathological examination. It uh, showed a uh, uh, inflammatory polyp. And the post operative period was uneventful. And uh, later we advised a pulmonology review. And we followed up the case for six months, uh, which showed no recurrence of nasal polyposis. Coming to the discussion, it's a rare uh, ciliopathic autosomal recessive uh, genetic disorder that causes a defect in the action of the cilia lining the respiratory tract and fallopian tube. And uh, immortal cilia syndrome with the scientist inverses is known as cartagenous syndrome. The underlying cause is a dining arm defect that leads to immortal cilia because of the genetic mutations in the genes DNA I1 and DNA HY and also DNA H11 that encodes the cilia, resulting in dysfunctional ciliated epithelium. Mutation of these genes leads to disruption of the functioning of mucociliary clearance, causing ineffective movement, leads to sinonasal, oral, and pulmonary infections. And the nasal involvement occurs usually in the form of chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, and nasal polyposis, where nasal obstruction and rhinorrhea are the main complaints. And uh, these people may have either situs solitus, that is only dextro dextrocardia, or situs inversus totalis, where all the visceral structures are on opposite side. The diagnosis can be made by test to prove impaired cilia function, biopsy, and genetic studies. Treatment includes airway clearance therapy, uh, surgery, surgical excision of nasal polyposis, daily chest physiotherapy, antibiotics with pseudomonal coverage, and uh, pulmonary care. Coming to the conclusion, it's, uh, it's called salted ciliary uh, mutility that causes multiple symptoms and affecting the quality of life due to chronic upper and lower airway disease. Management uh, includes uh, line of uh, investigations and uh, proper diagnosis and treatment. Initial uh, line of treatment of nasal polyposis and uh, chronic rhinocytes in these patients include possibility of medical treatment uh, in exacerbations and the importance of nasal litigations and uh, test surgery. And the inferior meatotomy and extensive middle meatal antrostomy allows the uh, improving the nasal irrigations and the prompting of the mechanical drainage of uh, paranasal sinuses. Uh, in these patients where there is improper mucociliary clearance and the genetic counseling should be addressed once cartagenous syndrome is diagnosed. And these are my references. Thank you. Is there any other uh, systemic uh, disease which you would, uh, would like to keep in mind when a patient, uh, particularly kid, presents with bilateral uh, ethmoidal polypi, I mean, say, bilateral nasal polyposis? We can also... Uh, to, uh, uh, to look for uh, cystic fibrosis where the uh, C CFTR gene is uh, mutated in those patients. They can also present with the chronic sinusitis and uh, recurrent uh, nasal polyposis with uh, uh, lung changes. Sir. Okay. Standard. Okay, okay. Dr. Sneha. Am I audible and visible, sir? Yes, yes. Here you are. Okay, sir. Good, afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I'm presenting a case of chondrosarcoma of nose and paranasal sinus with intracranial extension. A brief introduction. It is very rare in malignant mesenchymal cartilaginous tumor. It is difficult to diagnose due to common and non-specific symptoms. Radiological investigations and histopathology plays an important role in the diagnosis. It is useful to assess the grade and extension of the tumor. Case report. A 26-year male patient presented with the complaints of protrusion of left eye with watering, headache, and bilateral nasal obstruction since two months. But there is no history of diplopia and velaring of vision. 
Uh, patient also had a history of similar complaints two years ago. He was investigated outside. They have advised a diagnostic nasal endoscopy. It showed a mass in the left nasal cavity. Uh, he underwent craniofacial resection of mass. It revealed as encombroma. In our department, because of recurrent of the symptoms, we did diagnostic nasal endoscopy. It showed a polypodian mass in the both nasal cavities with erosion of the septum, which was um, insensitive and not bleeds on touch. We have advised MRA brain and PNS. It showed 48 into 37 mm size low bladder lesion in the nasal cavity with erosion of the septum, which was heterogeneously hyperintense on T2. Laterally, it can cause erosion of the lamina preparation and displace in the left globe. Superiorly, it is causing the erosion of the cribriform plate and crista galli extending into the frontal lobe of the of the frontal lobe. Because, uh, as the patient is having proptosis, they have taken ophthalmologist opinion. They have diagnosed it as left eccentric proptosis with exotropia. Fundus examination and visual acuity was normal. Intraocular pressure and extracular movements are normal. Because of intracranial extinction, we have also taken neurosurgeon opinion. They have advised craniotomy and excision of the tumor. After taking consent from the patient, he was taken up for the surgery. Combined with neurosurgeon, we did biofrontal craniotomy with arbitotomy and endoscopic excision of the tumor. After that, mass was sent for biopsy. It showed irregular shaped lobules of the cartilage separated by the fibrous band. Here, we can also see the chondrocytes of different size and shape with heterochromatic nuclei. All these features are suggestive of well differentiated grade 1 chondrosarcoma. After that, patient was sent for radiotherapy. They did pre RT MRI. It showed a mass in the frontal sinuses. It is extending into the ethmoids, left to maxillary, and to sphenoid sinus. A uh, patient has received 66 gray radiation in 30 fractions to gross residual tumor. Radiation also given to the preoperative bed, enter sphenoid sinus, left to maxillary, medial wall of the right orbit. It was delivered by IGRT. After six months, patient came for follow up. We have advised the MRI. It showed a mass in the nasal cavity and also an ethmoid left to maxillary. It may be residual or recurrence. But the patient is symptomatically better. It doesn't have any complaints. We have advised him follow up with MRI after one year. Uh, discussion. It is very rare and slowly growing tumor. It accounts only 4% of the non HCL tumors of the nasal cavity and paranasal sciences. Most commonly seen in the fourth to fifth decade of life. Males are most commonly affected than females. It is tendency to spread progressively, so it has poor prognosis. Diagnosis is confirmed by histopathological examination. Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between chondroma from low grade chondrosarcoma. It is a radio resistant tumor, so surgical excision is the treatment of choice. For residual or recurrent lesions, adjuvant chemo or radiotherapy is advised. Conclusion BD of the mass in the nasal cavity, chondrosarcoma to be considered due to common and non specific symptoms. Prognosis in, prognosis in low grade chondrosarcomas are considered good if they are treated adequately. Recurrence may also occur many years after the primary diagnosis, so it requires continuous follow up. Multidisciplinary approach is needed. These are my references. Thank you, sir. Okay. 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 Next, please. Next, please. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sharing the screen, sir. Slide. Carry on. Oh. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Suguna. I'll be presenting a case of uh, sublingual dermoid. A brief introduction about dermoid cyst. They can appear anywhere on the body, uh, congenitally, maybe due to ab abnormality in development or acquired by trauma or inflammation. In head and neck, the incidence is 6.9%. In the oral cavity, the incidence is 1.6%. Most common age group is 15 to 35 years. My clinical history is an um, 18 year old patient presented to ENT department with chief complaint of swelling in the right side of the floor of mouth. History of presenting illness patient presented with swelling in the floor of mouth towards right side since childhood. 
which progressively increased over the past two months. There were no aggravating or relieving factors associated with it, and there was no, no other positive history. Mm, there's no significant past history or family history or personal history. On clinical examination, a young male patient who was moderately built and nourished, uh, calm, conscious, cooperative, and well-oriented to time, place, and person with stable vitals. On inspection, there's a solitary swelling in the floor of mouth towards the right side of the midline of size 4 into 3 centimeter, oval in shape, regular borders, and smooth surface. On palpation, there was no local rise of temperature. It was non-tender, soft in consistency. Fluctuation test was positive. Transillumination test was negative. Mm, my provisional diagnosis is sublingual dermoid. Differential diagnosis in the floor of mouth, other swellings are ranula. And since there's soft tissue, there's, uh, there might be soft tissue abscess or acute infection or cellulitis of floor of mouth. There are uh, opening of Wartan's ducts. So there might be unilateral or bilateral blockage of Wartan ducts. Or uh, sub, there are sublingual and submaxillary salivary glands. So there might, might be infection or benign and malignant tumors of submandibular or sublingual salivary glands. Uh, investigations other than uh, general investigations, ultrasonography of neck, uh, it showed a well-defined cystic lesion um, with heterogeneous content with resembling sac of marble appearance in the right sublingual space, suggestive of sublingual dermoid. MRA neck showed well-defined cystic lesion, multiple septa in the sublingual space, predominantly on the right side, extend extending superiorly to the undersurface of tongue, inferiorly it is limited to mylohyoid muscle. Um, and finally, the aspiration cytology, the smear relief revealed scattered enucleated squamosal cells and occasional lymphocytes. And no opinion could be made, and they advised tissue evaluation. The surgical procedure done was informed consent and written consent from the patient was taken, and the patient was posted for excision of sublingual cyst. Root was intraoral approach under uh, general anesthesia. Adrenaline infiltration was given in the floor of mouth, and longitudinal incision in the midline across the anterior part of the swelling was given. Careful submucosal dissection was done and uh, it, revealed, it revealed a large cyst and it was excised in total. Intraoperative and postoperative perioperative uh, vitals were stable and extracted specimen was sent for histopathological examination. These are the surgical pictures and that's the removed uh, dermoid specimen. Uh, as the specimen was sent for uh, histopathological examination, uh, it revealed the excised specimen, the epithelial lining was keratinized, stratified squamous type. Connected tissue wall showed the presence of lymphocytes and multinucleated giant cells. Hence, it was diagnosed as dermoid cyst. Uh, this is the post-operative picture. Incision site was healing well, and the patient was able to speak and chew normally without any difficulty. A uh, brief discussion about dermoid cysts. Dermoid cysts are non-odontogenic lesions in the oral cavity. Most common site is external third of eyebrow. And second most frequent site is floor of mouth. The size may vary from few millimeters to few centimeters. So depending on the location and size, it may result in uh, dysphagia or dysphonia or dyspnea. So the mayor classified uh, dermoid cyst on the basis of histopathological features into three types, epidermoid, true dermoid, and ter teratoid cyst. Epidermoid cyst lining is basic squamous epithelium. True dermoid cyst lining is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Keratoid cyst the lining is made up of all the three germ layers, the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Epidermoid cyst connective tissue wall is devoid of skin appendages. Two dermoid cysts have skin adenexes. Keratoid cyst cysts along with skin adenexes, there are also mesodermal derivatives. Um, so treatment is surgical excision. So the it can, there are two approaches, extraoral and Yes, ma'am. Uh, if it is less than six centimeter, extraoral method can be used. Uh, method approach is used, and more than six centimeter, sorry, less than six centimeter, more uh, intraoral approach, and uh, more than six centimeter, extraoral approach. And if it is uh, beyond myelohyoid muscle, again, extraoral approach. Prognosis is uh, the minimum rate of relapse. Malignant transmission in teratoid cyst is five percent. The conclusion is the dermoid cyst of maxillofacial region are relatively uncommon entities. So, ample understanding, vigilance about these slow growing masses uh, is essential, not only because the symptoms are produced, but also because of the potential of the recurrence. So, um, differential diagnosis should be kept in mind. Prompt diagnosis and treatment can prevent the airway compromise. Treatment is surgical excision, and approach depends on the size of cyst and involvement of mylohyoid muscle. These are the references. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Excuse me.
start your presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm presenting a case of a rare case of branchial fistula presenting as recurrent neck abscess. A 22 year old male Ramchander, a resident of Timaradipalli, who is a daily wager by occupation, came with complaints of swelling over the left side of the neck since 15 days. History of present illness, patient was apparently asymptomatic 15 days ago when he developed a swelling over the left side of the neck, which was insidious in onset and gradually progressive. History of pain and sudden increase in the size of swelling was present. History of fever was present. No history of difficulty in swallowing, difficulty in breathing, hoarseness of voice. No history of loss of weight or appetite. No history of any symptoms suggestive of hypo or hyperthyroidism and no complaints of ear and nose. Past history, there is a history of recurrent swellings in the past, about 4 to 5 episodes since 4 years at the same site for which incision and drainage was done. It is not a known case of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, thyroid or uh, tuberculosis. No history of radiation to head and neck region in childhood. And no history of any similar swellings in the family. Personal history is normal. General examination is normal. Patient is coherent, cooperative, well oriented to time, place and person, moderately built and nourished. No signs of pararicular sinusis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy and edema. Systemic examination, all vitals are normal. On local examination, a 5 by 5 centimeter swelling was noticed in the left lateral region of the neck in the carotid triangle, which is smooth, bulging, redness is present, not moving with deglutition and protrusion of tongue. On palpation, all the inspect inspectory findings were confirmed. Tenderness is present and local rise of temperature is present. The extensions are in the left carotid triangle with lower extension just above the lower one third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, superiorly extending three centimeters below the angle of mandible, laterally medial to the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle. Ex uh, trachea was central, laryngeal crepitus is present, no palpable cervical lymph node. Examination of ear, nose, and throat are normal. So, my provisional diagnosis is left neck abscess, which is recurrent under evaluation. This is a video showing an incision and drainage of the neck abscess. Pus was sent for culture and sensitivity and antibiotics were started based on the culture sensitivity report. This is the post-operative day 7 of abscess drainage. And post-abscess drainage ultrasound neck was done on second follow-up after the neck wound has healed. It showed an evidence of 2 mm tracts noticed from skin coursing in muscular planes ending in strap muscles adjacent to common carotid artery. No evidence of focal walled off collections along the course of the track, and CECT was suggested for further evaluation. On CECT neck, there was a blindly ending tract along left anterior lateral aspect of the neck from the cutaneous opening, coursing in muscular plane and ending anterior to common carotid artery. No evidence of focal enhancing collections within the subcutaneous and intramuscular planes of neck. So, my final diagnosis is left branchial fistula, and treatment uh, which is planned is extirpation of the fistula tract under general anesthesia. Coming to the procedure, the patient was placed in supine position, neck is exposed, chin turned to right, an elliptical incision, a horizontal elliptical incision was given, encircling the fistulous tract. Then further dissect, uh, the fistulous tract was further dissected, going till the level of the submandibular gland. Here the tract can be seen extending posterior to the submandibular gland. Then a step ladder incision was given. A second horizontal incision is given at the level of submandibular gland for further dissection of the fistulous tract. The fistulous tract here can be seen going deeper and posterior to the submandibular gland, ending well short of the tonsil. The tract is traced, exposed and cleared in total till the level below the left tonsil. The submandibular gland is identified and preserved and hemostasis is achieved. At the upper end of the fistula tract, the tract is cramped and then cauterized. Last this one. is the excised fistula tract which is measuring about 8 to 10 centimeters. This is after excision of the fistula tract and this is a uh, drain placement shown. The, then the closure is done and the drain is removed after 48 hours. HP is confirmed as branchial fistula. Discussion. Branchial anomalies account for about 17% of pediatric neck masses, of which second arch anomalies are the most common. They arise due to failure of completion of development of branchial apparatus, including first, second, third, and fourth arches. Branchial fistula is a congenital defect consisting of skin line tract opening internally as a slit on the anterior aspect of the tonsillar fossa if it is of second arch origin. The external opening is at the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle at the junction of its middle and lower thirds. 
During sixth week of intrauterine life, six branchial arches developed due to migration of neural crystals cranially. During the fifth week, second branchial arch overgrows the third and fourth branchial clefts, forming a cervical sinus. The cervical sinus usually obliterates, but due to the failure of the cervical sinus to involute, it causes the formation of various sinus fistula. If it is of second arch, the fistulous opening is at the anterior part of the tonsillar fossa. If it is of third arch, it is in the areas of larynx. And if it is of fourth arch, it is in the piriform sinus. Conclusion, branchial apparatus plays an important role in the development of head and neck structures. Aberrant development of these structures can lead to formation of different anomalies. Most of these anomalies remain asymptomatic and might present later in life. Surgery must always be the treatment option for these lesions due to the fact that these lesions do not regress spontaneously and they have a high incidence of recurrent infection. Confirming the extent of the tract is mandatory before any surgery as these lesions pass in relation to some of the most vital structures of the neck. Histopathology will confirm the diagnosis. Your time is over. There is a rare chance of occurrence of malignancy in these lesions. Okay. Okay. These are my differences. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Next, please. Uh, uh, hello, am I audible, sir? Uh, yes, uh, carry on. My screen, is it visible, sir? No. Uh, Not visible. Is it visible, sir? Yes, yes. I think I'm next uh, one. Hello, am I audible and visible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Sirisha uh, presenting a rare case uh, presented to the, our ENT OPD, which is an extramedullary plasma cytoma of paranasal sinus. Where, uh, brief introduction about this case is it, this is a rare neoplasm which is characterized by the monoclonal proliferation of the plasma cells. Uh, extramedullary plasma cytoma is defined as a uh, neoplastic proliferation of the plasma cells in the soft tissue, whereas Mr. multiple Sirisha, myeloma is. Display your PowerPoint. Oh, one minute. Is it visible, sir? Visible, but not slideshow. One uh, whole uh, screen is. One is not a slideshow again. Is it visible, sir? Hello, sir. Uh, hello? 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 Sir, is it uh, is my PowerPoint visible, sir? Not. No. It's not visible on the screen. PowerPoint is not visible. Uh, you are visible. Excuse me, Dr. Sirisha. Actually, it's my turn next. Uh, yeah, yeah. Susan Saundarya has to present. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, Dr. Saundarya, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, Susan. sir. Yes, I'm sharing the screen, sir. Oh, yes. Please go ahead. Video start over there. Hello. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Good morning, sir. My, uh, I'm going today. I'm going to present a rare case of a uh, 30 year old male, Komraya, who is a daily leader by occupation and a resident of Mohinabad. He came with the chief complaints of hard of hearing in the left ear since six years. He was apparently asymptomatic six years ago when he developed hard of hearing in the left ear, which was insidious in onset and gradually progressive. There was associated intermittent dragging type of pain and intermittent headaches, which relieved on taking medication. Uh, 
past history, family history, and personal history are not significant. Uh, general examination, discourse examination, and biceps are normal. On examination of the ear, on the left side, preauricular region and pinna are normal. Postauricular region showed a swelling over the mastoid region. External auditory canal was narrow and showed a posterior canal wall bulge. Tympanic membrane could not be visualized. Uh, three finger test and chest flat test were negative. And on the right side, ear examination is normal. On performing tuning fork tests, on the left side with uh, 256 hertz and 512 hertz, ringing was negative. And the Weber's test is neutralized to the left. Examination of nose and throat, examination of the facial nerve and other cranial nerves is normal. Based on history and clinical examination, the provisional diagnosis is conducted hearing loss and the evaluation uh, secondary to external auditory canal stenosis. The differential diagnosis arrived was uh, traumatic stenosis, osteoma, exhaustosis, external auditory canal abscess, fibrosis facial, osteochondroma, ossifying fibroma, and osteosarcoma. Invest based on investigations were done, which were within normal limits, and coming to the specific investigations. Endoscopy of the ear with a zero degree endoscope was done, which showed a bulge in the posterior bony canal wall of the external auditory canal and tympanic membrane could not be visualized. Total audiogram was done, which showed 28.3 decibel of hearing loss in the left ear and the incident audiogram could not be done. Um, high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone was done, which showed patch the ground was opacity in the mastoid part of the temporal bone. With narrowing of the left external auditory canal, and these features are suggestive of fibrous dysplasia of the temporal, uh, temporal bone involving the mastoid part. Based on uh, uh, otoendoscopy, total audiogram, and CT findings, the final diagnosis is fibrous dysplasia of the left temporal bone involving the mastoid part. The treatment plan was left vertical mastoidectomy with canal plasty under general anesthesia. In some of findings were bulge of the tympano mastoid suture leading to obliteration of the external auditory canal. The mastoid was cleotic and dysplastic with no mastoid irritant, and there was bleeding while drilling the mastoid due to fibrosis of the cone. Uh, the procedure, the cortical mastoid was done, uh, uh, canal plasty was done, and aggregate patency was achieved, and the entire dysplastic bone was cleared. The bone chips were sent for histopathological examination, which showed characteristic sinus figure like trabeculae of woven bone uh, with uh, uh, stroma of fibroblastic and vascularized stroma. And this is characteristic of fibrous dysplasia, which confirmed our initial diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia. Follow up of the patient, post operative autoendoscopy showed stenosis was cleared and tympanic membrane could be visualized. And the post operative pure tone audiogram showed significant increase in the hearing level. Fibrous dysplasia is a rare benign disorder of the skeletal system with unclear etiology, and it constitutes 7% of the benign osseous region. And the involvement of the temporal bone is very rare. There are three main forms monoosphotic, polyosphotic, and mechanolbright syndrome. Mechanolbright syndrome being the most severe of all these three. Logically, it is characterized by replacement of normal mature bone with bands of fibrous tissue intermingled with immature bony fabricule. On radiography, there are three different appearances pagetoid, erotic, and cystic pagetoid being ground glass appearance. The most common ophological manifestation is processes conducted here in your with last one minute observation of the external auditory canal and the CT scan for ground glass appearance. The most common complications are uh, recurrent otitis externa, external auditory canal polystetoma, and erosion of the middle ear ossicles. Uh, there is no specific medical treatment for fibrous dysplasia, and surgery is indicated when there is bony encroachment of the external auditory canal, recurrent infections, and secondary canal polystetoma. In conclusion, most patients with fibrous dysplasia of the temporal bone present with stenosis of the external auditory canal. With precaution, conducted hearing loss. And given the reported success rates in, CGM, in all the articles, it is reasonable to offer surgery, canal plastic to restore hearing, as well as prevent complications such as external canal polystatoma. Along with this, so uh, manage the extension of the disease into the middle ear and mastoid, middle ear exploration and tympanomastoid estimate may be needed. Thank you. 
Is there any role of radiotherapy in case of fibrous dysplasia of head and neck? Sir, radiotherapy should not be given because of uh, risk of malignant transformation, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Next, please. Next, please. Oh. Um. 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 Sirisha. Uh, sir, uh, please unmute me, sir. Are you able to hear me, sir? Yes. But I'm unable to share my uh, PPT, sir. In that situation, go to another candidate. No, no, I now I can, sir. Hello. Hel You are visible, but not your presentation. Okay, so, uh, then. Uh... Romana Cartoon, are you ready? Yes, sir. Should I start, sir? Yeah. Go ahead with your presentation. So, Sidisha shared the screen, sir. Uh, my, yes, sir. can I present, sir? Yes, I'm uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Today, uh, I am presenting an, a rare case which has presented to our ENT OPD, which is an extramedullary plasma cytoma of paranasal sinus. A uh, brief introduction about this case. This is a uh, rare uh, neoplasm, which is characterized by the neoplastic proliferation of the plasma cells, which is in the soft tissues. Uh, it accounts up to 3% of all the plasma cell tumors. Approximately 90% of these extramedullary plasma cytomas are found at the head and neck region, commonly affecting the nasal, nasal cavities and paranasal sinuses, tonsillar forces, and the oral cavity. Uh, here I am presenting a, a case who is a 50 years old uh, female presented with the complaints of left cheek uh, swelling and the alveolar swelling since three months and he ha she has a history of nasal bleeding since two months which is on and off and history of uh, loosening of the teeth which is a left uh, lateral uh, uh, incisor loosening since two months. Uh, history of presenting illness, uh, left alveolar uh, and cheek swelling, duration of uh, three months, which is insidious in onset. Initially, it was smaller in size and preg uh, and progressed to present size swelling, uh, and not associated with pain. Uh, she has history of left nasal bleed since three months, which are ar around two episodes per day, which are unprovoked, stopped spontaneously. And she also has history of nasal blockage, which is an intermittent in nature and which is more on left side compared to the right side. Uh, no history of uh, any nose, no foul smelling nasal discharge, no history of loss of smell disturbances and decreased uh, no history of PND. Uh, she has no history of uh, facial pain, no history of uh, loss of sensation over cheek, decreased sensation or numbness over the cheek, no history of headache, no history of fever and cough. Uh, on general examination, she is conscious, coherent, and cooperative. The positive findings in general examination were uh, a paler present, uh, no ictus, no cyanosis, no clubbing, no lymph, uh, no lymphadenopathy, no pedal edema. Uh, BP was a, a BP, pulse rate, and CVS all the, were normal. Uh, uh, respirate uh, on examination or auscultation. Bilateral basal Krebs were present. Uh, CNS examination uh, uh, normal. Uh, clinical examination, ear examination, bilateral TM was intact with good light reflex. Nose, it showed uh, mild DNS to right with the bilateral HIT and there was a blood stained left inferior turbinate and middle uh, left uh, inferior meatus with fullness in the left inferior meatus. Nasopharynx was uh, clear. Oral cavity examination showed upper gingival swelling, which is smooth surface swelling, firm in consistency, tender, non-bleeding, not bleeding on touch, and there was a loosened upper upper lateral incisor of the teeth. 
neck showed no palpable uh, swelling in the neck. Local examination of swelling in the face on inspection, there is a solitary swelling of size 2 centimeters, which is an oval shaped swelling uh, whose borders are well defined on inspection. Uh, and it is extending till uh, left upper uh, cheek, uh, upper lip. Skin over the swelling was normal. On palpation, it was tender, firm, and not mobile. Sensory examination, which was uh, equal on both the sides of the cheek. Uh, ex eye examination was uh, vision and ocular movements are normal. Investigation, she underwent a uh, few uh, blood investigations, which showed uh, hemoglobin 7.8%. Uh, hemoglobin and her uh, total leukocyte count and differential leukocyte count was normal. The uh, negative finding was our LFT showed total protein uh, of 13.3 with an altered uh, albumin to globulin ratio and albumin was 2.7 gram per dl and globulin was 8. gram per dl. RFT was within the normal range. Here is the radiological investigation of uh, uh, CTPNS of coronal view. This is the left side uh, showing an uh, homogeneously soft tissue density which is eroding in the left maxillary sinus eroding the floor of the uh, maxillary sinus and entering the oral cavity and it has also infiltrated the gums on the left side uh, this is an axial view which Last is one uh, axial view which is showing the uh, mass which is infiltrating the anterior wall of the uh, lower maxillary sinus uh, she underwent excision biopsy un under IV sedation. Sublabial incision was given and mass was excited and sent for histopathological examination. It, it, it gave an impression of plasma cytoma with diffuse infiltrates of immature plasma cells displaying round to oval in shape. And after which, after this uh, histopathological report, she underwent uh, serum electrophoresis, which showed an uh, M spike of uh, 8.4 gram per dl uh, as shown in the report and her uh, later she went to ct chest and spine uh, which showed on uh, scapular infiltrations vertebral thoracic vertebral and cervical vertebral uh, infiltrations with uh, low, uh, upper uh, right upper lobe uh, uh, of the lung infiltrations and even she had some rib infiltrations also uh, patient was referred to the medical oncology. There, they advised a bone marrow biopsy, but the bone marrow biopsy was negative for multiple myeloma. She underwent chemotherapy for uh, three months. Now she is undergoing. So, the so your time is over. Uh, conclusion of this uh, my presentation is: uh, this is an extramedullary plasma cytoma, which is of stage three. Uh, for diagnosing this, a multiple disciplinary approach is required to differentiate between the localized disease and the blood dyscarias with a poor prognosis. This has to be differentiated from the multiple myeloma, which has even uh, bad prognosis. Thank you. These are my references. Okay. Okay. Next, please. Am I audible, sir? Yes. I'm unable to present, sir. Can you make me the presenter? Share your screen. Yes, it's like you shared the content unless uh, uh, the host makes you the presenter. Are you can present now. Is it visible, sir? Yes. Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Ramana, here to present a case of advanced commercial carcinoma of hypopharynx. Introduction. Hypopharyngeal carcinoma describes the tumor arising between oropharynx and the esophageal inlet. Commercial carcinoma arising from the mucosal layer is the most common histology identified in 95% of the cases, while adenocarcinoma, sarcoma, and non-epidermoid carcinoma account for the remaining cases. Tumors of the hypopharynx are characterized by local invasion and lymphatic spread, with 70% of the patients presenting with lymph node involvement at the time of diagnosis. 
Hypofrontal carcinoma is strongly associated with lifestyle factors such as heavy consumption of alcohol and tobacco, both in shoot and smoke forms. Case report: A 70-year-old male presented to the OPD with a complaint of throat pain and dysphagia since three months. It was associated with shortness of breath and change in voice since two weeks. The patient was apparently all right three months back when he developed discomfortness and foreign body sensation in throat while swallowing, which slowly progressed to pain. It was associated with difficulty in swallowing, which was insidious and onset, gradually progressive in nature, more for solids than liquids. This history of change in voice, which is hoarse in nature, insidious and onset, progressive in nature, constant throughout the day for the past 15 days. This history of shortness of breath on exertion for the past 15 days. Personal history, the patient was moderately built, history of weight loss present, and he was a chronic smoker and alcoholic since past 35 years. Examination. On examination of oral cavity and oropharynx, the tongue was pale and dry, and rest of the oral cavity and oropharynx appeared to be normal. On neck examination, a single mobile mid-jugular node was palpable on the right side, and rest of the ANT examination was normal. On indirect laryngoscopy, base of tongue and epiglottis appeared to be normal, and a mass was seen in the right valicula and the right pyriform fossa. Investigations. On VLS, an irregular proliferative mass was seen in the right valicula, extending down to the right pyriform fossa and the right eripiglottic fold. The right vocal cord was not visualized due to the presence of the growth, and the left vocal cord and eripiglottic fold appeared to be normal. CCT. CCT revealed an irregular, well defined, heterogeneously enhancing mass lesion involving the lateral and posterior wall of oropharynx on the right side and right pyriform fossa, extending superiorly from just above the level of hyoid bone and inferiorly up to just above the level of the true vocal cord. Possibility of hypopharyngeal carcinoma is considered. The lesion was infiltrating into the adjacent epiglottis, right eripiglottic fold, and extending into the oropharyngeal and hypopharyngeal airway and the right valicula, causing mild narrowing of the same. The right upper posterior part of the thyroid cartilage showed mild soft tissue irregular thickening, likely infiltration by the tumor. Bilateral few jugular nodes noted, largest being 1.5 cm in the right mid jugular level below the angle of mandible. This is the axial section showing the tumor in the pyriform fossa infiltrating into the right ail of the thyroid cartilage. The TNM staging according to the AGCC in this case is T4A N2C, that is stage 4A. The patient was taken up for direct hypophalangoscopy and biopsy under GA. The sample was sent for histopathological examination. The histopathological examination of the lesion showed thick strip of squamous epithelium that shows severe dysplasia with foci of atypia, and there were solid sheets of spindle cells with hyperchromatin, vesicular nuclei, and prominent nucleolus with eosinophilic cytoplasm. Focal area shows formation of keratin horn pulse and marked lymphocytic infiltration, suggesting poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. These are the keratin horn pulse. Management. Management of hypofrontal carcinoma depends on the stage of the tumor. The plan of management in this case can be either chemoradiation or surgery followed by post-operative radiotherapy. The patient was referred to Regional Oncology Center for the treatment. Discussion. Hypofrontal carcinomas are an uncommon type of head and neck cancers and are associated with poorer prognosis compared to other head and neck cancers owing to the late presentation and early nodal metastasis. The incidence of hypofrontal carcinoma is relatively high in India, approximately 11% against 1% worldwide, especially among males. Most common site of hypofrontal carcinoma is pyrum sinus, which is 60%, followed by post record region and, hypo uh, and posterior pharyngeal wall. The incidence of lymphatic spread is highest in carcinoma of pyriform sinus due to the rich lymphatic supply, followed by the posterior pharyngeal wall and the post region. The impact from a growing lesion is not appreciated until the tumor is considerably large. Therefore, majority of the patients present at an advanced stage. Last large one. proportion of patients present with a neck lump whose differentials include other causes such as acute infection, inflammatory conditions like sarcoidosis, benign lesion like lipoma, or any undetected congenital lump such as brain cysts. Other neoplasms that can cause both cervical lymphadenopathy and dysphagia or globus symptoms include lymphoma, high esophageal cancer, other head and neck cancers such as carcinoma of the base of the tongue, tonsil, or elsewhere in the oropharynx. These are my references. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Next, please. Hello, sir. Yes, next.
Hello? Yes. Yeah, sir. I am unable to. Uh, Share the screen. Yeah. Hello? Yes. 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 Is it visible, sir? Yes. Visible. Yeah. I'm Dr. Sakina. I'm here to present a case report of vehicle schwannoma. Hmm. Not moving down. Oh, yeah. Hello? Uh, yes. Yes. Now yes, you are sir. going. Sir. Here is a case report of uh, vagal schwannoma. So the introduction part is schwannoma, neurolemoma, neuromas are the benign tumors originating from the schwann cells, which is rare, usually seen in age group of third to six decade with no sex prediction. Schwannomas in temporal bone can be vestibular, which is most common, trigeminal, jugular, facial schwannomas. Typically, they are encapsulated, slow growing, mostly solitary, can arise from peripheral nerves, cranial nerves, sympathetic chain, cervical nerve roots, and brachial plexus. We have a case report of 29-year-old male patient presented to the ENT department with complaint of swelling in the right side of the neck since 15 months. Insidious in onset gradually progressed to present size. There is no history of pain, difficulty in swallowing, difficulty in speech, hoarseness of voice. On examination, a single swelling of 4.5 into 3 centimeters was found on right side of the neck just below the angle of mandible, beneath upper one-third of sternocleido mastered muscle. The skin over the swelling is normal, smooth surface and firm in consistency. It was non-pulsatile and non-tender swelling. It is mobile only in horizontal plane but not vertically. There was no history of previous surgery. Routine investigation was done. Systemic examination was normal and the ideal was also normal. In investigation, an ultrasonography was done. It is heterogeneously hypoechoic lesion of 4.3 into 2.8 centimeters just posterior to the right submandibular gland, causing splaying of surrounding jugular vein and posterior part of the submandibular gland, taking flow on Doppler. FNAC was done, which shows moderately cellular smears consisting of spindle-shaped elongated cells with elongated BV nuclei arranged in bundles. The MRI shows well-encapsulated oval-shaped hyper-intense lesion in white carotid space extending from the angle of mandible to the level of laryngeal inlet, displacing the common carotid medially and jugular vein laterally. There is no evidence of low void signal. This is an MRI scan of the axial view, which shows hyperintense lesions of the vagal uh, mass lesion. This is an, uh, we have done the excision of the mass under general anesthesia through transcervical approach. This is an intraoperative view of the mass. The incision was uh, placed in upper neck skin, extending from the mastoid process towards the hyoid bone, overlying the muscle, where the skin incision was deepened. And expose the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid mastered muscle, and uh, uh, the muscle was retracted laterally to expose the mass. The carotid sheath was uh, uh, laterally uh, retracted laterally to expose the mass. It was dissected, and internal jugular vein and carotid artery and vagus nerve was exposed. The tumor was found to arising from the vagus nerve and separated the internal jugular vein from carotid artery. The entire tumor was safely separated from the nerve and totally excised while preserving the anatomical continuity and the functionality of the nerve. This is a dissection of the mass from the nerve. This is an excised mass lesion, which is 4.5 into 3 centimeters. After excision, the histi histopathological examination shows encapsulated mass vessels arranged in groups, lobules separated by the fibrous septa. Few areas show cystic spaces lined with flattened epithelium. Hello. On follow-up, the patient has no neurological deficit was found. Pre-operative and post-operative ideal was normal. Discussion part is the vagal nerve schwannoma is a rare benign arising from the nerve sheath. They are They are common tumors of jugular foramen followed by glossopharyngeal schwannomas. These tumors present as a slow-growing, painless mass, coffin palpation of mass is unique feature of vagal schwannoma. Ultrasonography, FNAC, MRI, CT has to be done. Ultrasonography would differentiate between schwannoma and neurofibroma. Whereas schwannoma is eccentric hypervascular, whereas neuroma, neurofibroma is a center of the lesion and is very less vascular. FNAC shows two patterns, Antony A, Antony B. 
Antony A is hypercellular elongated spindle cells, palisade nuclei, whereas Antony B is hypercellular loosely arranged spindle cells. The differential diagnosis include keratoid body tumors, glomus, vagal, paraglanglomas, neurofibromas, lymphomas. NCT appear well defined mass with higher attenuation. MI tumor shows hypo intense on T1, hyper intense on T2. Keratoid angiography has to be done to flow through to know the flow through the keratoid. Surgical removal is a mainstay of treatment with aim of preserving the nerve whenever possible. Recurrence of the tumor is rare and malignant transformation is unusual. Carotid, uh, more than half of the cases show post-operative neural deficit due to the hydronegic injury. But in some cases, nerve has to be sacrificed for the removal of tumor, followed by end-to-end -end anastomosis of the nerve. In our case, transurbital approach of the tumor was dissected separately without intraoperative injury to the nerve. These are my differences. Okay, ma'am. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to present a rare case of capillary hemangioma of nasal septum, a rare presentation. I'm Dr. Karthik Chavan. Introduction. The capillary hemangioma is a benign, rapidly growing lesion of skin and mucous membrane. It usually involves a gingiva, lips, tongue, and buccal mucosa. In the, in the nasal cavity, anterior septum is the most frequently affected, followed by terminate, but also have been described arising from the maxillary sinus, roof of nasal cavity, and floor of nasal vestibule. Case report, a 13-year-old boy presented with left-sided nasal obstruction and mass in the left nasal cavity since one month. There is history of four episodes of epistaxis, no history of trauma to nose, no history of nasal discharge, no history of any allergy. There is no history of external nasal deformity. On anterior anoscopy, a reddish mass is seen in the left nasal cavity arising from the anterior nasal septum. On probing, mass is soft, bleeding on touch, and probe is unable to pass on the medial side. On posterior anoscopy, it is normal. Endoscopy examination confirms that mass is arising from the anterior part of nasal septum in the left nasal cavity. Contrast enhanced CT scan revealed a well-defined soft tissue density lesion in the anterior aspect of the left nasal cavity abutting the cartilaginous portion of the nasal septum. A benign lesion suggestive of hemangioma. Provisional diagnosis is capillary hemangioma of nasal septum. CT scan showing mass arising from the nasal septum on the left side. This is the mass arising from the nasal septum. Management, mass is surgically excised under the general anesthesia by the transnasal endoscopic approach and is subjected to histopathological examination along with 5mm margin of normal mucosa around the mass. Histopathological examination showed multiple lobules of small blood vessels lined by the plump endothelial cells and focal fibrosis and thick muscular blood vessels in the central stoma, suggestive of capillary hemangioma. Discussion. Capillary hemangioma is also known as strawberry navy, characterized by tiny reddish nodule. They are classified as capillary cavernous mixed lesions. It's a benign condition in which there will be abnormal growth of blood vessels of skin, mucosa, bone, muscles, glands, and internal organs such as brain and liver. Nasal septum is most commonly involved, that is in 65% of the cases, followed by nasal vestibule in 16% of cases, and inferior turbinate in 14% of cases. Nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses are relatively uncommon sites. Uh, it can be either parenchylated or white based. Etiology, trauma, repeated nose picking and repeated nasal suctioning, hormonal influences like during puberty and pregnancy, viral oncogens, microscopic AV malformations, angiogenic growth factors. It has female pre predominance. It occurs most often in the third decade. It is rare in children. Clinical features, most often they'll present with epistaxis in 75% of the cases, followed by nasal obstruction, followed by uh, rhinorrhea, facial pain, and headache, which are comparatively rare presentations. Differential diagnosis, you must consider inflammatory lesions such as rhinosporidiosis, granulomatous disease like sarcoidosis, 
vaginus granulomatosis, etc. Neoplastic lesions such as vascular polyps, angiosarcoma, cyanonasal papillomas, hemangiopyrocytoma, etc. And granulation tissue or angiofibroma or cavernous hemangioma which occurs less frequently in the nasal cavity. Treatment Capillary hemangioma usually resolves on its own. We can try intranasal injections of sclerosing solutions or intralesional injections of steroids or subcutaneous interferon application, systemic therapy with steroids and interferon alpha, laser therapy like argon laser, uh, cryo uh, cryosurgery, embolization, surgical treatment, uh, treatment by electrocoagulation, cryotherapy and excisional surgery. Conclusion This case is reported for its potential of being misdiagnosed and to highlight the advantage of nasal endoscopies in the diagnosis and treatment. This uncommon lesion should be considered in the differential diagnosis of all endonasal masses with bleeding. These are my references. Okay, Karthi. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Audible. So I am unable to share the screen. Dr. Shilpa, are you ready? Shilpa PT. Yes, sir, I'm ready, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello, Hello. sir. I'm Dr. Faiza presenting. Details. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead now. Case, case report is of inverted papilloma. Dr. Faiza Qureshi, ENTPG. Inverted papilloma, Ringer's tumor, Schneiderian papilloma can be defined as a group of benign neoplasm arising from the sinonasal Schneiderian mucosa and is composed of squamous or columnar epithelium. Occurrence is in the fifth decade. Sex predilection, male is to female, 3 is to 1. Etiology is human papilloma virus, 6, 11, 16, 18. Usually, location is usually in the lateral nasal wall in the middle meatus region. Maxillary sinus, ethmoid sinus, frontal sinus, phenoid sinuses are rare. Three characteristics makes this tumor very different from other sinonasal tumors are relatively strong potential for local destruction, high rate of recurrence, a risk of carcinomatous evolution. We have presented a case report and discussed the features of inverted papilloma arising from maxillary, ethmoid and sphenoid sinus, focusing on assessment, diagnosis and management. A 45-year-old male patient came to the ENT OPD with chief complaints of left nasal mass with obstruction since three years. The patient was apparently asymptomatic three years back when he started developing a left-sided nasal mass with obstruction in serious and onset gradually progressed to the present size associated with nasal discharge, which was mucoid in nature, intermittent, with no diurnal variation, no aggravating or relieving factors. No history of epistaxis, no history of diplopia, facial swelling or headache, no history of URTIs or allergies. On anterior dinoscopy, the left nasal cavity shows a solitary pinkish irregular mass firm in consistency. Surface of the mass was smooth, no visible pulsations, no discharge. Floor of the nose was free from the mass. Lateral wall, inferior turbinate could not be visualized clearly on the left side. On probing probe, can was, could not be passed superior laterally. Mass was attached to the lateral wall of the left, left nasal cavity. It did not bleed on touch and, uh, and it did not bleed on touch. Posterior anoscopy, quana, mild copious discharge was seen on the left side. Paranasal sinus examination, maxillary tenderness over the left maxillary sinus. Functional test, cold spatula test, less misting on the left side. Cotton mill test, less movement of fiber on the left side. Ear and throat examination were normal. Systemic examination is normal. On investigations, routine blood investigations were normal. Did an eye diagnostic nasal endoscopy. Nasal endoscopic examination showed a pink fleshy polypoidal mass in the left nasal cavity till the level of the middle turbinate arising from the left middle meatus. It did not bleed on touch. Septum had mild deviation to the right. Inferior and middle turbinate could not be visualized on the left side. Nasopharynx could not be reached on the left sides. 
On investigation, we did a CTPNS, which showed a polypoidal soft tissue of the left nasal cavity extending from anterior to posterior corner with obliteration of the osteomyotal complex, complete ossification of the left middle turbinate, partial ossification of the ethmoidal bony septate. Soft tissue uh, is causing mild erosion of the middle turbinate, suggestive of aggressive left-sided sinonasal polyposis. This is a CTPNS. MRA report showed mucosal thickening with fluid level and T2 hypointense content filling the left maxillary antrum, anterior ethmoidal sinus extending to the left half of the sphenoid sinus and complete nasal cavity. A biopsy was taken in the OPD and was sent for HPE. Gross examination had a single bit of soft tissue, approximately 202 centimeter pinkish uh, mass, white and irregular. HP showed inverted growth pattern consisting of markedly thickened squamous epithelial proliferation growing downward into the underlying connective tissue stroma from large clefts, ribbon, and islands, which was suggestive of Schneiderian papilloma. Differential diagnosis is allergic fungal sinusitis, anthroconal polyp, non keratinizing respiratory carcinoma, esthesio neuroblastoma. Management is by Krauss staging, stage 3. Surgery procedure, inverted papilloma is effectively management by, managed by surgery using endoscopic approach where the endonasal incision of the mass was done with marginal clearance from the sinuses. Rigid zero degree endoscope was taken and deep bulking of the intranasal part of the tumor is performed using a micro debrider. Maxi ethmoid sphenoid sinus opening is cleared. Middle meatal atrostomy is performed to facilitate access to the maxillary sinus and reach the satisfactory endoscopic visualization of the maxillary sinus. Mass was debulked. Identification of the ident attachment site was seen. Once mass was adequately exposed to the whole tumor, it was debulked with a micro debrider. Mucosal stripping was performed and periosteum ablation of the whole mass was performed. Subsequent drilling of the underlying bone at the side of the inverted papilloma attachment was applied with a diamond burr. Patients underwent nasal packing and all specimens were... Just one minute. Yes. Um, uh, other treatment modalities include medial max maxillectomy, mid-facial uh, uh, degloving and lateral rhinotomy. Post-operative period was uneventful. Post-operative patient is seen every three months to check for recurrence. Uh, discussion, uh, it's... Uh, um, inverted papilloma effectively managed by surgery by uh, four types of approaches. Endoscopic lateral rhinotomy, mid-facial degloving, modified lothropic. Advantages of the endoscopic approach is superior visualization, preservation of normal sinus physiological function, short in hospitals, still lack of external scar. Conclusion, inverted papilloma is well known for its invasiveness, tendency to reoccur and association with malignancy. Although the intent of surgical procedures are curative, recurrence rate of 40 to 80 percent is unacceptably high. Open approaches uh, allow for a good resection, complete resection, endoscopic clearance, which minimizes the recurrence rate. It is imperative to completely excise the tumor with appropriate surgical approach. These are my references. Thank you. What is the incidence of malignant transformation in inverted papilloma? 10 to 15 percent usually for squamous cell carcinoma, so. Okay. What is the incidence of existing, uh, coexisting uh, malignancy? I think 10 percent approximately, so. Okay. Okay, next, next. can. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Good morning. Yes. yes audible. Share the screen. Yes. Sir, I've shared the screen, sir. Is it visible, sir? Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Shilpa. I'll be presenting the uh, case report on sinonasal intestinal type of adenocarcinoma. Uh, sinonasal malignancies are a very rare kind of malignancies with incidence of just about 0.5 to 1 per 1 lakh individuals per year. They behave very aggressively and they are usually diagnosed very late. Two most common types are one is squamous cell and the other one is adenocarcinomas. In the standard type of sinonasal adenocarcinomas, they arise from the epithelium of the paranasal sinuses and nasal cavities and most common among the nasal uh, paranasal sinuses are the ethmoid sinus primarily in men in the age group of 55 to about 60 years. The etiology is related to wood dust exposure. Therefore, it is more common in carpenters and furniture makers. Here, I am presenting a case of a 32-year-old male patient who presented to the ENT OPD with complaints of left nasal obstruction since five months and left eye swelling with blurring of vision since five days. 
uh, the na nasal obstruction was since five months. It was insidious in onset and it was aggravating on exposure to cold weather and dust. And history of left eye swelling was associated with intense watering and blurring of vision. Other positive histories include left nasal bleed, which was spontaneous in onset three days back and stopped spontaneously as well. History of numbness of left cheek, headache, voice change, sneezing, snoring and mouth breathing met the other positive histories. In past history, he's a known case of hypertension and known case of LVH. He's also had a history of myocardial infarction about five years back. No other significant family or personal history. On examination, general physical examination was found to be normal. Systemic examination were also normal. On left eye examination, there was lid edema present with watering of the eyes and discharge. And vision was restricted to two fingers, counting fingers. Uh, local examination of the nose, external examination was found to be normal. On anterior rhinoscopy of the nest, left nasal cavity, we could visualize a single pinkish mass which was filling the entire left nasal cavity, including the vestibule, which was friable, non-sensitive, bleeding on touch, and was covered with mucoid discharge. We were able to pass the probe all around except superiorly and laterally. Right nasal cavity, only significant finding was deviated nasal septum. All other ENT findings were normal. Uh, ear, oral cavity and oropharynx and neck also there was no significant lymphadenopathy present. We went ahead with general blood protein blood investigations which were also normal. Chest x-ray was normal and ECG was normal as well. When it came to specific investigations, we, uh, we did diagnostic nasal endoscopy which had a similar finding as that of anterior rhinoscopy. It was again a pinkish mass filling the left nasal cavity and on probe test, we were able to pass the probe all around except superiorly and laterally. Right knee Nasal cavity, there was no significant finding. We did CT scan for the patient. CT paranasal sinus was not suggestive of any neoplastic etiology, rather, it was more suggestive of an invasive fungal rhinosinusitis um, etiology. Then we went ahead with CT orbit from uh, advice from ophthalmologist, which suggested a neoplastic etiology lesion, which was invading the eroding the medial orbital wall and into the left orbital cavity. These are the CTPNS, and here we um, went ahead with an MRI PNS uh, paranasal sinus. Again, that was also suggestive of a large ethmoidal cavity mass predominantly in the left nasal cavity with internal vascularity. It was causing erosion of the neighboring structures. That is, uh, laterally, it was eroding the left lamina papyracea, erosion of the medial maxillary sinus. Superiorly, it was eroding the ethmoidal roof, and inferiorly, it was eroding the heart palate and, was, uh, and with no intraoral extension. Uh, we went ahead with endoscopic resection of the tumor with um, cobulator and debrider. Post resection of the tumor, there was a CSF leak, which was also uh, corrected by using middle turbinate based flap, and he was referred to cancer center for radiotherapy. Post histopatho post uh, surgery, we uh, sent the specimen for histopathological examination. Uh, unlike what was seen in the MRI, which was suggestive of estatio neuroblastoma, on histopathological examination of the specimen, we found there were pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells with mucin pools, moreover suggestive of an adenocarcinoma. Uh, they um, did a immunohistochemistry, which was positive for CD20, CD7, and CDX2. So postoperatively, we did a follow-up at six weeks with PET scan, which showed no residue of malignant tissue. On discussion, adenocarcinomas account for about 10 to 20 percentage of all primary malignant neoplasms of nasal cavity. Exposure to softwood dust and um, shoe dust in leather make, shoe making industries has been indi indicated as the risk factors. There is sporadic variety as well, which arises more common in women and involve the maxillary antrum. Any anterior skull based lesions, the differential diagnosis could be a squamous cell carcinoma, lymphoma, estatio neuroblastoma, sinonasal melanoma, metastasis. This is aggressive inf uh, uh, invasive rhinofungal sinusitis and intestinal type of adenocarcinoma. So this is my conclusion. Sinonasal malignancy is present late due to the initial insignificant uh, symptoms. These tumors have a greatest histological diversity. Intestinal type of adenocarcinoma should be considered in any anterior skull based lesions. Distant lymph node metastasis is relatively uncommon in these type of lesions. Rather, local recurrence is more the common. Is All patients require long term follow up, including endoscopic examination and imaging. These are my references. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Next. Okay. Thank you.
गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग कौन शेल आई स्टार्ट सर यस दिस इज डॉक्टर नोमा सरीन वन मिनट या गो अहेड यस सर टुडे माई केस इज ए रेयर केस रिपोर्ट ऑफ एपिग्लॉटिक सिस्ट कमिंग टू इंट्रोडक्शन एपिग्लॉटिक सिस्ट आर डिनाइन एंड यूजली आकर ऑन लिंगल सर्फेस ऑफ एपिग्लॉटिस इट्स एक्रेंस इज वेरी रेयर इट इज फॉर्म इंसिडेंटली ड्यूरिंग फिजिकल एग्जामिनेशन और ड्यूरिंग इंटीवेशन इट इज यूजली एसिम्टोमेटिक इन पेशेंट एंड हैव बीन ट्रीटेड कंजर्वेटिवली द साइज इज स्मॉल If it's large in size, it may obstruct the airway and can result in upper airway obstruction. If there are any signs of upper airway obstruction, the cyst should be removed immediately. Early diagnosis and treatment will reduce the incidence of airway obstruction, leading to sudden deaths. Clinical history: A nine-month-old female child named Dikshita brought to our hospital with chief complaints of poor acceptance of feet and snoring during sleep since ten days. history of presenting illness child was apparently asymptomatic 10 days back then she had cold and poor acceptance of feeds referred from pediatric department to ent department in view of accidental finding of swelling in oropharynx it is associated with mouth breathing and snoring during sleep it is not associated with respiratory distress regurgitation of feeds and fever past history no history of similar complaints in the past and family history first in order born out of non consanguineous marriage there is no similar complaint seen in the family her antenatal history is uneventful coming to birth history term gestation birth weight is 2.5 kg normal vaginal del delivery cried immediately after birth there were no nicu admissions developmental history is normal she is immunized till date coming to clinical examination on inspection a single well defined swelling was seen in midline in oropharynx behind the base of the tongue it's measuring approximately 3 into 3 cm it is oval in shape with smooth surface and regular borders on digital palpation inspectory findings are confirmed it is non tender no local rise of temperature soft in consistency and moving horizontally and vertically this picture is showing the swelling behind the base of the tongue the provisional diagnosis is epiglottic cyst and differential diagnosis are valvular cyst lingual thyroid and thyroglossal duct cyst investigations x ray neck lateral view with soft tissues ct head and neck ultrasound neck and thyroid profile the ultrasound neck and thyroid profile are to rule out the ectopic thyroid and routine blood investigations surgical procedure mass utilization under general anesthesia procedure under aseptic precautions under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation mackintosh laryngoscope introduced and cystic swelling was visualized in the oropharynx arising from the lingual surface of the epiglottis the cyst was held with blakesley forceps and the cyst is probed and cystic fluid was suctioned out cystic walls is removed and vascularization done specimen is sent for histopathological examination hemostasis is achieved and the child was extubated and post operative period was uneventful these are surgical pictures this is before excision the cystic swelling was seen in oropharynx arising from the lingual surface of the epiglottis and the uh, cystic fluid is suctioned out and the cystic wall is removed and sent for histopathological examination histopathology this is the picture of histopathology cystic wall cyst wall is lined with stratified squamous epithelium with underlying fibrocollagenous tissue and congested and dilated blood vessels discussion the etiology of the epiglottic cyst still remains unknown it commonly arises from the lingual surface of epiglottic region decentral classified laryngeal cyst into ductal and saccular types based on histological examination fourth classified based on extent and embryological tissue of origin in pediatric common presentation is tidal and respiratory distress in adults the uh, foreign body sensation and hoarseness which seldom leads to airway obstruction there was no such presentation in my case epiglottic cyst based on histological uh, histology is ductal type ductal cyst is due to obstructed submucous 
submucosal glands. Inflammation of larynx causes obstruction of ducts, causing oh, retention of mucus and formation of cyst. Other surgical options are excision of cyst, simple aspiration, carbon dioxide laser, and micro deployment. These are my references, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next. Next presenter, please. Hello. Hello, sir. Good, good afternoon, sir. Sir, my file is being loaded, sir. One minute. <laughs> So my file is being loaded. What about Danya, Dr. Danya K. Danya? Are you ready? Yes, sir, I'm ready, sir. Shall I start, sir? Yes, you can, if possible. Okay. Sir, can you see my video and audio, sir? Yes. yes sir. Danya, you start. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Today, I'm going to present a rare case of uh, middle ear mucor mycosis. Introduction. Mucor is a saprophytic fungi of class zygomycosis. Uh, uh, it belongs to... Uh, class mucorrhizal uh, zygomatosis class and mucorrhizal disorder which causes aggressive angioinvasive disease immunocompromised people and uncontrolled diabetes it may present in the form of rhino orbito cerebral pulmonary disseminated cutaneous and gastrointestinal sorry sir my clinically the rhino orbito cerebral uh, form is the most common location and or orchical involvement of middle ear, mastoid, and uh, temporal bone is very rare. There are few few reports of invasive mucor mycosis of temporal bone in non-immunocompromised patients. Case report. 30-year-old woman who is not an immunocompromised presented to our OPD. Your PPD is not moving, Emma. Uh, yeah, now it's okay. No, Nikhil Kumar. Uh, you, you, present Nikhil Kumar. you 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 wait for a while. You, you wait for a while. Nikhil. Danya, you can go ahead. Okay, sir. Case report a 30 year old, old woman who is not an immunocompromised, presented to her OPD with history of left ear discharge in three years which was in serious and onset scanty, purulent, non-foul smelling and non-blood stain associated with left side of the Your PPT is not on the screen, Dania. Okay, sir. I'm... Sir, can, is it visible, sir? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, report, okay. 
a 30 year old woman who is not an immunocompromised uh present to her opd with history of left ear that since three years which was insidious in onset scanty purulent non-fault smelling and non-blood stain associated with left-sided hearing loss since two and a half years which is insidious and gradual progressive there was no history i think one minute sir what happened go ahead there was no significant uh, history of uh, recurrent otomycosis or sinonasal um, disease and uh, there are no diabetes like diabetes mellitus on clinical examination patient has wide mouth retraction in the past 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 left ear pewton audiometry shows uh, moderate conductive hearing loss in left ear which is 42 decibels and mild conductive hearing loss that is 28 decibels in uh, right ear. HRCT temporal bone shows soft tissue thickening in epitympanum, mastoid vessels, mesoderm diplanum, and hypotympanic portions with uh, extension into the sinus and facial vessels with ossicular erosion that is short process of interest. Hematological investigations are within normal limits and serological markers are negative. And patient was diagnosed with famous type of otitis media and planned for modified diatom mastoidectomy. Intraoperatively, cholesterol back with debris identified in the hepatic and antrum. Complete excretion of the disease from the middle ear and mastoid was done, and soft tissue was sent from the mastoid was sent for histopathological examination. And after reconstruction done with cartilage graft and temporarily spatial graft placed over it. Immediate postoperatively, patient developed uh, house black lens grade to patient no palsy. Histopathic examination shows multiple bits of tissue lined by stratified squamous epithelium, uh, which is filled with uh, features suggestive of cholesterol. And, uh, also shows susceptible fungal wave with irregular branching, suggestive of mucor mycosis. Fungal culture was not sent for uh, uh, because uh, it was the specimen was sent in formal head solution and we did not suspect fungal disease. And patient was treated with liposomal amphotericin B infection with total dose of 4,200 4, milligram for 14 days. And uh, discussion, uh, usually uh, mucor mycosis gain entry into the middle ear through via nasopharynx via eustachian tube or via the perforated tympanic membrane. And usually is more common in immunocompromised like diabetes, hematological malignancies, and human immunodeficiency viruses. Nearly is seen in immunocompetent people. Clinically, it may present with um, cholesterol with smelling motoria and uh, otalgia. And uh, skull base uh, extension can also be present in severe cases. And diagnosis is mainly based on the histopathological examination and by culture. And uh, successful treatments uh, by early diagnosis, control of infection, and surgical development of the necrosis. And uh, uh, antifungal therapy with uh, liposomal amphotericin B. And prognosis is uh, better than the niso or uh, cerebro orbital disease because due to uh, minimal uh, angio and minimal so conclusion histopathology examination has major role in diagnosis of middle ear and mastoid mucor mycosis these are my references thank you okay actually we didn't <laughs> see any uh, the, uh, your uh, slide presentation but still it's okay uh, what is the dosage of uh, uh, liposomal amphotericin, madam? Yes, sir, it is given a uh, 20. It's okay, no problem. Oh. No, Am I audible, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Chaviria Sadaf uh, uh, from, uh, in, uh, from ENT. Presenting a case of patient cell carcinoma. What, what, what happened to Nikhil Kumar? Sir, he was okay. Uh, okay, okay. I'll call him next, sir. 
Okay. Uh, later continue. Later continue. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm Dr. Chuviria. I'm Dr. Chuviria Siddhif, presenting a case of basal cell carcinoma of nose. A 60-year-old male patient, former by uh, former by occupation, residing in Zahirabad, came to the ENT OPD with chief complaints of mass on nose since two years. That's on left side. Disfigurement of nose since two years. Bleeding from nose since one year. History of present illness. Patient was apparently asymptomatic two years ago and developed a small papule on left ala of nose which used to break and bleed and slowly over the time developed into an ulcer which bleeds on touch. There were no associated or aggravating or elevating factors. No relevant past history, no such similar family history. Personal history, history of exposure to sun was present, rest, diet, sleep, appetite, ball and bladder is regular and normal. No smoking history, no alcohol intake, not a pinch, uh, punch chewer. General physical examination, the patient is well oriented to time, place and person. The patient is of moderate build, vitals, heart rate 82 beats per minute, respiratory rate 16 cycles per minute, BP 130 by 80 mm of acid, temperature is normal, no pallor, icterus, cyanosis, clubbing of pedal edema or lymphadenopathy. ENT examination. External examination, examination of nose. In an external examination of nose, a black colored irregular lesion of about five into four centimeter with an ulcer was seen on the left side of nose on the ala of nasi, ala nasi. The ulcer was on left ala nasi, which was around two into two centimeter irregular in shape with a pink base and had rolled out edges. And on palpation, it bleeds on touch. On anterior rhinoscopy, lateral wall of nose was extensively destroyed. The inferior turbinate on left side was involved. Rest of it was normal. On posterior rhinoscopy, it's normal. Paranasal sinus, no tenderness. Oral and throat examination is normal. Management. Investigation. Punch biopsy of the lesion was done under aseptic condition in the OPD and was sent for histopathological studies. Other routine investigations were found to be normal. Diagnosis. It was confirmed basal cell carcinoma by histopathology. The patient was then referred to a higher center where he was treated by wide local excision of the lesion and reconstruction of nose followed by radiotherapy. Small biopsy of ulcer on the nose. Received in formal saline, soft tissue, but 0.5 to 0.2 cm, pearly white to brown in color. Microscopic features, serial sections, evaluated from the submitted biopsy, display superficial fragments of keratin material with embedded squamous ghost along with large, deeper jigsaw fragments constituted by palisading basaloid cell nest, cod, and trabeculae, spreading hyperchromatic nuclei and moderate eosinophilic cytoplasm along with intervening fibroreticular stroma and large hemorrhage. Suggestive of low grade basaloid carcinoma. Discussion. Basal cell carcinoma is reported as one of the most common skin cancer. Out of 10 skin cancers, eight patients have microscopically these, skill, uh, these cells look like cells arranged in the lowermost of the epidermis, so called as basal cell layer, um, as the basal cell layer. Basal cell carcinoma generally develops on sun exposed areas, especially head and neck region. It is common seen in middle age or elderly aged males. However, nowadays increasing trends in incidence of basal cell carcinoma have been noted in younger population, which might reflect the amount of hours spent in the sun. Basal cell carcinoma. The susceptibility, uh, the susceptibility of the skin to sun damage is directly related to the amount of melanin. There is classification by Fitzpatrick, which divides skin into six types according to melanin content, pigmentation, and sensitivity to sun. Fair skin type 1 is at higher risk of basal cell carcinoma, and black skin type 6 is at lower risk for BCC. Other causes of BCC are ionizing radiations, chemicals like hydrocarbons, arsenic, immunosuppressive conditions. It, it is also seen in genetic conditions, xeroderma uh, pigmentosa, Gollin syndrome, epidermodysplasia, verisiformis. A pre-malignant condition, uh, sebaceous nevus of Jurassic can uh, turn malignant in 10% of cases. Example of basal cell carcinoma, classic type, nodular, superficial, and superficial basal cell. Types of basal cell car carcinoma, most commonly superficial, pigmented, morphic, and nodular. 
treatment of BCC surgery. Surgical excision achieves high cure rates. Epstein reported of 94% cure rate using a 2mm margin and a 95% cure rate was reported by Wolf and Zitli with a 4mm margin for tumor less than 2 cm and also by most micrographic surgery. Destructive procedure, uh, procedures like electrodissection and curettage, cryosurgery, pulse CO2 laser can also be done. Medical treatment by radiotherapists uh, is useful alternative to surgery with reported cure rates of 92% for BCC. Here are my references. Thank you. Okay, Amal. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, Nikhil. Area. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good afternoon, sir. Nikhil, go ahead. Hello, sir. Can I start, sir? Uh, start. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Nikhil Kumar Villa, MSCNT from KMC, sir. I'm here to present a case on nasal rhinosporiosis, sir. Uh, rhinosporiosis is a rare, rare glandomatous disease caused by rhinosporidium seabury. It, it involves mucosal lining of nasopharynx, conjunctiva, palate, and urethra. Lesions are also seen in other parts of the body like brain, trachea, ear, skin, and supplements tissues have been reported. Rather, it has been uncommon. Uh, it is endemic to India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. It is also seen in South, South America, Brazil, and all. Uh, my case has been a six-year-old male child, resident of Orissa, present to ENT, uh, ENT OPD with bilateral nasal obstruction since three months. The uh, patient was apparently asymptomatic three months back, developed right sided partial obstruction, which is initiated from onset. Progressive continuous, completely obstructed obstruction after one month, presenting present both during expression and expression. No aggravating and relieving factors have been noted. Similar region is seen in the left side, which is started two months back, which is partial obstruction. And it is present, it is present, obstruction is present in both inspiration and expression. No aggravating or relieving factors, sir. It is associated with blood stain, nasal discharge occasionally from bilateral nasal cavities. So, past history has been uh, history of occasional bathing in the nearby local stagnant water bond is present, which has been frequently uh, frequented by animals. So, associated with mouth breathing and snoring at night, uh, history of post nasal drip present. No significant past personal family issues is noted. No similar complaint is, see, is being uh, seen in the family also. Uh, on a clinical examination, we can see in the picture the right uh, right side single single poly, pink polypad and mouth obstructing the whole uh, right nasal cavity, presenting into the vestibule, which has been shown over here, sir. Uh, it is studded with white spots. A similar lesion of pink, pink polypoidal mass obstructing the left nasal cavity up to the level of inferior terminal. We can see, sir, in uh, DNA, uh, roof of the uh, nasal cavity appears free. It is surface started with uh, white spots, sir. Uh, this is being DNA picture. DNA picture showing uh, white studded pass, erythematic pink polypoid and mass in the left nasal cavity. Here, roof appears to be free. You can see uh, middle turbinate from the DNA, sir. Uh, on clinical examination, on probing, it is soft in consistency. Post can be probe can be passed all over except medially, sir. In insensitive to pain and did not bleed on probing. Similarly, in the left nasal cavity and probing, soft in consistency. Probe can be passed all over except me me medially. Insensitive to pain, did not bleed on probing, sir. On examination, oral cavity, oropharynx, nasopharynx, larynx, conjunctive, here genital, systemic and lymph node examination appears to be normal, sir. Provisional diagnosis, uh, nasal rhinospodiosis, differential diagnosis, infected eth ethmodal pulse being because uh, chilling is has been presented in both nasal cavities, in neglected foreign body, rhinoscleroma. Investigation, all blood investigation appears to be normal. So ESR is raised, chest X-ray normal, sir. Oh, is CT, paranasal sinus showing soft tissue opacity in the bilateral nasal cavity, in the chilling the bilateral nasal cavities, maxillary thickening is noted. Uh, this is uh, this is the untable uh, removed specimen, sir. This is left. Uh, this side one is the left one. This is the right uh, specimen, sir. On uh, on surgical plan, been uh, excision of mouth with base cauterization with uh, bipolar, bipolar diathermy under aseptic precautions under uh, general anesthesia under endotracheal intubation. Right nasal uh, cavity mass appears to be attached to uh, bony septum medially and uh, also involving the floor of the mouth, which has been removed with bilateral uh, bipolar diathermy. Right, coordination of the blade, similar type of uh, procedure is uh, done on the left side nasal cavity mass also, which is also attached to bone septum and medially floor 
uh, so interoperatively uh, interoperative immediate post operative vitals are stable exercise marks were sent for uh, histopathological examination follow up is revealed uh, visit for six months laterally no revealed really uh, no signs of recurrence oral dapsone 25 uh, mg od for three weeks has been used for this child uh, post operative follow up we can see no recurrence has been noted after day 14 uh, we can see whole of the middle turbinate floor fluffy is present still. This is the DNA picture of the patient. Uh, this is the HP picture showing uh, this is a surrounding granulomatous uh, inflammation with wall uh, with the uh, peripherally immature uh, sporangia, central mature sporangia. Uh, we cannot see the bursting of the sporangia stage now in, in this uh, slide. Uh, we can see in the HP that uh, respiratory epithelium, ex extensus plumus metaplasia, underlying ed uh, edematous fibrofoot collagenous stoma, showing congested blood vessels. So, classical granulomatous inflammation with surrounding uh, endospores, we can, we can see, sir. Uh, discussion uh, Renosporidiosis chronic uh, granulomatous disease is caused by Renosporidium seabury, affecting both man and, man and animals. Infective medium being contaminated water ponds and also frequent by animals. Life cycle, trophic stage, development of sporangia, production of endoscope. This causes burst of uh, endospores, sir. Uh, Actually, shows several sporangia, round oval shape, filling with spores may be seen pushing through the cadmus wall. Recurrence may, be, may occur after surgical uh, excision. Resolving uh, amphotericin B, dapsone are used as adjuvant therapy, but no supporting evidence for preventing recurrence has been noted, sir. These are my reference. Uh, thank you, sir, for. Uh, giving me this opportunity. On probe test, does it bleed on touch or uh, doesn't sir, bleed? Actually, uh, in, sir, actually in literature it is, it does bleed on touch, sir. But when I am doing it, was not bleeding, sir. We have tried that. Okay. 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 What, so, what are the indications for uh, Dapsone? Sir, Dapsone, uh, I have read in some case reports, sir, Dapsone prevents uh, recurrence, but no statistically significant uh, 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 research I have been not, not, not seen, sir. Okay. Oh, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Patient no palsy with massive meningitis in chronic separative water dysmedia. A case report. Introduction. Chronic separative water dysmedia is a long-standing infection of a part or whole of milliard cleft characterized by ear discharge and permanent perforation. Incidence is more in developing countries due to poor socioeconomic class and pure nutrition and lack of health education. It affects both gender and all age groups. Advent of the antibiotics decreases the disease progression and disease process is limited only to mucoperiosteal lining of the middle ear cleft. It spreads into the bony walls of the cleft or beyond. It leads to various complications. Facial paralysis is one of the most important co complications of chronic otitis media. In chronic otitis media, facial paralysis results from cholestoma or penetrating granular tissue or facial canal dissens. Facial paralysis is insidious but progressive sometimes. Urgent exploration is needed if it is progressing. Meningitis is most common intracranial complication of the otitis media. It can occur in both acute and chronic otitis media. It follows chronic ear disease which spreads by bone erosion or retrograde thrombophlebitis. Normally medical treatment is preferred. If response is not satisfactory then surgical intervention is needed immediately. Case report. A seven year old male shed a case of left facial palsy with meningitis referred from the pediatric department in view of left ear discharge since five months. History of present illness. Fever since one, one week. High grade intermittent, not associated with chills and rigor. Not associated with rash. Relieved with medication temporarily. Next stiffness unable to turn towards the left since four days. Deviation of the angle of mouth to the right. Associated with incomplete closure of the eye since four days. Left ear discharge since five months, incidence is onset, intermittent in nature, profuse mucopurulent, yellowish green color discharge, false smelling, not blood stain, measured with ear pain, not relieved with medication, no history of hard of hearing, ringing sensation of ears and giddiness, no history of head trauma, no history of nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, post nasal rip, no throat problems, no past medical and surgical history, family history, birth history, immunization history are not significant, personal history is normal. 
local examination systemic examination cardiovascular system respiratory system and per abdomen not not significant in central nervous system left facial nerve palsy with hausman house brackman grade 4 noticed facial nerve examination deviation of the angle of mouth to right incomplete closure of the left eye loss of pupils over the left side of the forehead loss of nasal nasolabial fold on the left side all other cranial nerve examination are normal local examination right ear is normal with intact tympanic membrane left ear pin up rear auricular area post auricular area are normal external auricular canal is filled with purulent yellowish discharge tympanic membrane central perforation is seen in the anterior superior quadrant with active discharge cone of light absent tragal sign negative maso tendon is non tendon tuning fork test Rennie's test, right ear positive, left ear negative with 56 heads, tuning fork, positive with 512 and 1024 heads, tuning fork, Weber test, lateral to left ear, absolute bone conduction test, same in both, same as examination in both ears, nose examination and oral cavity, oropharynx are normal. Investigations, HRCT temporal modes, opacification of the mesotympanum, hypotympanum, epitympanum, noted with extending into the mastered air cells via attic, with erosion of the ma malleus and tegment tympani erosion noted, which suggests to a Left total mastoiditis with involvement of milliar ossicles and tegment tympani erosion. These are my CT scans. CSF analysis bacterial meningitis with increased cell count and increased proteins, decreased sugar sugars noticed, futon audiometry, right ear 15 decibels, left ear 30 decibels with mild cardiac hearing loss, protein blood investigations were done, provisional diagnosis, left chronic separative otitis media. Or active stage with complications from fission of palsy and meningitis. Medical treatment was given. Intravenous systemic antibiotics and intravenous sterile therapy were given for the two weeks. No improvement was seen in with medical okay. treatment. So we proceeded to surgical management. Surgical procedure modified radical mastoidectomy with osteoclerosis chain reconstruction with facial now decompression under general anesthesia. Intraoperative findings granulation noted in the middle layer and mastoid antrum and clear. Granulation noted over the second general tympanic membrane segment of the facial now removed. Tegment tympani eroded and dura exposed, which is covered with peperous fascia. Incus and stape is suprastructural eroded. Conchal cartilage harvested and used for the osteoclerosis reconstruction. These are my intraop findings. Post-operative management, post-operatively IV systemic antibiotics and IV steroids given for the two weeks. Physiotherapy advice, Chell had complete recovery of the facial function six weeks after the surgery to house Brackman grade four. Discussion, chronic separated otis media can lead to various complications if untreated. One of the rare yet serious complication is occurrence of facial or palsy and meningitis. Meningitis in this case, it is following chronic otis media which spreads by bone erosion. That is the tegment tympan erosion noted in the CT scan. Treatment is exploration of the middle ear and mastoid. Facial palsy causing the granulation tissue surrounding the nerve is removed in this case. That is facial nerve decompression was done. Management of this case includes medical and surgical intervention with close follow-up and, follow and rehabilitation for the better recovery. These are my references. Thank you. What are the various routes of spread of infection from the ear to interest? Gitanjali. Sir, sir. What are the various routes of spread of infection from the ear to brain? External through the master through the master is hydrate. Through internal acoustic meatus. With Haversian canal. Through the leptomeninges. Direct extension and venous ramos clubitis. Hematogenous dissemination. Okay, great. Okay, next please. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Show the screen. Oh. Yes. Can I start, sir? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'll be presenting on the topic fibrous dysplasia of maxilla. So. Uh, 
uh, our aim for the study is to uh, to present the rare behavior and extensive bony tumor of maxilla in an adult male uh, and to establish the plan, diagnosis and plan for the management of this case. So coming into introduction, it is a rare bone tumor characterized by abnormal growth of fibrous tissue in place of normal bone tissue. It is caused due to the poor mutation in the genus 1 gene of chromosome 20, which leads to inhibition of GTPase activity, which is normally required to deactivate the G protein. So, and it decreases, it results in an increased amount of cyclic AMB, which results in and uh, upregulated proliferation and differentiated differentiation of bone stromal cells. This leads to all production of fibrous tissues in the bones. So there are three types of fibrous dysplasia. It, it could be monostotic, polystotic, or craniofacial. 80% of the patients present with uh, swelling or facial bone. The most common site will be maxilla followed by mandible, and it accounts to about 70 to 80% of monostotic cases. And on SPE, we will be able to see masses of fibrous connective tissue with walls and spans of spindle cells, cellular cells, uh, 4K of cartilage, and metaplastic bone formation, replacing the bone marrow and eroding the bone cortex. So coming into our case, uh, it was a 26-year-old male who came with the OPD with a history of right-sided cheek swelling for the past seven years, which was insidious in onset, slowly progressive, painless in nature, with no aggravating or uh, relieving factors. He was also complaining of right-sided nasal obstruction with no other symptoms. He had no other uh, significant illness in the past and uh, never had any previous surgeries. The patient is a non-alcoholic with about 30 ml per day, and he is also a chronic smoker with uh, five packages of smoking. So on examination, the patient was noted to have a single 8 into 7 centimeter size, bony, hard, tender, irregular swelling over the right cheek. Uh, it was bounded medially by the root of nose, laterally by uh, the pin, like for, uh, the area 4 centimeter in front of pinna, superiorly infraorbital margin, and inferiorly 5 centimeter above the base of mandible. Right infraorbital margin was noted to be at a higher level than left side with obliteration of the right nasal abel fold. There was also a smooth, non-tender bulging in the gingival uh, buccal sulcus from the second incisor to the second premolar tooth. Uh, the investigations were all normal except for the total leukocyte count of 13,000 and platelet count of 92,000. Uh, CT scan was done on which we could appreciate the ground glass appearance and also the displacement of maxillary sinus and the lateral nasal wall, which was uh, consistent with the features which are seen in the fibrous dysplasia. Uh, on DNA, uh, the patient was noted to have bulging of lateral wall of right nostril medially, which was obscuring the view of uh, nasal cavity proper. Uh, there was also a DNS to its left, and the nasopharynx and the left nasal cavity was seemed to be normal. So these are our differential diagnoses. It includes simple bone cyst, non osteophyte fibroma, osteophyte dysplasia, and adamantinoma. So coming into management, the patient was treated with the right partial maxillectomy. The incision which was used was Weber Ferguson, and we exposed the ender anatomy of maxilla after raising the soft tissue and periosteum. In intraoperatively, the findings were extensive bone growth involving anterolateral wall, posterior wall of right maxilla, ethmoid, sphenoid sinus, and rutosigoma and heart palate. So and uh, under wall, uh, floor of maxilla, and the partial removal of posterior wall and medial wall of maxilla was removed by paring and drilling. Floor of orbit, rotosigoma uh, drilling was done and spared, and posterior part of posterior and part of posterior wall of maxilla was preserved. There was a heart palate defect which was present. So these are some of the in-drop pictures. This was before the incision, and this was after the excision of tumor. Uh, this was the tumor which was excised, and it was sent for SPE. On SPE, the report came as uh, fibrosis lesion composed of numerous irregularly shaped trabeculae in the immature uh, woven bone seen various shapes and tiny cellular pattern, which we are able to appreciate over here. And the trabecula also lacked osteoblastic rimming and are surrounded by fibrous tissue with numerous scattered congested blood vessels. Uh, these are the post of pictures. Uh, this was the post of DNA and the oral cavity. You could see the heart palate defect. So, coming into discussion, it is a rare non cancerous bone to, uh, disorder that primarily affects bone, uh, facial bones, including upper jaw and maxilla. It represents about 2.5% of all bone tumors and uh, over 7% of benign tumors. It can occur at any uh, age with no general prediction, and uh, it progresses slowly after puberty or matur bone maturation. Uh, the prognosis is, uh, is generally good, especially when the condition is well managed. But regular follow-up is required to monitor any changes. And there is also, uh, it also requires ongoing support, including dental care, uh, pain management, and potential reconstructive surgeries. So coming into conclusion, uh, we require as, uh, it the cases require proper surgical planning for complete exposure of tumor, and in some cases, uh, complete excision of uh, the involved bone with reconstruction of resultant defect with primary autogenous bone may be possible. In some cases, debulking of the original, uh, or debulking 
uh, in some cases, after developing of regional fibrous dysplasia may be done. And recurrence of tumor is very rare, uh, but lifelong uh, monitoring is required. These are my references. Thank you. What is the percentage of recurrence in this case? Fibrous yeah. dysplasia. Yeah. It, it was seen to be very rare, sir, less than 1%. What is that syndrome? It usually coexists with this fibrous dysplasia. And what are the components? So the symptom usually seen is Jeffen uh, Lycansian syndrome, sir. It will be uh, seen with the uh, involvement of at least two bonds with the uh, coexist with the brown to white pigmentation, sir. Also, McBoon Albright syndrome can also be seen with fibrous dysplasia, sir. In uh, in McBoon Albright syndrome, there will also be uh, hyperfunction endocrinopathies and uh, brown to brown pigmentation, sir. Okay. Okay. Next candidate. So good morning, sir. Good morning. So one minute. Sir. So good morning, sir. Sir, good morning, sir. My name is Dr. Bhavna. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Dr. Bhavna. Today I am presenting a case of separative granulomatous inflammation of fungal etiology, mucor mycosis. Chronic granulomatous disease is an inherited primary immunodeficiency disease of phagocytic function due to defective NADPH oxidase, which increases the body's susceptibility to infections caused by certain bacteria and fungi. A, a granuloma is an organized collection of macrophages known as epithelial cells, which fuse to form multinucleated germ cells. Granulomatous disease often are systemic processes with manifestations throughout the body. In the head and neck, granulomatous diseases have a wide range of clinical manifestations that may affect the orbits, sinonasal cavities, salivary glands, aerodigestive tract, temporal bone, skull base, or vascular structures. These may be infectious, idiopathic, or hereditary. Examination of features common to the condition discussed here can be refractory inflammation of nasal mucosa with nasal crusting, bleeding, friable mucosa, often with necrosis of the nasal septum, occasionally with extension into adjacent structures. Case history, a 22-year-old male presented with unilateral left side nasal obstruction since three months, history of nasal discharge present, history of one episode of epistaxis present, history of headache present, history of hyposmia present, no history of trauma, pain, facial heaviness, and other orbital symptoms, not a known case of hypertension or diabetes, no significant past history and medical history. General examination and the vitals are normal. On local examination, external appearance, a bulge is seen over the left side of the nose. External deformity of the nose was disturbed. On anterior rhinoscopy, a pinkish mass is seen in the left nostril, covering whole of the left nasal cavity. Septum is deviated to right side. On probe test, probe cannot be passed all around the mass. On posterior rhinoscopy is normal. On endoscopy, a pinkish mass is seen arising from the lateral wall of the nose covering whole of the left nasal cavity. Investigation, uh, computer tomography of paranasal sinuses showed soft tissue density, densities noted in left nasal cavity, left maxillary, ethmoidal and frontoethmoidal recess. Left osteomatal unit is compromised. Visualized sections of the orbit appears normal. On MRI, paranasal sinuses, mucosal thickening is noted in the bilateral maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses and mucosal hypertrophy of left inferior turbinate and left concavulosa. 
management surgical resection was done with a lateral rhinotomy procedure with more incision with upper left with upper lip split was used for the better exposure attachment of the mask identified release and the mask was sent for histopathological examination and it was closed with pfizer proline on histopathological examination fragments of the tissue with extensive necrosis focally lined by stratified stratified columnar epithelium stroma shows dense inflammatory cell infiltrates by neutrophils lymphoplasmocytes plasmocytes eosinophils multinucleated jain cells admixed with epithelial granulomas and around fungal elements these are extensively degenerated edematous connective tissue admixed with areas of fibrocollagenous tissue and broad non septate hyphae fungal elements are noted these features are suggestive of separative granulomatous inflammation of fungal etiology morphologically consistent with mucor mycosis discussion granulomatous lesions of nose can be infective inflammatory or neoplastic mucor mycosis is an opportunistic permanent fungal infection caused by rhizopus species which most commonly affects nose paranasal sinuses and cerebral tissues mucor mycosis are a group of inf invasive infections caused by filamentous fungi of mucoraceae family rhinocerebral mucor mycosis rhino orbital mucor mycosis rhino maxillary mucor mycosis are different types of mucor mycosis these fungi have the tendency to erode and invert small blood vessels leading to thrombosis ischemia and tissue necrosis population at risk include hematopoietic stem cells stem cell transplant recipients patients with hematological malignancies diabetes mellitus ketoacidosis burns trauma malnutrition covid infections premature neonates and patients receiving iron chelation and prolonged corticosteroid therapy treatment consists of surgical debridement of the affected tissues of the affected tissues and the antifungal drugs Amphotericin B is the antifungal drug of choice for the treatment of mucor mycosis. Oral posaconazole is also used as salvage therapy. Conclusion: People who have uncontrolled diabetes are more susceptible to this black fungal infection, but early signs of mucor mycosis can be challenging to detect. Early detection and aggressive management are paramount in eradicating mucor mycosis. Thorough clinical assessment, meticulous patient history, and comprehensive investigations are prerequisites for accurate diagnosis, aggressive medical and surgical management of infections in chronic granulomatous diseases are crucial out crucial factors in improving the outcome. These are my references. Thank you. What are the blood parameters you like to monitor during antifungal therapy in case of mucor mycosis? Renal. Bhavana. What is guitar pick sign on MRI? Sorry, sir, no idea. Okay, leave. Next candidate. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Good morning. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Good, uh, sir. Can I start? Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kavias. I'm here to present a case report on basal cell carcinoma, left tail of nose. Basal cell carcinoma is a slowly progressing non melanistic cancer. It arises from the basal cells of the epidermis, just small round cells on the lower layer of the epidermis. It's locally aggressive, slow growing, and rarely metastasis, which is less than 0.55%. It can cause local invasion and cause tissue destruction, and it's also called a rodent ulcer. Most common sites of face, uh, usually about the line drawn between the angle of mouth and ear lobule. Other common sites include head, nail, scalp, neck, and hand, predominantly seen in unexposed areas. It is a common skin cancer, but it accounts for only less than 0.1% of deaths in cancer. Basal carcinoma of the nose has 2.5 times higher risk of recurrence after surgical excision. If left untreated, it can locally invade and cause significant, significant tissue destruction. 
coming to my case, uh, my patient present with the uh, swelling over the left of nose since one year. She was 50 year old. Uh, it was an incidence in onset, initially small, gradually progressive. Not associated with pain, itching, discharge. Uh, no bleed on, not necessarily bleeding on touch, no history of any nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, or nasal bleed, no history of any preceding trauma, similar lesions over other parts of the body, no ear and throat complaints. She's a known case of hypertension on regular medication, no significant past surgical history, family history. Other than regular uh, history of sinus exposure, there is no other significant personal history. General examination, vital, vital sensitivity and examination with the normal limits. Coming to local examination on inspection, that's a single oval shape, approximately three to two centimeters size swelling, pinkish over the left oil of nose with postulated surface with well defined margins. Part of the swelling shows blackish discoloration and the surrounding skin appears normal. On palpation, there is no local rise of temperature, nor tenderness, non tender. A single oval shape, three to two centimeter size swelling over the left oil of nose with postulated surface with well defined margins, which is firm, non mobile, non fluctuating, and non reducible. And the skin over the swelling is non pingeable. There is no bleed on touch. On examination, nose and paranasal sinuses are normal. Bilateral ears, oral cavity, oropharynx is normal. There are no palpable lymphs. My professional diagnosis is basal cell carcinoma of left oil of nose. Differential diagnosis include malignant melanoma, squamous cell carcinoma, intradermal nevus, and trichotillioma. Coming to the management part, routine blood investigations were done and was normal. And preoperative -pre evaluation done, and the patient was planned for excision biopsy, uh, wide local excision, and reconstruction under LA. Reconstruction plan was by advancement perforator cheek flap, vascular supply by transverse facial branches, superficial temporal artery. So, a surgical procedure under local anesthesia, patient supine position, infiltration given all around the swelling, incision given, and the swelling was excised in total with a margin of 5 mm. For the reconstruction, infiltration was given all around the cheek area, incision was given, first incision over the inferior aspect of the defect and is outlined in the nasofacial sulcus in medial labial crease, second incision over the superior aspect of the defect, the lateral canthus and subciliary line, and the flap was dissected medially to laterally in the suppressed mass or the subcutaneous plane. Flap advanced to the defect and anchored with absorbable sutures and skin flap sutured with non-absorbable suture material. Post-operative follow-up period was uneventful, there was no secondary wound infection or wound gaping. This has been my poster photos at week one and week three. Histological examination showed uh, proliferation of base large cells with peripheral palisading and features were consistent with basal cell carcinoma. Coming to the discussion part, basal cell carcinoma or rodent ulcer is a common cutaneous malignancy according for 75% of all skin cancers. It rarely metastasized. There's no lymphatic spread and but, but can cause local invasion. Mutation in the tumor suppressor gene, PPCH, can be there. Inactivation of fish can lead to uncontrolled basal cell proliferation. Risk factors include fair skin, fair or red hair, UV rays exposure, male sex, old age, previous history of basal cell carcinoma. The main goals of treatment include to complete, completely remove the tumor to prevent recurrence and to give best cosmetic result to the patient. Various treatment modalities are available for basal cell carcinoma, which include surgical excision for better cosmetic result with reconstruction, more surgery with least recurrence of 1%, radiotherapy, curative and cautery for smaller BCC, cryotherapy, but gives poor cosmetic result. Small and superficial lesions may require only topical imiquinol, 5 fluorouracil photodynamic therapy. Laser treatment is still under research. Some of the flaps that can be used for reconstruction of the defect after surgical excision include advancement, advancement cheek flap, nasolabial flap, bilobed pedicle flap, pedicle melolabial flap, jigsaw puzzle advancement flap. Conclusion, basal carcinoma is a locally, locally aggressive tumor. Wide local excision along with reconstruction of defect by local flaps can give good cosmetic result in case of BCC or failure of nose. To conclude, wide local excision with advancement cheek flap can be considered as one of the first choice techniques for management of basal carcinoma and allows an aesthetic reconstruction of defect of the, ala, of the nasal sidewall in a single stage and a single donor side without distorting surrounding function and aesthetic structures. These are my references. Thank you, sir. Sir. Okay. 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 Uh, is there any role of uh, laser? We sir, don't think uh, any, it is still under research, laser. sir. There are no case reports showing uh, effective treatments are still under research, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next. Thank you. Next candidate. Good morning, sir. Myself, Nikita. My topic is idiopathic bilateral Bell's palsy, a rare case report. 
To begin with, Bell's palsy is defined as idiopathic lower motor neuron paralysis or paralysis of acute onset. Unilateral facial palsy yes. has an incidence of yes. 25 in 1 lakh population. EPD, share your screen. Sir. One second, sir. Say PPT. Yes, sir. One second. Sir, is it visible, sir? No. No. Now, sir? No. Not visible. Yes. Yes, oh, sir, it is visible. Yes, yes. Go on. Yes. Good morning, sir. Myself, Nikita. My topic is idiopathic bilateral Bell's palsy, a rare case report. To begin with, Bell's palsy is defined as... Sir, one second. To begin with, Bell's palsy is defined as idiopathic lower motor neuron paralysis or paralysis of acute onset. Unilateral facial palsy has an incidence of 25 in 1 lakh population, while bilateral facial palsy accounts for only 2% of all the facial palsies, incidence being 1 in 5 million population. Bilateral facial paralysis is a rare condition. Most of the patients develop bilateral facial nerve palsy secondary to underlying medical conditions which can be neurologic, infectious, traumatic, neoplastic, or metabolic. Case history and examination. A 32 years old female with history of sudden onset of left-sided facial weakness followed by bilateral facial weakness with inability to close both the eyes, difficulty in smiling, difficulty in chewing food since three days. Patient had a history of traveling and exposure to cold. No history of fever, myalgia, sore throat, headache, head trauma, ear complaints, fever, joint pains, rashes over face and limbs. On examination, vitals were normal. Ear examination revealed normal with bilateral tympanic membrane intact. Neurological examination showed bilateral facial paralysis with grade 4. Patient had noticeable slurring of speech. No other cranial nerve involvement was elicited and no focal neurological deficit was found. Other motor and sensory examinations were normal. Ophthalmological examination revealed intact corneal reflexes and Schimmer's test was normal. This was uh, the presentation of the patient at the time uh, when she came to our OPD. She was unable to close her eyes completely and uh, she was not able to raise her eyebrows. Investigations, all routine biochemical and microbiological tests were done and were normal. Chest X-ray and X-ray spine were normal. CT brain and MRI brain revealed no obvious abnormality. Serolo serological tests were performed. In serology, ASO titer, RA factor, anti-HIV antibody, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, anti-nuclear antibodies and syphilis antibody were all found to be negative. This is a chest X-ray of the patient, X-ray spine and CT brain, which revealed no obvious abnormality. Management, we advised fa uh, facial exercises with physiotherapy. Patient was started on oral cyclovir 200 mg three times a day for one week and methylprednisolone 16 mg thrice a day for five days, followed by a tapering dose and methyl cellulose eye drops. Patient was followed up after one week and she had complete closure of eyes and restored facial movements. Follow up after one week, she was able to close her eyes with minimal effort, blow her cheeks and uh, mild deviation was seen towards left side. 
follow up after two weeks she was able to close her eyes without any efforts blow her cheeks and deviation of the mouth was also correct to talk on bell's palsy the etiology of facial palsy includes many conditions such as congenital traumatic infections neurological metabolic neoplastic toxic vascular and idiopathic etiologies such as lyme disease being the most common gulen barry followed by trauma sarcoidosis and aids are the major causes multiple idiopathic cranial neuropathies meningitis brain stem encephalitis benign intracranial hypertension leukemia melkerson rosenthal syndrome diabetes mellitus syphilis infectious mononucleosis are other conditions which needs to be excluded unfortunately we were unable to rule out epstein barr virus and borrelia serology for lyme and infectious mononucleosis to wrap up with in comparison to unilateral facial nerve palsy the bilateral facial nerve palsy is a rare morbidity with broad spectrum of differential diagnosis while unilateral facial palsy is usually idiopathic or post viral the bilateral facial palsy needs to be considered for a wide range of etiological factors take home message patients with bilateral facial palsy should be thoroughly assessed by proper history taking routine and specific laboratory and radiological investigations to find the cause so that the patient can be managed accordingly these are my references sir thank you we didn't see your uh, case presentation completely i mean say ppt presentation but still okay what is the criteria to say uh, bell's palsy sir like a uh, patient had uh, at the time of presentation patient had uh, uh, she was uh, so complaining of weakness over the left side with ipsilateral ear pain sir and she had history of travel and exposure to cold sir so with okay ma'am thank you thank you sir. Okay. good morning sir am i audible yes 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 so this is the second presentation is it so is my screen uh, am i is it visible am i audible Yes. Yes. So this is second presentation. Second person presenting. No, sir, yeah, yeah. My number is twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yes. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Okay, twenty-six. First batch, sir. First batch. Last but one. Sir, sir. Good morning, uh -huh. sir. Chief. Welcome to the seminar, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, your session will start from the serial number twenty-eight candidate, sir. Twenty-eight, ah? Uh? Uh, no, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the first session not ended, sir, because of some technical issue. Okay, it was dragged okay. half an hour okay, okay. more time, sir. Uh, sorry to disturb, sir. sir. Satna Rana, sir. Sorry to disturb you. Okay, Please okay, carry okay. on. Yes. Please, <laughs> sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning to one and all. I'm Dr. Sapura Sami, and I'm going to present a, case, a rare case of syringocyst adenoma papillariform of the external organ. Case history: A six-year-old patient presented with complaints of swelling in the right ear since one year, which increased in onset, gradually increasing to to attain the present size. The swelling was associated with itching, due to which the child developed a habit of ear pain, which uh, was followed by bleeding right ear. She also complains of right ear pain occasionally, which is of dull, aching type of pain, and it did not radiate to the surrounding areas. There was no history of any ear discharge or hearing hearing loss or ringing sensation in the ears. Uh, there was no history of any dizziness, fever, weight loss, or loss of appetite. No nose or throat complaints. Past history was insignificant. The child was fully immunized, born of a non-consanguineous marriage. Personal history or family history remained insignificant. Clinical examination: the right ear, pinna, preauricular area, and postauricular area was normal. A uh, single mass was seen at the opening of the right external auditory canal that was arising from the posterior wall of the external auditory canal. 
Now the mass appeared to be reddish, smooth, ovoid in shape, with the largest diameter being 0.8 centimeters. Skin over swelling was normal, and there was no ulceration. Surrounding skin was also normal, and since there had been bleeding, dried up blood was seen on the uh, right external auditory canal. Now there was no local rise in temperature. Swelling was soft in consistency, non-tender, mobile, with well-defined margins. The rest of the external auditory canal and tympanic membrane could not be visualized because of the mass. Left ear examination remained to be normal. Facial nerve was intact, and there was no palpable cervical lymph nodes. The rest of the head and neck uh, examination remained unremarkable. For investigations, we did routine blood investigations, which came out to be normal. On auto endoscopy, our clinical findings were confirmed, and the tympanic membrane was normal and intact, which could not be visualized earlier. Now, for managing this case, we went in for a complete excisional biopsy under general anesthesia, followed by a histopathological examination. In the picture, you can see the specimen that was collected. Now, for histopathological examination, it revealed syringocystatinoma papilliferum of the right EAC. So here you can see slides of different various magnifications, where you can see glandular uh, tissue with uh, ceruminous uh, cysts, and uh, you can see papillary projections that project into the cystic cavity. Uh, it, is a, it has a double layered epithelium, outer uh, epithelium being cuboidal and inner epithelium being columnar, which is suggestive of syringocystadenoma papilliferum. This, is my histo uh, his this was the histopathological report, the patient. Now discussion. Syringocystadenoma papilliferum is an uncommon benign adnexial tumor. Most commonly, it occurs on the scalp. Usually, we have 75% uh, cases that occur on the head and neck. In the EAC, we have only less than 2% of the cases, and this will involve the ceruminous glands. Hogg was the first one to describe the ceruminous gland tumors, and he gave the term ceruminoma. Tumors of this gland can be benign or malignant. And of, if you compare them to all the EAC tumors, it accounts to less than 5%. Benign or malignant, so benign ones are uh, ceruminous adenoma, pleomorphic adenoma, and syringosis adenoma. Malignant ones are adenocarcinoma, adenocystic carcinoma, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and syringosis adenocarcinoma. Now, in literature, we have a total of 150 cases of ceruminous tumors and only 17 cases up till date of syringosis adenoma. Usual presentation will be at birth or early childhood. And commonly, this is uh, associated with sedicious nevus. However, in our case, we didn't have any such association. It is also associated with other tumors like tricholemoma, epocrine adenoma, hydradenoma, and trichoblastoma. There is a role of radiological investigation. CT scan can be done and MRI can be done. CT scan, basically, we want to rule out malignancies and bony erosions. Kamakura et al. had uh, given certain criteria for, uh, to use MRI also as a diagnostic tool. He, uh, he said that on T1 and T2 weighted images, intermediate sig uh, signal intensities were seen and slight enhancement on gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted image. Now, because of the size and the benign appearance with clearly well-defined margins, we did not go for any radiological examination in our case. Few cases of malignant transformation also have been reported. Uh, we can see syringocystadenocarcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, verrucous, and ductal carcinomas. Whenever there is malignant transformation, there would be rapid enlargement and ulceration. So um, because of this risk of transformation, we need to go in for a prophylactic surgical, complete surgical excision. It remains the mainstay of the treatment, excision followed by histopathological examination. Periodic monitoring is also recommended because if there is incomplete removal, reoccurrence can occur, and also there is a rare potential of malignant transformation. So in conclusion, although syringocystadenoma is a rare benign adnexial tumor, we should consider it as a differential diagnosis when dealing with lesions of this area. Complete excision with histopathological examination is a must in these cases to avoid recurrence and malignant transformation. These are my references. Thank you. Okay, next please. Okay. Okay, ne next next candidate. Yes. yes. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Sir, can I start? Yes. Uh, sir, good morning, sir. Uh, I am myself, Dr. Nagaraju. I'm presenting the, the case report on foreign body bronchus vision. 
A foreign body aspiration is relatively commonly encountered emergency in the periodic age group. It can lodge at any side from the supraglottis to the renal bronchus. Foreign body bronchus is usually more common on the right side due to its relatively striker and wider anatomy. The presentation varies depending on the site, size, nature, and the duration of the foreign body. Negative imaging studies, however, do not exclude the presence of foreign body in the airway. Sometimes bronchoscopy may be required as in both as a diagnostic as well as therapeutic modality. Endoscopic removal alone is successful in majority cases. Selected may require surgical intervention. Uh, coming to my case, uh, a 12 year old male jail with the alleged history of accident classification of whistle one day back, uh, came to our hospital with chief complaints of whistling sound while cuffed. <laughs> So the concern was taken for uh, playing the video. Uh, it is not present uh, at rest or while breathing. No history of choking, difficulty in breathing or noisy breathing. No history of changing voice, vomiting, rolling of saliva. No history of throat pain or difficulty in swallowing. No ear and nose complaints. Uh, no significant past medical and surgical history. No significant family and personal history. A general examination with the normal limits with no signs of respiratory distress or strider. Vitals are within normal limits with saturation of 98% at room air with a respiratory rate of 16 beats per minute. Systemic examination, respiratory system, saturation was uh, 98% at room air with no strider, uh, no chest retractions or no use of axillary muscles of respiration. Air entry is mildly decreased on the right side of chest in all areas with the uh, V's present on the right side. Other systemic examination are within normal limits. Examination of bilateral ears, nose, oral cavity and oropharynx are normal. My provisional diagnosis is a foreign body airway probably on the right, right bronchus. Uh, investigation chest x-ray was done and was normal and uh, CT virtual bronchoscopy suggests of a foreign body on the right main bronchus. Uh, routine blood investigations were done and normal. Patient was uh, planned for rigid bronchoscopy under general anesthesia. A surgical procedure rigid bronchoscopy was performed under general anesthesia with jet ventilation. Patient was made to lie in Boise's position. Rigid bronchoscopy was introduced and trachea was evaluated. A blackish visual visualized at the right main bronchus. An attempt to remove inner part of the visual got separated and ends was removed under vision. Second attempt was made to remove the remaining part of the visual. As there was difficulty, patient was planned for tracheostomy and was done uneventfully. Endoscope passed through the tracheostomy stoma and the uh, body of the visual was removed. No intraoperative injury to the bronchial wall, intraoperative period and immediate postoperative period was uneventful. Postoperative follow period was uneventful. Bilateral uh, air entry and auscultation was equal and no iron sounds. Patient was uh, successfully decannulated on the uh, postoperative day 10 and the uh, follow period was uneventful. Uh, these are my postoperative picks on week 5 and week 6. Uh, coming to the discussion, foreign body in a pediatric airway is a life threatening clinical situation requiring immediate intervention. Child may present with absolute airway obstruction causing respiratory distress, strider, even respiratory arrest. In the absence of respiratory complaints, the presentation can be laid. Endoscopy retrieval alone is successful in majority cases. O open surgical intervention may be required in uh, some, uh, some cases, which can be in the form of tracheostomy, tracheotomy, bronchotomy, and RR pulmonary resection. The need for open surgical intervention ranges from 0.3% to 4%. In selected cases, after the preliminary bronchoscopy, the surgeon may use additional tracheostomy, which entails a uh, Risk, uh, lower risk as it protects underlying airway or facilitates removal and reduces the need for repeated attempts of bronchoscopy. Tracheostomy is occasionally indicated as in cases like subglottic foreign body of longer duration, sharp subglottic foreign body, foreign body larger than the glottic chin, impacted foreign body in the bronchus with a difficulty in removal with bronchoscopy as done in this case. There is no evidence of additional mortality or long-term long -term complications because of tracheostomy in such cases. Uh, coming to the conclusion, patients of foreign body of the airway can present with no respiratory complaints. The presentation depends on the site of lodgement of foreign body. Uh, even though most cases can be managed through bronchoscopy, selected may require the open procedures like tracheostomy. Cylindrical objects, as seen in this case, tend to till laterally when pulled up. Thus, diameter tends to become larger and thus can get uh, impacted at the subglottis, or there can be difficulty in removing even with multiple attempts of bronchoscopy, which may require further tracheostomy. To conclude, tracheostomy may, may be indicated to secure the airway in certain foreign bodies that can get obstructed at the glottic chin or in cases that pose difficulty in removal via repeated attempts of bronchoscopy. These are my references and thank you, sir. Dr. Naraj, sir. What is tracheal third? Where do you get? Uh, in foreign body. Hmm. 
uh, when the when your uh, foreign body in the trachea it is moving up with the uh, cuff oh uh, yes uh, the patient uh, we can feel the uh, foreign body on palpation over the neck that is pal uh, tracheal thud or palpatory thud that we can see in uh, moving of foreign body in the trachea common foreign body common is, foreign bodies this uh, season peanuts no no not peanut ah uh, what is the seed in this season now you are getting tamarind seeds no tamarind will not cause tracheal thud It will not move. It is so big. It will impact. Now in this season, which is very common, uh... how do you uh, achieve Boyce's position? Uh, Boyce's position will uh, we'll flex the uh, neck. Will flex at the neck and extension at the atrium occipital joint, sir. uh by keeping your head pillow under the a pillow under the head okay you didn't answer sir's question uh, sir that's uh, the seat of all seats sir i ah uh, uh, very good yes, right sir. yes sir that thank you sir commonest cause of trichal thud yes sir thank you sir peanut peanut uh, tamarind seed they will not cause peanut go to go, goes to one of the bronchus Uh, the tamarind which, which which will impact in trachea so big okay yes sir thank you sir good thank you sir sir uh, <clears throat> uh, hello good morning good sir just wait just wait amma i yes, think yes, before yes. your presentation i would yes. like to thank our chairperson dr benjamin rathkumar sir and uh, thanks our beloved judges dr satyanarayan sir retired uh, head of the department of kagathiya medical college and dr m prabhakar sir professor from andhra medical college thank you so retired. much sir 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 please say don't retire yes, sir thank, thank you thank you sir. thank you sir and, uh, and for, uh, sir for, sir for most i would like to congratulate all the candidates who have presented very well their content is very good in this yes. regard i would like to congratulate the hods of concerned uh, medical various medical colleges and thank you my co-judges thank you satyanand sir i am your student Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> sir, thank. For we are going moving on to the next session from twenty-eight serial number one. Uh, we will invite the chair person. Uh, uh, I am. I am logging out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I will talk. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, yes, the uh, hosts also, Sahasra ENT Foundation. Yeah, yeah, sir, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, Doctor Nagavardhan Reddy uh, uh, as the chair person for this session. and uh, i welcome our beloved judges dr cv sinwas sir from uh, bangalore and uh, dr jay prakash reddy sir from kannur hearty welcome sir thank you sir thank you yeah, and yeah. Uh, good morning jp sir jp sir sir is jay prakash sir ha yeah, he is there sir Yeah, uh, sir. Yes, sir. You can Hello? continue the session, sir. Twenty-eight serial number one. Yes, sir. Ramesh. Yeah, sir. Welcome, sir. Good morning, sir. So, so, so now the thing is, uh, so when one candidate presents, so both of us will be giving the marks to them, or we need to one by one we need to do. No, no, no. Both of you, sir. Both of I will take the average from you. This is a case report session, sir. There is only five minute limitation, sir. If they finish no, no, within no. the five minutes only, you can ask the question, sir. Like no, 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 five minutes. No, 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 five minutes. Each candidate is having fifty marks from each examiner, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is. Yes, okay, yes, go ahead. First candidate, you can go ahead. Five zero, sir. Fifty. Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah, I have sent the form, sir. Evaluation form. In that, there is a split. Is this a ten, ten, ten for each each thing? Oh, maximum mark fifty, sir. Uh, I will take the average from both of you, sir. Sinas. Ah, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Go One ahead. Candidate, you take care. Yes, sir. Ah. Uh, one candidate i will take care question okay fine let us not waste uh, much of our time yeah, yeah. okay true true all right okay yes, go sir. ahead madam okay good morning sir uh, my name is ayushi gupta 
uh, I will be presenting a case report on uh, second brachial cleft fistula. So brachia is a Greek word for gill and uh, uh, brachial apparatus is seen in the early embryonic life that has a vital role to play in the development of head and neck structures. Brachial cyst sinus fistula appear as developmental failure. The apparatus anomaly account for about 17% of pediatric cervical mass, out of which 90% are second brachial cleft and um, uh, brachial arch anomaly. And out of those 90%, 13% account for second brachial arch fistula, which is rare. Male to female uh, sex ratio is about 1 to 0.27 is to 1. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sir. Next slide. Okay, sorry, sir. My next slide was not coming. Uh, so, a case report a 24 year old male patient presented to ER ENT OPD with complaint of discharge from an opening on left side of his neck on and off since childhood. Discharge is mucoid in consistency, non false smelling, non blood stain, two to three blood, blood dro uh, drops in quantity, oozes on application of pressure locally. On examination, a slit like opening is present on the left side of the neck at junction of middle and lower uh, third of anterior border of left sternocleidomastoid. Mucoid discharge oozes on pressure application. There is no tenderness, no local rise of temperature. Skin around the opening is also normal. No previous ENT surgeries. Uh, local ENT in systemic examination was normal. Uh, investigation ultrasound neck, a heterogeneous hypoechoic tract from the anterior border of left sternocleidomastoid between the lower and third uh, of sternocleidomastoid ending prob probably into the necrotic submandibular lymph node. On CECT fistulogram, uh, a contrast of pacified tract is seen from an external opening in the middle one third of neck anterior to left sternocleidomastoid and is seen extending posterior superiorly, coursing anterior to sternocleidomastoid muscle, abutting to the branch of internal jugular vein, coursing between internal and external carotid artery for length approximately 6 to 6.5 centimeter, eventually opening in the left palatine tonsillar region. In this video, uh, we can see the fistulous tract going between the internal and external carotid artery. Uh, Next, uh, the surgery we performed was second brachial cleft fistulectomy under general anesthesia. Patient was kept in supine position. The marking was done around the fistula. Local infiltration given with 2% locks in 1 uh, lakh adrenaline. Skin incision given with 15 number blade. Methylene blue dye was injected from the mouth of the fistulous opening. Uh, then the tract was held with Babcock's forceps and it was uh, separated from the nearby surrounding tissue. Uh, and uh, it was dissected from below upwards direction. This uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle was identified. Second incision was given about 2 cm above the primary incision in a stepladder manner, 1 cm below the inferior border of mandible. Then uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue uh, were dissected. Then uh, the fistula tract was pulled out from the second incision. Uh, and uh, the internal jugular, jugular vein was also identified. Dissection of the tract continued till the base of the tract. A finger was used from the left tonsillar fossa and both the fingers were palpated against each other. Then the base of the tract was identified. It was uh, li ligated, clamped with the help of curved artery forceps and ligated with the help of silk 2.0. The layers of the skin were closed with help of vicryl and uh, vicryl 2.0 then monocryl uh, 2.0. Then uh, the tract was removed in total and was sent for uh, histopathological examination. This is the tract. The length was approximately 6.5 centimeters. Uh, so on histopathological examination, the tissue was lined by uh, stratified squamous epithelium. Discussion part, pharyngeal pouchings are outpouchings from the foregut region. They are separate externally by brachial cleft. They develop around the fifth to sixth week of gestation, consist about six pairs of finger-like masses, out of which the fifth pair uh, disappears. Each arch will have its own muscular cartilaginous artery and nerve uh, derivation. The anomalies of brachial apparatus are predisposed because of complex morphodynamics of brachial arch region. Abnormality can range as simple as minor cyst to orofacial malformation. It can present as cyst, sinus, or fistula. Both sides opening are present. Uh, so if there is a defect in the second arch, there will be a fistulous opening at the anterior part of the tonsillar fossa. Defect in the third arch will lead to opening in the areas of larynx. Defect in the fourth arch will lead to opening in the piriform sinus. So there are four theories for the formation of brachial uh, cyst fistula. Cyst or fistula. Uh, so brachial apparatus theory, uh, it is because of failure of fusion of two elements. Cervical sinus theory, because of remains of the cervical sinus of his. 
thymopharyngeal duct because of remnants of the original connection between the thymus and brachial pouch inclusion theory because of uh, epithelial inclusion cyst within the lymph node now bailey classified this second brachial anomaly based on the location type 1 where it lies uh, anterior and adjacent to the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle type 2 where the cyst lies on the greater vessels and can adhere to the internal jugular vein type 3 where the lesion extends between the internal and the external carotid artery type 4 where the lesion is lying in the parapharyngeal space just next to the uh, pharyngeal wall these are my references uh, thank you sir jp sir uh, your call this one what are the chances of recurrence in this patient uh sir during the surgery uh, we have tried to remove the tract till the base we have palpated and we have removed uh, we have made sure that there is no tract left over so uh, uh, if there is no left over tissue the chances of recurrence are less of course if this patient we get a recurrence in what form it will recur it will be again a sinus or a fistula or it will be a cyst if it recurs uh maybe he'll just have a swelling a cystic swelling in the remnant tissue if we have left over during the surgery okay perfect thank you sir good afternoon so sir 29 good afternoon sir am i audible and visible yes 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 one second sir so my name is dr bushra azmat my topic is phenoid sinus inverted papilloma presenting as bilateral nasal polyposis Introduction inverted papilloma is a rare benign tumor of the nose which usually originates from its lateral wall only 5% of cases demonstrate exclusive sinus involvement primary sphenoid sinus involvement is even rare although considered a benign lesion it has potential malignancy rate of 7 to 15% pathogenesis of the lesion remains unclear although allergy chronic sinusitis viral infections are suggested possible causes So we had a case of 40 year male who presented to our department with bilateral nasal obstruction and hyposmia for 6 months there was history of nasal discharge which is mucoid in nature non foul smelling non blood stain and there is also history of hyponasal speech and headache there was no history of visual abnormalities watering from eyes and no ear throat complaints on anterior rhinoscopy septum was deviated to right side floor and lateral wall showed pink mass with irregular surface covered with discharge seen in both right and left nasal cavities extending anteriorly up to the anterior part of middle turbinate on probing it is insensitive to touch soft in consistency and was and uh, was able to pass probe all around except superiorly posterior rhinoscopy was normal paranasal sinus examination no tenderness solicited diagnostic nasal endoscopy showed uh, polypoidal mass in both left and right nasal cavity reaching up to the anterior end of the middle turbinate differential diagnosis are anthraquinal polyps nasal cavity squamous polyp fibrous dysplasia gigantic cells granuloma and other neoplasias ct pns showed opacities in bilateral nasal cavities and sphenoid sinus with absent tinted sphenoidal septum so we managed this case by endoscopic resection of the polyp first uh, a bit of tissue was taken and sent for uh, histopathological examination then the polypoidal mass was debrided and uh, we reached up to sphenoid sinus ostium the polypoidal mass was uh, resected uh, which was present uh, in the sphenoid sinus then posterior septotomy was done and then the polypoidal mass which was present in the other part of the sphenoid sinus was removed intact in toto this is the post operative diagnostic nasal endoscopy at 1 month after uh, resection post operative uh, diagnostic nasal endoscopy after 6 months 
histopathological examination shows a thickened squamous epithelium proliferating in downwards into the underlying connective tissue stroma to form large clefts and ribbons. Discussion for isolated inverted papilloma localized to sphenoid sinus. Clinical features are often insidious and subtle with symptoms like headache and visual abnormalities. Inverted papilloma tends to be locally aggressive with a 70% showing evidence of bony erosion on CT scan. With close proximity to pituitary gland, internal carotid artery, cavernous sinus, cranial nerves 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, it is important to recognize the clinical features of inverted papilloma early and to prevent serious complications. On CT scan, it is also difficult to separate uh, this uh, inverted papilloma from other pathologies which cause same soft tissue opacification like chronic sinusitis. For many years, medial maxillectomy and end block tumor excision through lateral rhinotomy and mid-facial degloving approach was considered gold standard. But in the recent decade, the less invasive transnasal endoscopic approach has largely replaced the former. Conclusion, in our case, inverted papilloma started in one part of one side sphenoid, eroded the intersphenoidal septum, reached the opposite uh, part of sphenoid and presented as bilateral nasal polyposis. And uh, our patient underwent endoscopic resection without any intraoperative and postoperative complications and was discharged after a day. These are my references, sir. Thank you. Uh, this looks like uh, spread from one sphenoid to the spread. Yes, sir. So suppose, uh, what is the consequence of it spreading uh, posteriorly? It can involve uh, pituitary gland and other cranial nerve, sir. Uh, what else? What are the other structures that can be involved? Other than the pituitary and... Uh, Internal carotid artery, sir. Carotids. Okay. Can you give uh, some of the names for this? Other names? Nadarian tumor, Ringert's tumor. What is the peculiarity of this tumor? It is. It has irregular surface. It has uh, poten uh, potential for uh, invasion, sir. Okay, that is one. Anything else? Current, sir. Okay, anything else apart from that? Malignant okay. transformation, sir. Right, right. Okay. That's that's the answer which I was expecting. Uh, one question I want to ask her. She yes. is, uh, in her case, they use the micro debrader in the spinite sinus actually. Yes, sir. Can you use the uh, powered instrument in the spinite sinus? Actually, no, sir. Why you should not use? Because uh, we can, there is high risk of damaging uh, carotid artery and other important structures there, sir. Ah. And uh, see, in your case, when they have excised the inverted papilloma, yes. you have left all the mucosa attached to the place where it was arising from. You have to remove the mucosa also. You have to remove, sir. But you are not removed in this case. Huh? Sir. Okay, next one. Next number 30. Hello, 30? Sir, am I audible, sir? Uh, please share the screen uh, without wasting time. Okay. Good morning, sir. Today, my topic... Uh, sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. So, today, my topic for discussion is inverted papilloma, a case report. Uh, 
Introduction coming to the introduction inverted papilloma is a benign epithelial growth originating from the olfactory mucosa and extending into the underlying stoma of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. The tumor is well known for its invasiveness, tendency to recur and association with malignancy. It is a rare benign tumor with incident rate of 0.6 cases per 1 lakh people per year. So, uh, coming to the case report, a 63-year-old female patient came to our outpatient department with complaints of bilateral nasal obstruction since two months. Uh, coming to history of present illness, patient was apparently asymptomatic two months back, after which she developed a bilateral nasal obstruction, which was associated with mucopurulent nasal discharge. Uh, there are history of three episodes of nasal bleeding and history of loss of smell. Uh, coming to the past history, history of uh, complaints of nasal obstruction alone without bleeding reading three years back for which she took medication and uh, past history uh, not a known case of diabetes mellitus and hypertension and tuberculosis family history it is not significant coming to general examination uh, patient is conscious coherent and cooperative and vitals are normal examinations of our nose and paranasal sinuses are normal and bilateral ears are normal coming to local examination uh, external framework is normal anterior on anterior rhinoscopy the nasal septum is deviated towards left and uh, uh, a solitary pinkish red irregular mass with characteristic appearance of raspberry is seen occupying the entire right nasal cavity. Uh, so on uh, um, probing, it was firm, sensitive and uh, bleeds on touch. On diagnostic nasal endoscopy, mass was seen to be arising from the middle turbinate. So uh, coming to management, we uh, we took the uh, CT of the paranasal sinuses. It described ill-defined heterogeneously enhancing soft tissue mass uh, present present arising from the middle meatus occupying the right nasal cavity. There was also widening of osteomeatal complex in the right side and mass was found to be extending into the right maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses. So, by the CT uh, imaging, we have come into differential diagnosis apart from the inverted papilloma. We, we took uh, other diagnoses like sinonasal inflammatory polyps and non-keratinizing respiratory carcinoma and verrucous carcinoma. So, for the confirmation, we have uh, given a uh, biopsy on histopathology. Pestological examination, we have found a re, uh, revealed strips of tissue lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Epithelium showed inward proliferation of epithelial cells and stromal cells showed mixed inflammatory infiltrates. So these features were consistent with inverted papilloma. Uh, so these are the reports and the images. Uh, so coming to treatment, we have done an endoscopic endonasal excision of inverted papilloma. Also for the deviated nasal septum, we have done septoplasty, uncinectomy and middle meatus antrostomy and anterior ethmoidectomy on right side was performed. After, as since it has higher chances of recurrences, after surgery, she was asked to follow for a period of six months, which was uneventful and there was no evidence of recurrence. So coming to discussion, inverted papilloma is a rare tumor comprising of 0.5 to 4% of nasal tumors. Etiology of inverted papilloma is undefined. The possible etiologies are maybe inflammatory origin or chronic infectious rhinosinusitis, allergies or Epstein-Barr virus and human papilloma papilloma virus. Complete surgical excision including the adjacent uninvolved mucosa is a treatment of choice in order to avoid the recurrence. External or combined external and endoscope or fully endoscopic approach can be done. Medial maxillectomy remains the treatment of choice for lesions involving the significant areas of medial maxillary wall. Uh, the reason why I choose this uh, case is that inverted papilloma is uh, generally we can see in females. Uh, so, uh, in males, so in here, I came across a female patient. Uh, so, I chose this topic. Inverted papilloma, uh, the general male is to female ratio is 4, 4, 4 to 7 is to 1. Uh, one can suspect inverted papilloma if mass in nasal cavity seems to be arising from the nas lateral nasal wall with involvement of at least one paranasal sinuses. Even though it is a benign lesion due to its aggressive behavior and tendency to recur, the diagnosis and surgical treatment must be carefully planned. Only then it is possible to offer a better quality of life to the patient. Uh, these are my references, sir. Uh, and I conclude. Thank you, sir. There was the tumor attached, actually. Sir, me uh, middle meatus, sir. It was attached to the middle meatus in the... Then the uh, scan was showing the opacity in the uh, maxillary sinus also. 
maxillary sinus was filled with tumor or secretions maxillary sinus was uh, filled with uh, tumor also sir then the origin is in middle meatus or maxillary sinus origin is middle meatus only sir middle meatus sir. so it is it was not attached to any of the walls in the maxillary sinus no no sir it was not attached it was just present in the maxillary sinus yes sir yes sir. Okay. You have not shown an interop uh, video actually. Ah, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, next 31. Please stop the share and then 31. Okay, sir. Yes, start your presentation. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Sir, uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. I am presenting a rare case of uh, primary nasal septal carcinoma with uh, frontal and ethmoidal sinus extension. Tumors of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses make up less than 3% of head and neck cancer. Malignancy of nasal septum are very rare. Only 9% of sinonasal malignancies are primary nasal septum malignancies. The factors are smoking, tobacco, occupational exposure to wood dust, petroleum products, chrome industry, leather industry, textile industry. Squamous cell carcinoma is most common. Sir. Six to seven decades is the incident and males to female ratios two is to one. Uh, the nasal septum consists of quadrangular cartilage, vomer, and perpendicular plate of ethmoid. Tumors in this area oh, can be so posteriorly into the, the external nasal structure oh, and inferiorly to upper lip. Uh, patients with SEC of nasal septum may delay um, medical care due to unsuspecting symptoms like nasal obstruction, nasal mass, and pain. 50% with orbital symptoms, or only 10% cases with gastric nodes are involved. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. There is some background uh, noise. also is speaking sir. along with you. Ask uh, them to unmute everyone Muted, except sir, you. Hello. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, please continue. Sir, uh, the different histology of the malignant sinonasal neoplasms are epithelial, which includes squamous cell carcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, neuroectodermal can be malignant melanoma, neuroblastoma, mesial canal can be fibrosarcoma, liposarcoma, vascular can be angiosarcoma, uh, muscular cartilaginous osseous can be leomyosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, lymphoreticular can be lymphomas, and also metastasis. In my case, uh, she's a 60 year female. So she came with chief complaints of bilateral nasal bleeding since two years, bilateral nasal obstruction since six months. Okay. Of persistent illness. Uh, she was apparently asymptomatic two years back. <clears throat> then she developed nasal bleeding from both nasal cavities, which, which was sudden, unprovoked, profuse. Uh, One episode per week, which was released spontaneously. Excuse Last me. episode was two months back. Bilateral nasal obstruction since six months, in three days in August. Uh, pro gradually progressive, continuous, no aggravating or relieving factor, with decreased perception of smell, and there was also facial fullness. There was history of uh, snoring and mouth breathing, uh, also generalized headache, no history of sneezing, watering of eyes, itching, post nasal discharge, no other ear or throat complaints, no history of trauma, weight loss, or fever. Past history, uh, she was a known case of diabetes since two years on uh, metformin and glimepramide. Known case of hypertension since two years on amlodipine and telmazartan. Uh, she has underwent um, CABG two years back and sh uh, she was on tropidogrel 75 mg only. Uh, uh, there are no addictions and she has uh, attained menopause 20 years back. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was moderately built and nourished. <clears throat> uh, vitals are stable. Uh, other uh, CDS, respiratory system, and uh, central nervous system, uh, no abnormality detected. <laughs> there was parallel presence, local examination. Uh, broadening of the dorsum of nose is seen with increased intercanthal distance. On uh, anterior rhinoscopy, there is a bilateral, uh, uh, in the bilateral nasal cavities, uh, a pink fleshy mass seen on either side of the septum, which was forming consistency, pale, non tender, not bleeding on touch. Uh, probe couldn't pass all over. Medially, bilateral lateral walls were normal. 
uh, <clears throat> cotton sales uh, bilateral uh, there was no improvement on cotton wool test uh, bilateral decreased movement on spatula test uh, bilateral fogging was decreased posterior rhinoscopy bilateral coana were normal ear uh, oral cavity oropharynx examination is, was normal neck uh, no palpable limb uh, lymph nodes uh, on uh, on, on diagnostic uh, nasal endoscopy uh, on either side of the uh, septum uh, there was um, a pink uh, friable mass uh, uh, which was non tender and on the uh, third part uh, there was some mass extending into the frontal pieces and uh, even on the second part in the posterior ethmoidal area uh, there was another mass so uh, there were three masses uh, actually so we have uh, sent for a uh, biopsy sir biopsy of uh, two tissues from the septal tissue and also the frontal tissue both came out to be squamous cell carcinoma <clears throat> cct pns was done sir uh, which uh, reported as opacification of right frontal sinus with suspicious soft tissue within it and uh, which was extending up to root of the nose anterior part of nasal septum mri head and neck also was done uh, which reported as irregular altered si signal intense mass uh, lesion i Incidents on T1 uh, weighted noted in the midline involving the uh, nasal septum and eroding it uh, uh, externally um, extending cranially to involve the uh, cribriform plate and a right ethmoidal and also right frontal sinuses. Bilateral 1B and 2 uh, cervical lymph nodes were positive, maximum uh, 10 mm. <clears throat> so, TNM staging uh, it was clinically T4A and N2C with no meds. Uh, uh, we have uh, performed lateral rhinotomy to, ex to excise the nasal septum tumor mass under general anesthesia. Uh, the uh, uh, tumor was uh, removed uh, uh, through and through and through the septum. Total excision was done without preserving the opposite mucopericonium and nasal mucosa. Uh, in, uh, in, the in, in the posterior superior, it was seen that tribriform plate was dissected. Tumor was scraped off from the right frontal and bilateral intermoid sinuses. Right supraclavicular full thickness uh, uh, skin graft uh, was taken for uh, repairment. Pathology uh, did not reveal any of pre uh, superior matches, so post op uh, radiotherapy was uh, recommended. Uh, so, nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses are uncommon lesions for um, malignant lesions. Most common is squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, diagnosis becomes delayed. Uh, <coughs> tissue biopsy is the most straightforward uh, way for diagnosis. Sir. Uh, the overall five-year uh, survival rate is 75% for squamous cell carcinoma, whereas 40% for non-squamous tumors. Flaps of the cheek, uh, nasal, uh, nasal level surface, and forehead graft can be uh, taken. Sir. Uh, if uh, if the mucosal and cartilage tissue defects are uh, uh, more, full thickness uh, skin graft can be used. These are my re references. Sir. Thank you. How did you establish that the tumor arose from the septum? Uh, CT, it was uh, arising, sir. Arising from the nasal septum, and even in, in, in the anterior rhinoscopy, uh, it was fixed to the nasal septum, the, the mass. But you said that there was involvement of the ethmoids and uh, uh, bilateral involvement with the tumor mass coming out on the left nasal cavity, also, no? Nasal cavity, sir. In the uh, second part and the third part, we have seen um, uh, tissue, sir. So that's why we have sent to biopsy. Um, yeah, what was the surgical approach used? A lateral anatomy procedure, sir. Lateral anatomy. Yes, sir. More. Uh, you think this could have been tackled endoscopically? Uh, but the uh, nasal septum um, uh, approach uh, would be. Uh, decreased like the um, access would be decreased i felt anything was done for the uh, neck nodes uh, radiotherapy was recommended sir there's no neck dissection mm. neck dissection no? was not done sir no sir not done. it was n2 no it was n2 yes sir n2 okay n2 Yeah, please. Go ahead, 32. Uh, 
Hello, am I audible, sir? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, uh, respected professors. Uh, today, I'm going to present a case of uh, internal laryngoceal in a uh, So my aim is to present a case of internal laryngeal seal in adult with no etiological factors. Coming to the introduction, laryngeal seal is an abnormal cystic dilatation of saccule of the larynx, which is also known as a laryngeal appendix. The incidence being one per 2.5 million population per year. It is most commonly seen in males and old female patient resident to our OPD with the complaints of change in voice and difficulty in swallowing since 20 days. She is a homemaker by occupation. The difficulty in swallowing is more to the solids than liquids. There is no history of any external neck swelling. There is no history of vocal abuse. No history of any constitutional symptoms were present. Coming to the clinical examination, on video laryngoscopy, on video laryngoscopy, a single 4 by 4 smooth surface pale swelling was seen involving the left very epiglottic fold, obscuring the view of the left is true cord as well as a false cord. As you can see in the video, the light vocal cord it was mobile and there was adequate glottic space. The right vocal cord was uh, uh, totally seen and it was mobile as well, but the left vocal cord and the true, false and true was not visible. Coming to the investigation, a plain CT neck was advised in sagittal and coronal section. As you can see in the sagittal section, uh, showed a well-defined rounded hypotense cystic lesion of about 32 by 32 into by 34 mm noted in the left para midline location closely associated with larynx causing the compression of the compression and deviation of larynx to the right side and at the same you can see at the coronal section and there was not pedunculated coming to the surgical procedure marsupialization of cyst was done under general anesthesia using debridement after stripping of the cyst wall. As you can see in this image, the stripping of the cyst wall was done. This is the original picture which was seen intraoperatively. After doing the stripping of the cyst wall, it was uh, by the micro debrider, it was excised in total. Cyst wall was then sent for histopathological examination and fluid from the cyst was sent for culture sensitivity. In HP, the sw uh, swelling line by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium with dense neutrophilic infiltrates were seen. Culture sensitivity report came as negative for any bacterial growth. In this, uh, in this slide, you can see the preoperative uh, video laryngoscopy image, which is occupying the left area epiglottic fold. This is the photo post operatively after three weeks. The cyst wall was still present, obscuring the woo. But after six months of post operative uh, status, the both the bilateral cords were visible and they were mobile, and there was no recurrence as such. Coming to the discussion, a laryngoscopy is an abnormal cystic dilatation of the saccule of the larynx. In this image, we can see there is a normal saccule of the larynx, and this is the abnormal dilatation of the saccule of the larynx. The saccule is a small mucosal pouch which lies between the vestibular floor and of the larynx and the inner surface of the thyroid cartilage, and it contains the mucinous glands. Hence, it gets filled sometimes. Coming to the types of the uh, laryngoceal there is internal external and mixed internal means it is confined only to the para laryngeal spaces whereas external the saccule herniates to the thyroid uh, membrane and comes uh, uh, comes and presents as the external neck swelling as whereas in mixed one there is dilated internal as well as the external component mostly unilateral containing either air or mucus if it gets infected we call it as la laryngopyosil it occurs only in eight percent of the cases and most common organism being staph aureus the etiology is usually unknown. The origin can be congenital as in neonates or acquired as in adults. It is mostly present in fifth to sixth decade of life due to increased intranumeral uh, pressure such as chronic cough, straining, blowing into musical instruments, glass blowing and laryngeal carcinoma. The treatment modalities include external as well as endoscopic approaches. Endoscopic approaches we can do uh, resection and we can use CO2 laser uh, is widely used for multiplication. The advantage of CO2 laser is there is less bleeding and less uh, less up, uh, recurrence rate. Coming to the conclusion, the internal laryngeal seal is a rare benign tumor of the laryngeal ventricle, rarely occurring in female with no risk factors. Radiological studies are essential for diagnosis and appropriate management. Endoscopic CO2 laser approach is the most reliable method for resection with excellent outcomes. In this patient, stripping of the capsule with marsupialization using debrider was done with no recurrence after six months of follow-up. Combined type is treated with V-shaped lateral thyrotomy approach. The total resection is required as there is minimum potential for malignant transfer. It can transform yeah. into squamous cell carcinoma with yeah. an incidence of 29%. Yeah.
రేపొస్తాండి ఈ రోజు దీస్ ఆర్ మై రిఫరెన్సెస్ థాంక్యూ సర్ yes sir yeah this patient was operated by endoscopic approach now how the anesthesia was given sir anesthesia with the tube only it was given the endotracheal intubation was done sir because there was enough uh, glottic space present sir so you have uh, done suspension laryngoscopy and you excised this is it yes sir yes sir suspension laryngoscopy you did yes sir with the clean source and laryngoscopy visualize sir ah yes sir Okay. then we use uh, we have visualized then we have used the microscope sir under the vision of the microscope we have uh, uh, stripped the membrane and not the endoscope you use the microscope yes sir okay what lens was used using the sir what lens was used lens 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 sir i don't know. for microscope uh, For the laryngeal surgery, what lens is used? I don't know. Oh, okay. Next. So next thirty-three. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. నెక్స్ట్ నెంబర్ థర్టీ త్రీ ఇట్ ఈస్ స్టార్ట్ ప్లీజ్ గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ సార్ ఆమ్ ఐ ఆడిబుల్ ఎస్ గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ సార్ ప్లీజ్ స్టార్ట్ ఎస్ సార్ Uh, good afternoon sir uh, my name is dr meghana nandipati and i'm uh, here to present a rare case of pediatric primary tracheal schwannoma my aim is to present a rare case of pediatric primary tracheal schwannoma uh, primary tracheal neurogenic tumors include mainly the benign peripheral nerve sheath tumors which are the neurofibroma and schwannoma schwannoma of the trachea arises primarily from the intramural neurogenous tissue and to be more precise from the schwann cells of nerve sheath Uh, incidence it is a very rare tumor the primary tracheal tumors are only 1% of all head and neck neoplasms and only a quarter of them are benign and of those the tracheal schwannoma is an even more rarer entity the most common site of this lesion is the distal one third of trachea followed by the proximal one third and followed by the middle one third of the trachea clinical presentations uh, patient patients present with non specific symptoms uh, which uh, which include obstructive symptoms like cough vis hemoptysis uh, others uh, and which lead us to misdiagnosis and confusion with uh, copd or bronchial asthma uh, here is a 10 year old female who presented to the opd with complaints of shortness of breath especially during swallowing cough and exertional dyspnea for 3 months uh, gradually progressive in nature and it was not relieved with any medications there was no significant birth history or family history there was no history of any constitutional symptoms on clinical examination the child is active and alert bilateral chest contractions were present and on auscultation there was reduced air entry on both sides over all six regions of the lung spo2 on room air was 92% uh, contrast enhanced ct of the neck and chest revealed a well defined heterogeneously enhancing soft tissue density lesion uh, which was 22 into 8 into Uh, 8 mm uh, noted in the trachea 18 mm proximal to the carina it was initially thought to be a tracheal papilloma uh, on re diagnostic rigid bronchoscopy a single pinkish pedunculated papillomatous growth was seen which was occupying almost entire lumen of the trachea just above the level of the carina it was attached to the right lateral wall of the trachea uh, 
We have performed the micro laryngotracheo bronchoscopy and tumor excision with the help of cold steel. Uh, under the 5 mm bronchoscopic vision, growth was visualized in the trachea and it was removed in piecemeal using a long bladed forceps. Uh, post removal, laryngeal inlet, trachea, and carina were visualized. Uh, histopathology revealed a cellular tumor with hyper and hypocellular areas, which were Anton A and B patterns, and the cells were benign with formation of Verroque bodies in palisading appearance. It was suggestive of a benign spindle cell neoplasm, which is a Shanuma. Mineral histochemistry revealed a 100 positivity and uh, CD34 cells, a few spindle cells focally, and this gave an impression of a neural origin, probably a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Uh, coming to the discussion, uh, these are extremely rare tumors as discussed, 1% of all neoplasms of head and neck. Kasahara et al. proposed a classification of the pulmonary schwannomas, which include central lesions, which are located in the trachea or the proximal bronchi and can be seen by bronchoscopy. Uh, these again are intraluminal tumors or dumbbell or combined tumors, that is intraluminal and extraluminal extent. And peripheral tumors, which cannot be seen by bronchoscopy, but are seen on chest X-ray or CT as a nodule. Our case appears to be a central intraluminal tumor. A delay in diagnosis due to rarity of the disease and its non-specific symptoms which resemble obstructive disease, there can be a delay in diagnosis up to 17 months from the initial onset of symptoms. Associations and malignant transformation. Von Recklinghausen's disease uh, is seen associated in neurofibromas, uh, but in schwannomas it is very rare uh, and very low risk of malignant transformation is seen for these schwannomas. Characteristic histological findings include Anton A and B patterns uh, and S100 positivity in immunohistochemistry. Definitive diagnosis can only be by tracheobronchoscopy with tissue biopsy. My differentials are papilloma, laryngotracheal chondroma, tracheal lipoblastoma, neurofibroma, hematoma, hemangioma, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma and others. Other treatment modalities include primary tracheal resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis, endoscopic treatment including laser, electrocautery, snaring, and microdebridement. Recurrence and follow-up. These are relatively slow-growing tumors, and only one reported case of uh, recurrence was seen that to 12 years after initial endoscopic excision. So my take-home message from this case report is that these primary endotracheal neurogenic tumors are extremely rare, but we should consider them in the differential diagnosis of persistent upper airway symptoms, which are not relieved with conventional therapy. To avoid recurrence, it is preferable to offer a tracheal resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis to low-risk patients with sessile tumors or with skill extension. However, pedunculated lesions without any extratracheal extension or patients with high surgical risk, endoscopic resection offers an excellent choice. These are my references. Thank you, sir. So th this was uh, done uh, with the help of a rigid endoscope excision? Yes, sir. With the help of a rigid, rigid bronchoscope, sir. Rigid bronchoscope. Yes, yeah, sir. that's what uh, is the interesting. It was uh, done in uh, multiple uh, this thing, uh, withdrawals, means you introduce the bronchoscope, yes, take sir. it out and then reinsert. Yes, sir. So it was taken out multiple times, sir. Multiple times. Yes, sir. Uh, you didn't uh, encounter any bleeding? No, sir, the, uh, we, we actually expected much bleeding, sir, but intraoperatively there is very little, little bleeding and which was well controlled with adrenaline packs, sir. So you, you had packing there in that area? Yes, just about the carina. Still in gauze there, and uh, with the help of a thread a tie, and we just kept left it for one minute, and then the bleeding has completely subsided, sir. What sort of ventilation was used? Jet ventilation was used, sir, with the bronchoscope. Post op, what was the condition of the child? Post op, the patient has recovered well, sir. She was immediately relieved of all the symptoms by post op day one itself, and uh, she was uh, attending her school and doing all her daily activities normally. Oh. And you can uh, uh, you. move on. You can leave the meeting. Yes, thank you. Sir. Yeah, next, please. Good afternoon, sir. Are you able to hear yes. me? Am I visible and audible? Yes. yes, yes, please go ahead.
un segundo. Is my screen visible? Yeah, please go Sorry, ahead. Screen visible? Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. We are waiting for you. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, everyone, respected judges, and my dear friends. This is Dr. Huda Muzaffar Hussain, and my topic for today's presentation is Simonism Carcinoma Secret Ingredient, the Human Papilloma Virus Puzzle. A 30-year-old male patient, a painter by occupation, presented to our department with the chief complaints of bilateral nasal obstruction since seven months, bleeding from the right nasal cavity since six months, protrusion of the right eye since six months, loss of vision from the left eye since two months. Nasal obstruction was insidious in onset, initially on the right side, progressed to the left side, complete blockage on the right side, partial on the left side, with no diurnal or positional variation. Bleeding on the right side was sudden in onset, intermittent, profuse, relief spontaneously. Protrusion of the right eye was insidious in onset, gradually progressive, dull aching pain, constant in nature, watering and itching was present. Loss of vision from the left eye was insidious in onset, gradually progressed to almost complete loss of vision. There is decreased male perception for the past six months, there is history of voice change since six months, right side and headaches since six months, decreased hearing from the right side, right ear since two months, and history of double vision since two months. No associated comorbidities and no surgeries in the past. Personal history suggestive of decreased appetite, loss of 10 kilograms weight in the last seven months. Sleep is disturbed. Family history is positive for TB in mother and elder brother. Coming to ENT examination, there is mucoid discharge in the vestibule and external nerves on the right side, while the left side is normal. On anterior rhinoscopy, the certain is deviated to the left side, single irregular mass covered with discharge extending onto the right nasal vestibule. Posterior rhinoscopy shows single irregular mass in the right corner, obscuring the eustachian tube opening, and the left side appears to be normal, eustachian tube opening is normal. There is no sinus tenderness present. Functional tests show that there is absent sensation of smell. Post spatula test shows this, uh, absent misting on the right side, and cotton wool test shows no movement of fibers on the right side, while it is normal on the left side. Ear examination shows grade 2 pulse inside attraction on the right side, left ear is normal. Rinis is negative on the right side and Weber lateralized to the right ear. Orophyne shows post nasal discharge. On eye examination, there is right abaxial proptosis and visual acuity is 6 by 12 on the right side. While on the left side, the only significant finding is negative perception of light. The facial asymmetry is intact. Sensations over the face are intact. My differentials included angiofibroma, invasive fungal sinusitis, and sinonasal malignancy. Routine blood investigations were done which showed that there was 9 uh, gram per deciliter uh, hemoglobin. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy revealed a pinkish ulceroproliferative growth in the right nasal cavity, pushing the septum to the left, which were taken from the growth and sent for histopathological examination. PTA revealed mild bilateral conductive hearing loss. The CTPNS showed heterogeneous lesion with irregular multilobulated and extensile appearance involving the nasal cavity, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary sinuses with erosions and orbital involvement with intracranial extension. The MRI PNS with contrast was quite confusing as it revealed a benign chondromyxoid bone tumor. In order to confirm a diagnosis, these are the pictures of the MRI PNS with contrast. In order to confirm a diagnosis, a histopathological examination of the bits was done and it revealed HPV related multiphenotypic sinonasal uh, carcinoma with adenoid cystic carcinoma like features. And our clinical staging was T4B M0 M0. As the patient denied surgical debulking, radiotherapy was done. Uh, up to 20 cycles were given. And during the follow-up, the patient showed that the proptosis was uh, resolved to a good extent on the right side. Until now, there is no complaint of epistaxis, nasal obstruction. Left eye vision did not improve, and the right eye vision is maintained at 6 by 12. No other complaints which are suggestive of metastasis. Coming to the discussion, human papilloma virus is a well-established positive agent in approximately 20 to 25% of the Hellenic carcinomas overall. Most common side includes oropharynx followed by sinonasal tract. Most common tumor is a non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, followed by solid adenoid cystic carcinoma resembling tumor. This carcinoma exhibits features of both a surface-derived and salivary gland carcinoma. The most common type of HPV associated is 33, others include 35 and 56. Based on its more expansive histologic features, including the lines of myoepithelial ductal and squamous differentiation, the term human papilloma virus-related multiphenotypic sinonasal carcinoma was suggested in place of the existing name HPV-related carcinoma with adenoid cystic-like features. The treatment options include mainly surgical debulking, followed by uh, plus or minus chemoradiotherapy. In conclusion, this is a rare distinct head and neck carcinoma 
with human papilloma virus relation with only 60 cases reported so far. Being a recent, unique, and rare entity, its etiopathogenesis requires more study. It presents at advanced stage in close to more than half of the cases. Has high-grade histologic appearance, paradoxically exhibits a relatively indolent manner with frequent local recurrences. As a result, it is important to diagnose this entity correctly and communicate the significance of the diagnosis to treating clinicians. Literature reports only two cases of metastasis to lungs and fingers. Prompt histopathological diagnosis is important to prevent metastasis and death. So that outcome is favorable. These are my references. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Go for the next uh, presentation, please. Good morning, sir. Sir, am I audible, sir? Fine. Ah, yes, sir. 35, sir. Madhu Mehta. Am I audible, sir? Sir, I'm sharing my screen, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, the topic of my uh, case report is complete right second branchial large fistula, sir. Anomalies of development of brachial cleft can result in four distinct but related uh, lesions, namely cysts, external sinuses, internal sinuses, complete fistulas. Branchial fistula are formed due to abnormal persistence of embryonic branchial clefts. Even though they account for 20% of head and neck swellings in children, uh, most of the uh, anomalies are, uh, fall within second brachial cleft, sir. And uh, of which second branchial large fistula from internal and external opening are extremely rare. Here I'm presenting a case of 14 year old male complaining of water discharge from the opening on the right side of the neck on and off from the age of six years. There is history of recurrent episodes of swelling at the site of this opening associated with fever. On uh, examination, a single pin has sized opening at the junction of middle and lower third of stenocleidomastoid muscle along its anterior border was noted. Watery discharge could be appreciated, trickling from the opening when the boy was asked to drink water. Thus, a clinical diagnosis of right brachial fistula was made. We proceeded with investigations like uh, routine blood investigations and also specific investigations like fistulogram, which revealed internal opening into the lateral oropharynx, most probably the uh, tonsillar fossa on the right, confirming the diagnosis of complete right second branchial large fistula. Phanicoscopy in this case was novel. The patient was then planned for surgical excision of the fistula under general anesthesia. Intraoperatively, methylene dye blue, uh, blue dye was injected and fistula tract was traced. Internal opening was identified on the posterior pillar on the right tonsillar fossa uh, and a catheter was passed along the tract to guide the resection. On the right, the image shows a uh, catheter uh, coming out of the internal opening on the right uh, <coughs> tonsillar fossa from the anterior surface of the posterior pillar. A transcervical approach was uh, uh, opted and a leptic incision was given encircling the external opening and uh, the fistulous tract was skeletonized and dissected upwards in sublatismal plane. Then a second incision higher up in the neck was taken and the fistulous tract was delivered from the second incision and was further dissected until the internal opening and it was ligated and dissected. Then the uh, wound was closed in two layers with vicryl and uh, silk respectively. On follow-up, the patient was called for review for suture removal on day seven and was followed up at 15th day and one month uh, respectively, and was looked for signs of recurrent discharge, pain, and swelling at the site of the lesion, and for no such signs. According to Cheno et al., 15% of cases presented in uh, childhood less than 10 years of age was majority between the age of 10 to 40 years of age. It is most prevalent in females and uh, occurs on the right side. Fistulogram is not always conclusive. Intraoperatively, methylene dye injection thus uh, has to be given to trace the tract entirely, and act, it acts as a guide for dissection. Surgical ex excision of the tract in complete extent is a treatment of choice. Recurrence rate after surgical excision falls between 3 to 22 percent, and the recurrence has been ascribed to preoperative infection, also intraoperative incomplete excision of the tract. Some authors also recommend excision of the fistless tract along with ipsilateral tonsillectomy. Uniform surgical technique for second branchial cleft fistula excision, uh, taking hyoid as a landmark, uh, can prevent ipsilateral tonsillectomy, also uh, lower the recurrence rates. Why this case? Uh, because even though second branchial cleft involvement is common, complete fistula with the external internal opening is rare. 
simplest technique among other ways is simplest and gives best outcome and also uniform surgical technique based on embryological principles helps in effective management reducing the need for revision surgery and also tonsillectomy these are my references thank you this section was done up to the tonsillar fossa is it yes sir and it was ligated there yes sir yes sir internal opening was identified it was ligated and uh, then cut sir you did not uh, think of doing a tonsillectomy there and then you know close the fibers uh, inside with sutures uh no sir because uh, when we passed the probe it was clearly opening on the posterior pillar sir on the anterior surface of posterior pillar and need of tonsillectomy was not needed sir but uh, your picture shows a big tonsil no you would have got a better uh, space and uh, clearance for that um actually when uh, we uh, dissected the uh, fistula and extracted it out outwards sir the whole internal uh -huh. staining up to the internal opening was uh, evident sir and we ligated it there and uh, so okay. I uh, how long now since follow up sir it's been 45 days sir and uh, we followed the patient only until one month okay any uh, uh, sign of recurrence no sir there was no pain no discharge or no swelling at the site of uh, lesion sir okay Thank you, sir. Thank you. 36. Uh, JP, sir. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, log out. I have spoken to Dr. Ramesh, and okay. then he has instructed uh, uh, me to see the presentations on the YouTube. So, like what we did now, uh, alternate cases we will uh, take up, and uh, then we will give them the result. I said I will be able to do only up to one o'clock. After that, he said I can log out and access uh, the presentation on the YouTube and give my result. Oh, whatever. Okay. Right, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure being with you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, your number, please. Sir, I am 36, sir. Uh, Good afternoon, sir, uh, and uh, to my ju respected judges and my uh, fellow colleagues, I would like to present a case of an uh, ear pain with discharge. So the, uh, coming to history, a 27-year-old male came to the hospital with complaints of pain in right ear for two months. Uh, there was history of discharge from the right ear for, of one episode two months ago. It, the discharge was scanty, colorless, watery in consistency, blood tinged at times, not found smelling, and it subsided on medication. The patient also complained of repeated episodes of giddiness for two months, which was aggravated on posture change, and it relieved partially on medication. The patient also complained of whistling sound in right ear for two months. There were no specific aggravating or relieving factors. There was no history of previous ear surgery or no significant past history. Um, uh, next year on clinical in invest uh, examination, we found that the patient was alert, conscious, cooperative, vitals were stable. Otoscopic examination revealed a uh, right side tympanic membrane bulge in posterior inferior quadrant. Left side tympanic me membrane was intact and normal. Nose and oral cavity examination yielded no significant findings. There were some small non-tender level 2 lymph nodes on the right side of neck. No nystagmus was elicited and cerebellar function tests were all normal. Facial nerve function was also normal. Uh, based on these findings, we made a provisional diagnosis of uh, chronic otitis media, probably uh, squamous type. Investigations, uh, we went for an otoendoscopy, which showed a pinkish smooth surface polypoidal mass arising from posterior canal wall, which obscured the posterior inferior quadrant on right tympanic membrane. Rest of the tympanic membrane was uh, pinkish in color. Uh, pure tone audiometry was done. Right sided, it was uh, shown to have 68.3 decibel hearing loss, which was of mixed type. Routine blood investigations were normal. This is the pure tone audiometry. Next, coming to imaging, uh, we did a, CT, a high resolution CT scan of the temporal bones, uh, which revealed, as you can see here, it revealed a, a heterogeneous attenuating uh, focal lesion in the right side middle ear cavity, which extended to the mastoid uh, antrum and mastoid air cells. And it, and it is in continuation with the right side jugular foramen also. 
and it also had some bone destructions and erosions which involved the mastoid air cells and the sinus plate. The mastoid segment of the facial canal uh, was dehiscent. The lesion was continuous with right side uh, sigmoid sinus. And they also there was a polypoidal extension into the right uh, ear, uh, right uh, external auditory canal. So based on the CT, uh, the, based on these findings, the CT report uh, features were su uh, suggestive of neoplastic etiology or a glomus jugular or an endolymphatic sac tumor. Uh, we went for a right-sided uh, canal wall down mastoidectomy plus type 1 tympanoplasty under general anesthesia. The lesion was seen uh, to be extending from the mastoid tip up to aditus ad antrum. The infralabyrinthine part of the mass was peeled off from posterior cranial fossa dura up to the petrous apex. The tumor was excised in piecemeal and sent for histopathological examination. These are some of the intraoperative photos. You can see some of the mass here. And this is the uh, status of the middle, uh, the mastoid, photomastoid cavity after the removal of the mass. Here we can see the ossicles, the dome of the horizontal semicircular canal, the posterior semicircular canal, the sigmoid uh, sinus, uh, the dura, as well as the location of the tube, uh, the location from where the tumor was removed. Outcome the patient uh, op uh, post operatively, the patient developed right sided facial nerve palsy, a lower motor neuron type. It was initially House Brackman grade 3 and it progressed to grade 4. No, there were no complaints of dizziness post operatively. Histopathological report uh, showed focal ulcerated uh, stratified squamous epithelium with sub epithelium showing fibrocollagenous tissue and chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates. Dilated elongated congested blood vessels were seen with focal microcalcifications and large areas of hemorrhage. Some of the vessels were lined with plump endothelial cells. There were collection of lymphocytes, histiocytes, and numerous eosinophils, plasma cells, and operational giant cells. These uh, findings were uh, suggestive of epithelioid hemangioma or angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia or chemuras disease. This is a HP uh, slide. As you can see, we, uh, there are some hemorrhagic spots here, the dilated blood vessels, infiltrate microcalcifications. Now, chimuras disease is also known as eosinophilic lymphogranuloma, uh, uh, is a chronic inflammatory disorder. It is described as unusual granulated uh, granulation combined with hyperplastic changes in lymphoid tissue. It is most commonly present as unilateral subcutaneous nodules in head and neck, regional lymphadenopathy, and frequent involvement of salivary glands. Orbit, eyelid, palate, pharynx, axilla, groin, and arm have all be, also been reported to be involved. However, there are no reports of temporal bone being involved in this disease. There may be reports of coexisting renal disease. It usually affects uh, young Asian males with incidence ranging from 10 to 60 percent. It is very rare in Indian population. In conclusion, the patient's in, uh, initial complaints uh, favor professional diagnosis of right side chronic otitis media, squamous type or maybe a cholesteatoma. The radiological investigations uh, indicated towards an endolymphatic sac tumor or a glomus jugular. So uh, while uh, thorough history taking and uh, clinical diagnosis can guide us towards a correct diagnosis, most of the time we should be wary of uncommon diseases presenting with more common symptoms and signs. However, in this case, we neglected to do an FNIC of lymph nodes, which might have given a clue for the preoperative diagnosis. Therefore, there is a need for complete preoperative workup in necessary, uh, that is necessary to know about the nature and extent of the disease. At the same time, the patient must be explained about the disease and all the positive, possible positive and negative outcomes before starting any intervention. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. So one one second. You can stop. Uh, yeah. Yes, go so ahead. good afternoon, sir. Sir. Yeah, please. 
So my name is uh, Harika sir. Today I am going to uh, present a case report on deceptively looking central perforation sir. Introduction, chronic superative otitis media is a chronic inflammation of the middle ear cleft having a permanent perforation in the tympanic membrane with or without discharge. This is usually classified into two main groups, tuber tympanic and aticoandral disease. Chronic superative otitis media with central perforation is usually not associated with major complications such as cholesteatoma or granulation formation. Ossicular chain involvement is found in both mucosal and squamosal type of the disease. It is always wise to rule out any involvement of the mastoid air cells before for planning for tympanoplasty. Case report. A 38-year-old female presented to her OPD with bilateral ear discharge, right ear followed by left ear, which is mucopurulent, non-fault smelling and hard of hearing, right more than left since 6 months. No history of ear pain, tinnitus, vertigo, oral fullness, autophony, facial, uh, facial palsy. No history of ear trauma, no history of nose and throat complaints. Past history not significant, family history and detailed medical history non-contributory to this condition, general examination and vitals are normal. Preoperative otoscopic examination re uh, revealed central perforation in pars tensa and right ear. In left ear, subtotal central perforation is present. Preoperative uh, audiometry test, pure tone audiometry uh, showed a 60 decibel hearing loss in right ear and 40 decibel hearing loss in left ear. CT temporal bone, 1mm cuts, coronal and axial view re uh, revealed a hyponematization and sclerosis of the uh, sclerosis noted in the right and left mastoid air cells with soft tissue opacification in uh, uh, soft tissue opacification of right mastoid air cells. Surgical management, uh, right cortical mastoidectomy under local anesthesia. These are the surgical steps. Sir. Central perforation is seen in the past tense, sir. After opening the uh, mastoid, uh, aditus block is uh, seen, sir. Uh, granulation tissues are absorbed and are removed, uh, and are removed sir. Uh, patency is uh, achieved after removing the granulation tissues, sir. Uh, round window reflex is uh, absent, sir. Uh, remodeling of the uh, incus is uh, done after uh, removing the uh, incus, sir. Remodeled incus is uh, placed over the uh, stapes, sir. Conchal cartilage is placed. Temporalis fascia graft is uh, placed and temp tympanometal uh, flap is repositioned. Post-operative findings after two weeks, uh, neotympanum is achieved in uh, right ear, sir. Post-operative uh, audiometry test, putone audiometry, uh, right ear revealed uh, 31.7 decibel hearing loss, sir, with an improvement of 20, 29 decibel hearing loss in right ear, sir. Discussion, CT imaging is recommended not only for squamosal disease but also for mucosal disease. It is found that 20% of mucosal disease are showing involvement of mastered air cells. CT scan imaging allows a compre comprehensive pre-operative evaluation of the anatomic variations and bone details of the as well as the ossicular chain and soft tissue. Simple closure of the pre, uh, perforation in active mucosal chronic otitis media with surgical removal of the infected mucosa and granulation tissue of the mastoid is fraught with failure to control the disease. Mastoidectomy impacted the clin clinical course in patients by reducing the number of patients requiring future procedures and by decreasing the disease progression. Conclusion, CT scan is of most value when the otologist can be flexible in the surgical technique tailoring it to imaging findings. HRCT can be recommended not only in cases suspected with potential complications but also in cases of mucosal chronic otitis media to know the extent of the disease, varied pneumatization and the presence of anatomical variations which should alert the clinician and guide in surgical approach and treatment plan. Although skillful, aware and alert surgeon remains the key to successful diagnosis and surgical treatment of chronic otitis media, it is always better to take CT scan for every mucosal disease before planning the surgery for the successful outcome of surgical procedure. These are my references, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, see, central perforation, why did you name this as a deceptively looking central perforation? What is the source speciality in this case? So, uh, after, uh, uh, because normally, most commonly, uh, central perforations are uh, mucosal type, sir. But in uh, this, uh, after doing the CT scan, we found out uh, that there is extensive granulation tissues and soft tissue uh, opacification and uh, mastered cells are hazy uh, seen on the CT scans. Say, even if you take for a normal, you know, this one also, there will be some mucosal edema and this one will be there. So, mucosal yes, hypertrophied mucosa occupying the cells is different from granulation. 
Yes, when sir. do you call, what is the difference between hypertrophied edematous mucosa and granulation? Granulation tissue is a fibrous tissue overlying the uh, ostatus, uh, overlying the... Uh... Then how can you call this uh, hypertrophied mucosa of a central uh, pathology, uh, tubotympanic disease with granulation? It is not granulation. Sir, on preoperative uh, evaluation revealed it as a simple central perforation, sir. Because uh, uh, in CT scan, it only showed uh, uh, haziness in the mastered air cell, sir. But uh, uh, intraoperatively, it revealed uh, extensive granulation tissues blocking the additus. Sir. You can name whatever you want. But it's not granulation uh, tissue. It's hypertrophic mucosa. How can you call this as a granulation tissue? Okay, next. No problem. Thank you. Next number is uh, 38. Eh? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please, somebody who is operating can note the time. And if they are exceeding the time, please let us know. Hello? Yes, sir. sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Yeah. This my topic is the angioma of nasal septum. Today's my topic is cavernous hemangioma of nasal septum, a case report. Introduction: Hemangioma are benign vascular tumors. One minute, sir. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Hemangiomas are, benign vascular. <laughs> Hemangiomas are benign vascular tumors composed of newly formed vessels with endothelial lining. Uh, they are rare in the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. Originate in the skin, mucosa, and deep structures such as bones, muscles, and glands. The most common sites for nasal hemangiomas are nasal septum, lateral wall, and the vestibule. Um, although they are very benign, they are rare and benign. Uh, hemangiomas often infiltrate adjacent structures and recur after surgery. Uh, case report. Case report of a 17-year-old male patient come to our ENT outpatient department with chief complaint of recurrent history of bleeding, bleeding from nose since three months, history of present illness. Uh, the patient was ap apparently asymptomatic three months back. Then he developed bleeding from nose. During this three months, there is a history of six episodes of profuse bleeding from right nasal cavity, which is resolved after applying pressure. There was a history of right nasal obstruction present. No history of nasal discharge, headache, and throat pain and hematemesis was there. Mm. Coming to history of past illness, there was a history of dengue fever three months ago, which presented with bleeding from nose treated by admission in our hospital and treated by one unit of platelet transfusion. Uh, there was no history of bleeding from nose in the past before these three months and uh, no history of any surgery and no history of any major illness in the past. Coming to general examination, patient is conscious, coherent and cooperative. There was no signs of pallor, ictus, sinusis, chylonychia, and uh, lymphadenopathy and uh, edema. Vitals was normal. An ENT examination on anterior rhinoscopy, there was bosselated reddish soft purple mass was seen in the right nasal cavity on probing it was insensitive and bleeding on touch on diagnostic nasal endoscopy there was reddish purple mass was seen in the anterior part of right, right nasal cavity just behind the vestibule which is obs obscuring the inferior turbinate and uh, it is arising from the nasal septum coming to co contrast enhanced uh, ctpns which revealed a small area of arterial blush seen in the anterior superior aspect of right nasal cavity in the arterial phase and it shows progressive enhancement in the venous phase. Uh, it is uh, isodense on plane study. There was no erosions of adjacent bone and no soft tissue invasion was there. In treatment, we did a complete excision of mass which was done by transnasal endoscop endoscopic approach under general anesthesia uh, by using a bipolar cautery which was applied at the site of bleeding. A 5 mm margin of normal mucosa around the mass was excised along with it and sent for histopathological examination. 
in histopathological examination this is microscopically uh, it was a well circumscribed tumor composed of dilated vascular spaces lined by bland endothelial cells and the stroma was edematous with large areas of hemorrhage there was no evidence of malignancy so yeah, that uh, histological picture was suggestive of cavernous hemangioma uh, after the after this uh, reg regular follow ups were done at uh, 15 days interval 15 days interval and the patient had no history of bleeding from nose and no mass was seen at 6 months follow up visit the patient uh, did not have any more any more episodes of epistaxis and the site of excision of the hemangioma was healthy in discussion hemangiomas are common lesions of head and neck in the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses they are rare depending on the dominant vessel size my, at microscopy there are three types capillary cavernous and mixed cavernous hemangioma composed of large endothelium lined vascular spaces in conclusion hemangioma of the nasal cavity composes less than 20 percent of all benign nasal cavity tumors when a bleeding mass is seen in the nasal cavity the possibility of hemangioma must be remembered these are my references, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can this be called as a bleeding polypus of the septum? Uh, it is a differential diagnosis, sir, for bleeding polyposis, vascular polyps. What is the difference between bleeding polypus of the septum and the, your case? Polyps the same, with, no? uh, have you heard of this terminology bleeding polypus of the septum any time? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Next. 39. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. I'm sharing my window. Good afternoon, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, today, my case report is on recurrent flap necrosis causing cochlear implant extrusion. My aim of the study is to stress the importance of early intervention and role of vascularized flap to salvage an exposed implant. Cochlear implantation is a life-changing procedure for a hearing impaired person. Post-cochlear implantation, there are major and minor complications. Of the major complications, the most common cause for revision surgery was device failure followed by flap issues. Incidence of major skin flap complications in literature range from 1.08 to 8.2 percent. Since being a major complication, it needs in, in, in intensive management ranging from debridement, primary closure, flap rotation, and at times explantation. We present a case of seven-year-old child who had bilateral congenital sensory neural hearing loss, underwent right cochlear implantation at the age of five years. He presented with swelling over receiver stimulator site 18 months post-surgery on 31-2023. The swelling was insidious in onset, gradually progressive with development of gaping over the receiver stimulator site after three days of aspiration of the swelling. No history of fever, no history of nausea, vomiting, or neck rigidity. He had similar complaints in the past after undergoing right cochlear implantation, standard mastoidectomy via posterior tympanotomy approach on 29-9-2021. On 7 10 2021, POD 8, patient developed swelling over incision site followed by wound gaping. Swab from dehiscent site showed negative for any organisms. He was then referred to the Department of Plastic Surgery where he underwent local transposition flap plus split skin grafting. Patient was subsequently discharged after one week. Further follow up should good flap uptake. On examination, child is well built, moderately nourished. A single swelling of 4 into 3 centimeters is visualized over receiver stimulator area on the right side of temporal region. Cystic and fluctuant. No tenderness with a no local rise of temperature. Aspiration of swelling resulted in 4 ml of serous fluid, which was sent for bacterial culture sensitivity, followed by pressure bandage application. A 2 into 2 centimeter gaping presented 3 days later at the receiver stimulator site with mucopurulent discharge, yellowish white in color, non foul smelling. Donor bed from previous local transposition flap in the temporoparietal region is visible. Investigations, all routine blood investigations were normal. Hemoglobin was 11.3 gram per cent. Serous fluid for culture sensitivity, no organism was isolated. X-ray mastoids confirms electrodes in situ. 
patient was admitted for post implant seroma wound exploration and antimicrobial treatment under general anesthesia wound exploration was done seroma capsule tissue around the receiver stimulator site was exposed and sent for head histopathological ex uh, examination and bacterial culture sensitivity antimicrobial treatment with tea tree oil to implant was done followed by secondary suturing HPA reports suggestive of fibrocollagenous connective tissue stroma with areas of hyalinization with granulation tissue with acute and chronic inflammatory cells. One month post-surgery with persistent wound gaping, patient was referred to plastic surgery for further management. At the Department of Plastic Surgery, he was subjected to negative pressure wound therapy. Following one week of vacuum-assisted wound therapy, local rotation flap under general anesthesia was performed. Patient was kept under observation for one week and discharged following suture removal. Post-operative follow-up was uneventful. One year post-operative follow-up graft uptake has been satisfactory. Auditory response telemetry responses were present. Flap complications after cochlear surgeries are rare but treatable. Formation of biofilms on implants often results in difficulty to treat such chronic infections. Cochlear implant material can provide a surface for bacterial biofilm formations. Impressions can provide an environment conducive to biofilm establishment and growth, ultimately necessitating device removal with loss of implant function. Initial management conservatively is to use the antibiotic after sensory testing. Effectiveness of tea tree oil has demonstrated potential in killing clinical pathogens. Patient has been subject to vacuum-assisted closure followed by transposition flap and rotation flap. Vacuum-assisted closure technique removes chronic edema leading to increased localized blood flow and applied forces resulting in enhanced formation of granulation tissue. Surgically, temporoparietal facial flap was an excellent option for this case and was used for the initial episode of dehiscence, but failure of this led to the need for a second flap closure. In 2008, Moore et al. reported on the use of occipital scalp rotation flap for reconstruction after lethal temporary wound resection, hence was used for the second attempt of closure. Flap necrosis is the most frequent complication of cochlear implantation, but care must be taken in management of such cases, keeping the cost of the device in hand and the effect of repeated and long-term hospital stay leading to emotional and financial burden to the family. Special consideration must be taken in counseling the attender regarding care of the implant to prevent trauma to the site of the surgery. Excessive thinning of the flap during primary surgery could be emphasized to prevent this complication. In this case report, we are emphasizing how the implant was salvaged, by a series of treatment options and finally achieve the desired result with rotation flap surgeries. These are my references. Thank you. Hello. Hello, sir. You have rotated the flap for the flap necrosis. Yes, sir. For the donor set, how did you cover? So the donor site was covered by a split skin grafting done from thigh, sir. It was taken and covered over that region, sir. Okay, it was taken up well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. It was taken up well, sir. So this flap rotation is done by ENT surgeon or plastic surgeon? Plastic surgeon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dr. Kapil Sai. Uh, today I'm presenting uh, sinonasal hemangiopericytoma. Uh, hemangiopericytoma is a, tu a red tumor of uncertain malignant potential. The incidence of tumor in head and neck area is only 15%, mostly seen in. Uh, 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 hemangiopericytoma is a soft tissue tumor arising from G1 uh, man's uh, pericytes, which are modified smooth muscle cell in the peripheral uh, periphery of blood vessels. These pericytes are located outside the reticulant sheet of the endothelium. Hemangiopericytoma can occur in any age group, uh, uh, and uh, there is no sex predilection. The diagnosis of uh, uh, hemangiopericytoma is one of the uh, exclusions and uh, relies on the presence of uh, characteristic he he uh, histological features. Uh, to uh, come to our uh, my case is a 40 year old male presented to our OPD with the complaints of uh, right nasal obstruction, uh, uh, right nasal obstruction from for the past one year and bleeding from the right 
nasal cavity two to three episodes. Patient was apparently all right one year back. Then he developed nasal obstruction more on right side of nasal cavity. Insidious in which is insidious in the onset, progressive in nature, continuous with no aggressive uh, aggressive. Yeah, please go ahead. I think oh, thank you. Uh, internet connection is not stable. Hello? His inter looks like his internet connection is not stable, sir. Hello. Hello. Next presenter, Dr. Sadia, are you ready with your presentation? Sir, next presenter is me, sir, Rachita. Please go ahead. Yes, Stop this and then go for the next one. Good afternoon, sir. I am Rajita presenting a case report on Verica vulgaris of focal cord. But your, uh, sir? But your slide is not seen. Sorry. Ask them to remove this and then put yours. Yes. Okay, now you share your screen, no? Yes. yes sir. Sir, is it now visible, sir? Sir, is my presentation visible? No, your presentation is not visible. Just one second, sir. Yeah, please start. Yes, yes. So, good afternoon, sir. I'm Rachita presenting a case report on Verica vulgaris of Picot. My aim of presentation is to report a rare case of Verica vulgaris of focal cord to describe its clinical presentation and management of the case. And lastly, to compare the results of case reports published in the review literature. Go to the next slide. Yes, I'm not able to. Please go to the next slide. So one second, sir. I'm not able to. Sir, is it now visible, sir? Ah, yes. Yes. Verica vulgaris is caused by human papilloma virus, which is a double standard DNA virus. It's most commonly seen on skin, presenting as a small elevated papules or nodules, which are non-tender. It is rarely seen on mucosal surfaces, such as lips, oral cavity, but its occurrence in the larynx is even more rare. This becomes difficult to differentiate it from other laryngeal lesions. 
the incidence in literature has not been reported yet. However, based on review literature, the lesion is more frequently seen in men than women. My case history, a 48 year old man came to the OPD with a change in voice for 20 days. There is no history of vocal abuse, no history of upper respiratory tract infection, no history of fever. There is history of tobacco smoking and intake of alcohol since 20 years. Examination, oral cavity and oropharynx are normal. On indirect laryngoscopy, there is an irregular wide growth seen arising from the superior surface of anterior two third of the right vocal cord with normal cord mobility. The growth seems to be immobile on phonation with adequate glottic chain. To confirm my findings seen on the indirect laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy was done. Similar findings were noted with the growth extending with the growth not extending to the anterior commission and there is no contact lesion seen over the opposite cord. These are the pre-operative laryngoscopic uh, pictures of the patient depicting the growth seen over the anterior two-third of the right vocal cord not extending to the anterior commission. To arrive at diagnosis, the patient was then planned for direct laryngoscopic guided biopsy under general anesthesia. Biopsy was taken from the growth and then sent for histopathological examination and the report came suggestive of verica vulgaris of vocal cord. These are the histopathological findings typically suggestive of verica vulgaris. These are papillomatous epithelial proliferation with prominent hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, orthokeratosis, parakeratosis and coilocytic change. There are elongated reti ridges showing angulation towards the center. There are various uh, other varicose lesions in the larynx such as keratosis, papilloma and varicose carcinoma which have distinct histopathological features different from uh, varicose vulgaris. Since the diagnosis has been established, the patient was planned for total excision of the lesion uh, by coblation with precise MLW1. The patient was then followed up post-operatively post after one week by video laryngoscopy. Thereafter, every 15 days till three months to look for any recurrence. This is the post-operative laryngos video laryngoscopic picture immediately taken uh, after one week and there is no residual disease. Discussion, Fischner et al. has misdiagnosed two patients with superficial keratotic lesions as varicose carcinoma and squamous papilloma and they were treated with hemilaryngectomy and local excision respectively. Since the histopathological features were similar to Verica vulgaris, they were easily misdiagnosed and one of the patient has to undergo overtreatment. Hence, the findings have to be noted to not be overseen to avoid misdiagnosis. Murat Tobdag et al. Uh, has seen th uh, reported three cases with Verica vulgaris and the incidence is most commonly seen in men. Barnes et al. diagnosed a patient of Verica vulgaris with positive for HPV type 6 in female patient. Sajid et al. diagnosed a patient with vul verica vulgaris based on a histopathological examination despite failure in demonstrating HPV and removed using cold blade surgical intervention. This disease is also not known to have any recurrences. However, post-operative follow-up should be done. The longest follow-up was done for 17 years long. Still, no recurrence has been noted. Conclusion, my take-home message is uh, in varicose lesions of uh, larynx, verica vulgaris should be considered as a differential, differential diagnosis as it is a rare disease. It is easily misdiagnosed. Histopathological examination remains the mainstay in diagnosis and management of the lesion. Once it is confirmed, the excision of lesion is done and patient should be followed post-operatively for recurrence. These are my references. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Why did you uh, use the coblation in this patient? What and is the advantage of coblation? Coblation has uh, minimal bleeding, post-operative pain, and also shorter duration. Shorter duration of the surgery. Sir. No, debrider would have been better, no, than uh, coblation. So, uh, coblation so takes more time, no. So post-operative pain and uh, bleeding is better controlled by coagulation than micro uh -huh. Okay, which band do you use? So precise MLW1, sir. The one which has a ring or like a flat one? So, uh, the flat one, sir, which is not a len not like, it's not a lengthy one, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next.
42. Hello, sir. I'm audible, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please share your screen. I'll share, share, share the screen. Okay. Please share your screen. Don't waste yes. any more time, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sharing. I request all the participants use Wi-Fi only. Don't use your mobile phones. That is a problem why you are facing these issues. Yeah, you go ahead. Patricia? No, what you are doing? Well, I'm trying to show the screen, sorry. Huh? Yes, yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Today, my aim is to present a case, rare case of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Angiosarcoma. Angiosarcoma are malignant neoplasms of, uh, of uh, angio, uh, malignant neoplasms that grow from the endothelial cells. They represent 2% of all sarcomas and only. 1 to 4 percent are located in the aerodigestive tract, and aerodigestive angiosarcomas have better prognosis due to better cell differentiation and presence of early symptoms. A 31 year old male patient presented to ENT OP with a complaint of recurrent epistaxis from two years and bilateral nasal obstruction from two years, and it is associated with snoring at night. There is no history of trauma, no history of weight loss, loss of appetite, and a history of addictions. Is alcoholic for six years and no history of ear complaints, no history of throat complaints, no history of comorbidities, and no history of previous ENT surgeries. In general examination, patient was conscious, coherent, and cooperative, well-oriented to time, place, and person, and the systemic examination was normal. And on clinical examination, on nasal endoscopy, a single smooth pinkish mass seen in the nasopharynx, which is bleeding on touch and not sensitive to touch. And on investigations, the routine blood investigations are normal. And on computed tomography of paranasal sinuses, soft tissue lesion with anterior convexity is seen in the posterior aspect of nasopharynx, measuring 4 into 4.2 centimeters, causing near total obliteration of nasopharyngeal airway lumen and indentation and displacement of the soft tissue palate anterior inferiorly. And this on the CT scans, we can see the tumor mass. And on treatment, we used the coagulation assisted uh, wide excision of the nasopharyngeal mass was done, and posterior septectomy was done for the better access of the tumor. Mass debrided with the help of coagulator, mass was sent to histopathological examination. Histopathological examination with angiosarcoma, and patient is sent to the radiotherapy. And the here pictures we showing the posterior septectomy, which is done for the access for the tumor, and tumor mass being debrided with the coagulator. And on histopathological reports, they are on HPP, we can see anastomizing vascular channels, which are typical for angiosarcomas. And the postoperative nasal endoscopy pictures showing no residual growth. On discussion, angiosarcoma commonly presents with the complaints of epistaxis and nasal obstruction. There is no specific etiological factors at cellular level, but angiosarcoma has been reported to occur following administration of thorotrast and following radiotherapy. Cytogenic studies of angiosarcoma may not have shown any consistent recurrent chromosomal abnormalities, but typically complex karyotypes. TP53 mutational inactivation and increase of MDM2 expression have been reported to lead to upregulation of vascular endothelial growth factor expression in up to 80% of angiosarcomas. Primary cyanonasal angiosarcoma is a rare and it's often affecting males frequently more than, uh, frequently than females. And females tend to presently slightly at anger age than the male patients. And clinical presentation overlaps with many other sinonasal tract lesions, and therefore angiosarcoma should be considered with the differential diagnosis of sinonasal tract mass. The tumors are vasoformative with freely anastomizing vascular channels and local invasion. 
and they are immunoreactive with CD31-34 and cyanonasal angiosarcoma appear, appears to show a less aggressive clinical course in comparison to other types of angiosarcoma. Although recurrence develops in about 38% of patients and combination of surgery and with radiation, it seems to overall, uh, it has 61.5 su uh, survival rate. And these are my references. Thank you. Hello. Hello, sir. See, this tumor was a sessile one or a broad-based? Uh... It's a broad-based tumor, sir. So how did you excise this completely? You have deprived it, no? That's all. Yes, sir. We did with the coagulation, sir. So you ablated the tumor, rather? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are not excised, no? You ablated the tumor. Yes, sir. We coagulated the tumor. Uh, how was the bleeding? It was uh, it was uh, on table. It uh, had a uh, very much bleeding, sir. We had to uh, transfuse. What, uh, what brand do you used? We used uh, ML uh, ML C that one, sir. Huh? Uh, can't remember the name. Sorry. Sir. So you tell me what are the vans of uh, at least coagulation vans? You know. Okay, thank you. Next. 43. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, please share your screen. No? Yes, sir. Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Raj Kumar. Today, my topic is chronic otitis media with endolymphatic sac tumor. Uh, increase, my... increase the volume, volume. Yes, sir. Ah, right. Today, my aim is to present a rare case of chronic otitis media squamous type with endolymphatic sac tumor. So, uh, endolymphatic sac tumor is an uncommon locally aggressive tumor. The tumor is located in the medial and posterior region of the petrous temporal bone and may also involve the dura. It is a hypervascular tumor involving the endolymphatic sac with destructive changes. It involves the bone and may show reactive new bone formation. These tumors may be sporadic or also associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease. The diagnosis is based on clinical, radiological and pathological correlation. So, the, coming to the history. A 23-year-old female came to the tertiary hospital with complaints of left ear pain for two months, which is insidious in onset, gradually progressive of throbbing type and no radiation. It was associated with hard of hearing in the left ear for one month. There was no history of ear discharge or ringing sensation and no history of any fever, giddiness, vomiting or angle of mouth deviation or double vision. So no, there was no history of complaints in the right ear or uh, history of nose or throat complaints or any comorbidities or previous ENT surgeries. On clinical examination, the patient was conscious, coherent, cooperative. Her vitals were stable. On the in the left ear, there was a smooth bulge over the posterior wall of the external auditory canal, showing obstruction, causing obstruction. In the right ear, the tympanic membrane was intact. So no nystagmus was elicited. The facial function was normal on both sides. Cerebellar functions were normal. The rhinus test was negative for uh, 256 and 512 hertz, and positive for 1024 hertz in the left ear. Positive for 256, 512, 1024 hertz in the right ear. Weber's test was lateralized towards left side. Schwabach's test was same as the examiner, and oral and no oral cavity and nose were normal. And on investigations, the on, on autoendoscopy in the left ear, a smooth bulge over the posterior wall of the external auditory canal, causing obstruction was seen and obscuring the view of the tympanic membrane posteriorly. But the tympanic membrane appears to be intact. In the right ear, the tympanic membrane was intact. Put, uh, Putin audiometry showed uh, normal hearing in the right ear and uh, moderately severe mixed hearing loss in the left ear. So CT temporal bones and the MRI with contrast showed a circumscribed lesion in the region of the left mastoid and heterogeneous enhancement is noted lateral to the vestibule and uh, lateral semicircular canal. So this patient underwent left canal wall down mastoidectomy with uh, labyrinthectomy and vestibulotomy and a general anesthesia. So cholestitoma seen eroding the posterior canal wall floor of the posterior canal fossa was removed and sent for histopathological examination. And also a mass, a small mass over the endolymphatic sac was uh, present and it was also removed and sent for histopathological examination. Postoperative period was eventful and with intact facial nerve. 
So the histopathological report was suggestive of the first one showed a cholestitoma of the mastoid antrum, and the the mass over the endolymphatic sac was suggestive of the endolymphatic sac papillary tumor with fibrocollagenous connective tissue and small cystic spaces. And the center of the cyst is a center central papillary structure lined by cuboidal cells. So postoperatively, a follow up of the patient was done by autoendoscopy in which uh, the neotympanum was intact on the left side with a healthy mastoid cavity, and the patient was symptomatically better with no complaints. So the endolymphatic sac is located on the posterior medial aspect of the temporal bone. The patients with endolymphatic sac tumors they often present with uh, gradual onset and of progressive sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. The others include like earache. Vertigo, ataxia, facial nerve paralysis, and otorrhea. So, in this case, the endolymphatic sac papillary tumor was an incidental diagnosis confirmed by histopathological examination, even though the patient doesn't have any typical symptoms suggestive of endolymphatic sac tumor. So, two histopathologic categories of endolymphatic sac tumors were described. One is the follicular and the papillary, follicular form and the papillary form. The immunohistochemical staining is useful in diagnosing these tumors. They stain positive for periodic acid stiff uh, shift. S100, cytokeratin, vomentin, and epithelial membrane antigen. The differential diagnosis which we uh, thought were of tympanic paraganglioma and vascular tumors like hemangioma, meningioma, choroid plexus tumors, and bony lesions like chondrosarcomas. So to conclude, endolymphatic sac tumor is a rare slow-growing but locally destructive temporal bone low-grade adenocarcinoma, which may be sporadic or associated with von Hippel-Landau syndrome. The likelihood of regional and distant metastasis is low. Wide excision with negative margins is a treatment of the choice. But in patients with positive margins and incompletely resected gross disease or inoperable tumors, they should be considered for radiotherapy. So this case is presented here to aim at the better understanding and awareness of this extremely rare neoplasm. These are my references, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. You said it is uh, CSY with squamous cell type. Yes, sir. But uh, tympanic complaint is normal, no? Where, where is the CSY? Yes, sir. Type? Uh, we could see a po on autoendoscopy, the posterior bulge was seen, sir. So, superiorly near the past flaccida, a small retraction pocket was present, sir, but it was not exactly visible in the picture. Uh -huh. So, yes. it is a dual pathology, eh? Yes, sir. Based on histopathology? pathology, yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Number 44. Please stop your uh, sharing. Yes, sir. Bobby S3, Dr. Bobby S3, are you there? If he's not there, go for the next one. And move to the next presenter. 45. 45, Dr. R. Santana Lakshmi. Yes, he's there. Hello, Dr. Santana Lakshmi, are you there? Please respond yes or no. Okay. Next, Shadi, Dr. Shadia Sheikh. Yeah, 46. Dr. Shadia Sheikh, please respond. I can see her name here. Yes, I am here. Yeah. So please go respond yes. first. No, don't waste the time. Yes, so my, uh, am I visible? Yeah, your yes, yes. slides are not visible. Share the screen. Screen is not
Yes, am I, is the screen visible now? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Dr. Sadia Sheikh. I am. I will be presenting a case of a brachial cyst today. So, introduction. We have four types of brachial cyst. Uh, first, brachial cyst usually accounts for eight percent of neck masses. Yes. Second, brachial cyst accounts for ninety to ninety-five percent of the uh, cyst. It is usually located medial to the facial nerve. Third and fourth brachial cysts are rare and they are usually located just below the second brachial arch. Clinically, the presentation is of a painless compressible swelling situated at the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. The patient usually reports that the swelling is of no, uh, longer duration with periods of waxing and waning. The treatment of second, second uh, brachial cyst is surgical resection, usually approached by transverse cervical uh, incision. So in my case, a 45-year-old female housewife from lower socioeconomic status came to the ENT OPD with complaints of swelling on the right side of the neck since five months, which was noticed by her family members. She had occasional pain at the same side since 15 days. She had no complaints of fever, cough, or any difficulty swallowing. History of presenting illness, the patient was apparently all right five months back when a family member noticed the swelling, which was small, on the right lateral aspect of the neck. The swelling was insidious and onset, and it now has um, increased in size, which is five into three centimeters currently. This, uh, there is an occasional dull aching pain, which was relieved by taking analgesics. She had no history of pressure symptoms, no difficulty swallowing, fever, weight loss, or any trauma. In past history, she is a known case of diabetes mellitus, and uh, she has hypothyroidism, and, and she is currently taking medication for both of them. Personal history is not uh, very uh, significant in this. Family history, there's no uh, similar complaints in the family. In case summary, 45 year old female with known case of diabetes. Forty-five-year-old female with known case of diabetes mellitus and hypothyroidism presented to the ENT OP with complaints of swelling in the right lateral aspect of the neck for the five for past five months. It is insidious and onset and progressive without any pressure effects or malignant symptoms. On general examination, patient was well built and moderately nourished. There was no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, or clubbing. No generalized lymphadenopathy. Systemic examination and vitals were normal. On local examination, on inspection, a single swelling of size 5.3 centimeters present in the right lateral aspect of the upper neck in the submandibular triangle. The swelling was ovoid, which extended 2 centimeters just below the angle of the mandible and 3 centimeters medially in front. It has it, it did not reach the midline. It has a small uh, it, it has smooth surface with well-defined margins and skin over the swelling appears normal and intact. It does not move with deglutition or protrusion of the tongue. There were no visible uh, pulsations, scars, or sinuses, or dilated veins. On palpation, swelling of 5 into 3 centimeters present in the submandibular triangle, which is ovoid in shape, not reaching the midline, and has well-defined borders. Swelling is soft, fluctuant, compressible, and non-reducible. There is no local rise of temperature, non-tender, with normal overlying adjacent skin and surroundings. Transluminization is negative. Trachea is normal in position. Carotid pulsations are felt. Uh, ENT remaining ENT examination was normal. Case summary a 45 year old female with a known history of diabetes mellitus and hypothyroidism came to the OP with swelling on the right lateral aspect of the neck for five months, which was insidious and progressive. Uh, five, five into three. So what diagnosis you made? So we actually, so we did an investigation, so FNEC, which uh, revealed that uh, it could be an epidermal inclusion cyst with secondary infection. And the CT uh, revealed um, uh, it suggested necrotic lymph node and effective brachial cysts and tubercular abscess. So these are the differentials we had uh, seen. And on the CT, this over here are the um, you can see the it is uh, just below the sternocleidomastoid anteriorly to the sternocleidomastoid, and it is very close to the great vessels. Okay. So over here also we can see. 
So differential diagnosis, which we had was cold abscess, epidermoid cyst, lymphadenopathy, uh, cystic hygroma, neurofibroma. Management, uh, so basically our diagnosis mainly was towards the brachial cyst. We did an excision and uh, the mass was sent for biopsy and it revealed cyst lined by stratified squamous epithelium and it was also lined by uh, in places and lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. Lumen was filled with proteinaceous material and cholesterol crystal, which is suggestive of brachial cyst. So these are my references. Thank you. So the while uh, removing the cyst, uh, there was no damage to the cyst at all. No, sir. If it, it was, is cyst, uh, usually it gets damaged. Yes, and sir. Then if I... No, there was no damage to the cyst. Uh, it uh, it came out in total without any damage. We did uh, uh, cautery all around, so there was uh, careful preservation of the great vessels also. There was a, a slight bleeding during the intraoperatively, but that was. Uh, uh, very minimal. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next, 47. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, you are 45, huh? Yes, sir. I'm. Oh, please go ahead. Please go ahead. See, your inter internet is very unstable. Your voice is not clear. You are presenting from same laptop of the part number 40, I think. Your internet is very unstable. We are unable to actually you speak out again. No, you are not audible. You correct your internet and then you will come back. So number 47, are you ready? Yes, sir. So please go ahead. Stop your share. Forty seven, please share your screen. One minute. Yes, sir. Am I, am I audible, sir? Yeah, please share your screen. Is it visible, sir, now? No, no. What, madam? How much time you're taking to just to... Next presenter can come, invite, you can uh, fix your problem. Yeah, number 48. Doctor. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please share your screen. Yes, sir.
लास्ट है गुड आफ्टरनून सर प्लीज गो हेड स्क्रीन ऑडिबल एंड आई एम आई विजिबल सर यस यस वेरी मच गो हेड यस सर Uh, good afternoon one and all i am dr tarannum nas presenting a case report on bilateral elongated styloid process increase increase, increase your increase your volume sir bilateral elongated styloid process which is yes. also equal syndrome is it fine sir yeah, very good thank you thank you sir um introduction in 1937 uh, dr eagle described uh the elongation of styloid process or classification of stylohyoid ligament as eagle syndrome incidence of this condition is 4% of the general population it is usually asymptomatic or may occur with a very vague symptoms uh the condition has a female predominance and the common age group is 30 to 50 years and the normal length of styloid process is 20 to 30 mm in adults a uh, history of present illness 46 year old female patient presented with chief complaints of dysphagia and pain below both the ears for 6 months the pain was spontaneous in origin moderate in intensity and intermittent in nature pain she had on both pre and post auricular region which was radiating to temporal as well as lateral part of the neck her aggravating factors were whenever she was trying to look up and turning her face side to side and also during yawning Uh, her associated symptoms were referred autologia for 2 months which was not subsided by analgesics or NSAIDs and she didn't have any fever or any swellings her past history there was no trauma no relevant medical or surgical history personal history uh, she had disturbed sleep due to this pain and family history was not significant on examination bilateral ears pinna eac tympanic membrane all were normal and the nose sh- uh, show no abnormality extra oral examination no palpable mass or tenderness in the involved region bilateral tn joints were normal neck examination was normal and the lymph nodes were not involved intraoral examination lips tongue buccal mucosa and teeth were normal tonsils showed a grade 2 tonsillar hypertrophy without any congestion on palpation a hard bony mass was felt in both the tonsillar fossa with tenderness The picture shows a 3D CT scan of the patient. 3D CT scan being the gold standard investigation for this condition. The length of the styloid process was shown as on right it was 36 mm and left 37. Provisional diagnosis was bilateral elongated styloid process. Uh coming on to treatment as the patient showed no in- improvement conservatively a transoral tonsil tonsillostyloidectomy under general anesthesia was plan uh, under rose position and endoscopically first the ton- tonsillectomy was done after tonsillectomy tonsillar bed was palpated tip of the styloid process identified and dissected using a ring curette all the attachments were stripped off from tip to base of the styloid keratin sponge was used to nibble the exposed styloid from its base the tonsillar bed was sutured with absorbable sutures post operatively she was managed with analgesics and antibiotics and the uh, post operative period was uneventful uh, my differentials include trigeminal neuralgia glossopharyngeal neuralgia meningitis cervical arthritis uh, coming on to discussion uh, eagle considered trauma chronic irritation surgery like tonsillectomy to be responsible for the formation of scar which could which could cause a comparison compression of vessels and nerves around the styloid process this may be associated with heterotopic calcification disorders like chronic renal failure abnormal calcium phosphorus metabolism uh the presentation of eagle syndrome could be classical eagle syndrome or carotid vascular type classical eagle syndrome the f- symptoms could be dysphagia foreign body sensation facial pain change in voice tinnitus otalgia carotid vascular type this may show uh, the compression of the carotid artery and the patient may present with transient ischemic shock syncope visual symptoms and even stroke diagnosis by different imaging modalities like uh, town's view lateral cephalogram orthopantogram cbct 3d ct and the treatment is usually surgical uh, performed by intraoral or extraoral approaches 
my take home message of this uh, presentation is due to overlapping symptoms in eagle syndrome many of such cases go misdiagnosed for a long time awareness of eagle syndrome among practitioners will help to diagnose and treat such cases promptly these are my references sir thank you after accession of uh, you know how, how did the uh, elongated steroid process exercised actually in one piece what instrument is used? Sir, uh, kerosene sponge, ring curate, and ah, after so did, stripping or sorry. After you exercise that, do we require to suture that uh, transfer bed? Yes, sir, with unabsorbable right. sutures. Absorbable sutures, sir? Unabsorbable uh, sutures, yes, sir. The tonsillar bed was by absorbable sutures. It Why was you suture? To prevent the recurrences and uh, Not recurrence, prevent infl inflammation of the tonsillar bed. What is the purpose of suturing? What space we have opened? Pa parapharyngeal. To prevent uh, deep neck infections, sir. Deep neck space infections. Okay, next. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next presentation, 49. Am I audible, sir? 49, eh? Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. I'm 49, sir. Uh, please, please, go ahead. Share the screen. You share your screen. Yes, sir. I'm sharing my screen. Is it visible, sir? No, we are getting the Webex. Yeah, now it is visible. Make it full screen. Let's say F5. Yeah, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Today, my case report is a rare presentation of inverted papilloma. Inverted papilloma are mostly benign sinonasal tumors that are characterized by local destruction, tendency for recurrence, and risk of malignant degeneration. The WHO has defined three subtypes, that is, uh, inverted, exophytic, and oncocytic, of which the inverted papilloma is the most common subset of the Schneiderian papilloma. The tumor occurs with an incidence of about 0.2 to 1.5 per panelac uh, population, and it is mostly frequently seen in males and has a mean age of diagnosis of around 55 years. So my case report is a patient, a 56-year-old male patient, who were presented to the OPD with a left-sided nasal obstruction since six months. The patient had a nasal obstruction which was insidious in onset, gradually progressive, uh, continuous uh, obstruction on the left side. There was no seasonal and diurnal variations, and uh, there's no, there are no aggravating and relieving factors. The patient had history of bleeding from left nasal cavity since six months, which was profuse in amount. The patient developed a swelling near the medial canthus of the left eye since six months. The patient has a history of headache and decreased the sense of smell. There are no other significant nasal history like nasal discharge, excessive sneezing, and no history of loosening of teeth and difficulty in mouth opening, no significant throat and ear complaints. The patient is a known case of diabetes mellitus since one year and is on medication. There's no significant uh, medical and surgical history. Family history and personal history seems to be insignificant. General and systemic examination is normal. Coming to the ENT examination, the external appearance of the nose was normal. On anterior rhinoscopy, a pinkish polypoidal growth was seen in the middle meatal area of the left nasal cavity. Probe could not be passed on the lateral side. Septum was deviated towards the right side. Coming to the eye examination, a pinkish proliferative growth of about 5 cm into 6 cm was seen near the left medial canthus. The growth was compressing the globe and causing indentation of the rectus muscle. Because of the mass, there was a restricted extraocular movements. The patient has the vision which was counting fingers at 2 meters of distance. Ear and larynx examination is normal. There is no cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, coming to the diagnostic nasal endoscopy, a proliferative mass was seen in the left middle meatus extending till nasopharynx, which was sensitive to touch and bleeding on touch. Probe could, uh, could not be passed on the lateral side. 
The CTPNS examination uh, showed uh, erosion of the lamina papracia as well as the medial and the posterior lateral wall of the left maxillary sinus. As we can see in the first pic, uh, the coronal uh, CT depicts the erosion of the lamina papracia and the axial CT is showing the extragonal involvement of the globe. CT brain was normal. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy plus biopsy of the left nasal mass was done under local anesthesia. The HP report came out to be inverted papilloma with malignant transformation. Here we can see the HP picture suggestive of endophytic growth of inverted papilloma as well as the malignant transformation showing the architectural disarray and tumor necrosis. Surgery, endoscopic medial maxillectomy was done for debulking of the tumor. The HP, specimen, uh, HP report of the surgical specimen came out to be infiltrating non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, probably arising from the inverted papilloma. Post surgery, after the confirmation of the malignancy by the HP report, the patient was sent for chemo radiotherapy. The radiotherapy sessions are in progress. The patient is assessed symptomatically better. This is the post radiotherapy pic of the patient. On follow up TNE, no recurrence of the tumor was seen. Uh, like the other epithelial lesions, the inverted papilloma can harbor mild, moderate, and severe dysplasia. It is the severe dysplasia which has, which has a high risk of uh, recurrence and converting into invasive carcinoma. The recurrence rate of inverted papilloma with open procedures averages at 18%, whereas those performed endoscopically uh, scopically have a recurrence rate of 12%. Radiation therapy is mostly preferred for extra nasal extra sinus tumors such as orbit and skull base. Uh, to conclude, uh, complete surgical removal is advocated whether or not inverted papilloma is associated with squamous cell carcinoma. Endoscopic resection is preferred in most of the cases. Unless and until the tumor is not accessible, we can go for the open approaches. Timely post-operative follow-up is very important to suspect any mal uh, lesions uh, to, uh, to check for detection of recurrences and malignant transformation. At times, because the diagnosis is mainly based on biopsy, recent genomic studies have shown promising results in classifying tumors by identifying signaling pathways involving in pathogenesis. These are my references. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next. Next candidate. Am I audible, sir? Who is the next candidate? Um, 50, sir. Serial number 50. Dr. Sheikh Shaf uh, Shafiun. Yes, sir. Ah, Am I audible, yes, sir? yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Please I'm share your my screen. screen. Stop this, sir. She's uh, um. Doctor uh, Saida, please stop your shared screening. Okay, sir. Is it visible, sir? My screen? No, no. Uh, uh, yeah. I, yeah, now it is visible. Yes, sir. Sheikh Shafi on, yeah. Hmm. Good afternoon, everyone, sir. My today's to my topic of case report is a rare case of isolated lateral rectus palsy in a patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Introduction nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a rare disease worldwide. Uh, it shows a high prevalence in southern China, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia. Patient with NPC usually present with neck lumps, hearing loss, epistaxis, nasal obstruction, tinnitus, and cranial nerve palsies. Although all cranial nerve palsies, uh, all cranial nerves can be involved in NPC, cranial nerve 5, 6, 8, and 12 are the most commonly affecting at the same time as a separately from the presenting signs of NPC. Isolated 6 nerve palsy is a rare presentation of NPC and only a few such cases have been reported in the literature. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Continue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your screen. Ah, went up. Yes, sir. Disconnected. Yeah, now it's coming. Ah, yes, sir. This Go is ahead. the anatomy of the <clears throat> cavernous sinus in relationship to the uh, nasopharynx, sir. And also, you can see here the abducens nerve, sir, passing here, just above the uh, nasopharynx, sir. So, isolated 6 nerve palsy syndrome, the patient who demonstrated only uh, lateral uh, rectus palsy with no historical data to implicate a specific etiology, they are having the iso they are uh, they are said to be at the isolated 6 nerve palsy. They are often vas vascular risk, risk factors such as diabetes and hypertension. In adults, the most likely etiology of isolated 6 nerve palsy is ischemic mononeuropathy. So, why I don't know, I am uh, not able to share my screen. Continuous. It is so you are pressing some button uh, which is going now. Oh, okay. Sorry, sir. Okay, sir. Baseline ENT examination uh, included to rule out infective etiology of ear and nasopharynx, sir. Uh, 
uh, then here I'm pre the case report is a 45 years old male patient came with the chief complaints of bilateral nasal obstruction and nasal discharge which is blood stain since two months and the history of present illness patient was all right two months back then he developed our nasal discharge which was watery intermittent type blood tinged and non-false uh, non-false smelling history of bilateral obstruction nasal obstruction since two months and there was also bilateral hard of hearing since two months history of headaches since two months there is a complaint of squint and double vision since two months in right eye and history of snoring present and no history of loss of sensation on face and no history of stroke clinical examination uh, there was no facial asymmetry on examination of nose external contour was normal anterior rhinoscopy shows mild deviated nasal septum towards left posterior rhinoscopy showing the mass obliterating the coena eye examination revealed visual acuity of the right eye was 6 by 18 and left eye was 6 by 9 here we can see um, uh, in the first picture there is a mild esotropia of the right eye and in the second picture we can see when the patient uh, there is an abduction deficit of right eye sir Investigations, the specific investi uh, uh, investigations like diagnostic nasal endoscopy was done. The first picture showing the left uh, nasal uh, uh, left nasal cavity. So right uh, uh, second one uh, the this is the this picture is showing the right nasal cavity sir there is a pinkish mass seen obliterating the right coena and the nasopharynx which bleed which was bleeding on touch then mri brain was done to rule out whether any other there the patient was having any infarcts or ischemias mm, it was normal sir and then uh, contrast enhanced ct pns was done it was showing a soft tissue opacity involving the extending uh, ethmoid airsen which was extending towards the sphenoid uh, causing erosion of the uh, cella tarsica and invading the clivus likely neoplastic etiology uh, here we can see the orbital cerebral mri in favor of a right nasopharyngeal neoplastic process extending to the right cavernous compartment histopathological evaluation uh, revealed the nasopharyngeal carcinoma non differentiate non keratinizing differentiated type um, treatment was the patient was uh, sent for chemoradiotherapy and uh, discussions on NPC should cons uh, consider as a possible etiology. Um, possible etiology if the patient presented with a lateral rectus palsy in a patient uh, under 50 years of age with no comorbidities like uh, um, hypertension, etc., or uh, uh, any other microvascular risk factors. Uh, the location of the nasopharynx, uh, which lies beneath the skull, allows for intracranial tumor invasions in the fusion with uh, in the patients with uh, um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which has poor prognosis. Baharuddin et al. Uh, reported that a brain uh, uh, CT revealed an enhancing paracellular lesions uh, causing six nerve palsy. In our case, the possible mechanism for development of abducens palsy by nasopharyngeal carcinoma include expanding to cavernous sinus or supraorbital fissure and compressing abducens nerve and vasculitis or cavernous sinus thrombosis causing ischemic infarction of abducens nerve. So, cranial nerve involvement in NPC is not rare, but isolated lateral rectus pass is uncommon. The conclusion is uh, a thorough clinical history and neuroimaging examinations are necessary, and uh, any isolated nerve palsy warrants neuroimaging with use of contrast in younger patients with or without systemic illness and in older patients with no systemic illness. Isolated lateral rectus pass can be a sign of NPC and it is a, a prognostic indicator. Thank you, sir. These are my references, sir. So this patient after uh, treatment improved the lateral uh, so was, palsy has become normal? Uh, no, sir. Um, there was mild, uh, the visual acuity was uh, slightly improved, but uh, there was no improvement in lateral rectus palsy, sir. Now in which other condition you will see lateral rectus palsy? Uh, probably any of the masses which are involving the cavernous sinuses um, that too involving the abducens now uh, sixth cranial nerve involvement will be seen sir later like this month. in year 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 sir year hmm. um, what is the syndrome garden echo syndrome sir can you tell the components of gardening syndrome uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, ret um, retrofacial uh, facial uh, uh, retro uh, ear pain, sir. Uh, deep seated ear pain. Uh, then uh, um, uh, palsy. 
abducens palsy six nerve palsy then otorrhea sir okay thank you uh, sir okay sir thank you sir next, next question dr ravi kumar no saujanya is there so good afternoon sir your number your number in the serial 47 sir okay go ahead good afternoon sir myself i'm dr saujanya going to present a case report on compound nevus of external auditory canal which is a rare entity Yes. Introduction. Melanocytic nevi are common benign pigmented skin lesions with a rare occurrence within the external auditory canal, which are neoplastic prol proliferation of nevus cells. Friedman reported the first case of melanocytic nevus in the skin of external auditory canal. Most of the clinical cases have been reported in the Japanese literature. They are classified into three subgroups, which histologically as intradermal nevi, junctional nevi, compound nevi. Intradermal nevi, in which the nevus cells are restricted to within the dermis. In junctional nevi, uh, they are situated at the epidermis. In compound nevi, which, which represent the transitional stage and possess the features of both junctional and intradermal nevi. Intradermal nevi are more common than compound nevus in adults. Female to male ratio was 4.5 is to 1. Coming to the case history, a 24-year-old woman presented to our otolaryngeology department with intermittent episodes of pain, itching, discharge from the left ear for the past two months. Discharge was scanty, purulent, and was neither foul-smelling nor blood-stained. There is no history of hardness of hearing, no history of ringing sensation in the ear, no history of dizziness, no history of facial deformity. On examination, on automicroscopic examination, there is a papillomatous pigmented non-hair bearing lesion arising from the anterior superior part of lateral aspect of the cartilaginous part of external auditory canal was seen and causing the partial occlusion of the external auditory canal. Visualized part of the tympanic membrane was normal and intact. Coming to the investigations, culture of the discharge yielded no growth. An audiometric evaluation revealed a mild conductive hearing loss. All hematological investigations are within normal limits. CT temporal bone is normal. Differential diagnosis is uh, benign tumors like granulomas, inflammatory polyps, seboric keratosis, senile keratosis, pigmented actinic keratosis, benign pigmented keratosis, common warts, squamous papilloma, and atypical nevus. Malignant tumors like malignant melanoma, squamous cell carcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma of seriminous glands. Treatment. The lesion was completely excised and sent for the uh, histopathological examination and the wound was left to heal spontaneously. Uh, in histopathological examination, brown polypoidal tissue, which is lined by flattened keratinized stratified epithelium, subepithelium shows nest of brown nevus cells. In few focal areas, nevus cells were seen abutting the superficial epithelium and also seen extending into the dermis. All features were suggestive of compound nevus with both intradermal and junctional involvement. Discussion. Melanocytic nevi may be dome-shaped, pedunculated, and papillomatous, flat top-shaped lesions, and they are usually pink-colored or pigmented. Histologically, melanocytic nevi are recognized by the presence of nevus cells and differ from melanocytes by being arranged partially in clusters or nests. A compound nevus is comprised of fully formed nests of nevus cells in the epidermis and dermis and has a malignant potential. Pigmented nevus of EAC is mostly seen in age groups range, ranging between 3rd and 6th decade of life. Main differentiating features between benign and malignant tumors are the presence of increased mitotic figures, nuclear atypia, irregular nuclear membrane, hyperchromatism, prominent nuclei, which are characteristic findings of malignancy. Preferred surgical method is wide complete excision of lesion via transmeatal approach. 
If the defect after surgical excision is small, it is allowed to heal spontaneously or else repaired with a free full thickness skin graft from the post-auricular area. It is advised to place a rolled sterile penrose sheet after excision for two weeks to avoid meatal stenosis. Conclusion, the definitive diagnosis of melanocytic nevus is made by clinical appearance and histopathological examination. Pigmented nevus of the EAC is uncommon clinical entity. Ka Kajik Dos et al. recommended that to rule out melanoma, all melanocytic nevus should be excised instead of biopsy. Malignant melanoma should be suspected in cases of dark colored, ul ulcerated, irregular bordered nevi. This benign lesion may be observed and only excised when it comes to when it causes symptoms or develops asymmetric border irregularities in changes, color variation or changes, or the sudden increase in diameter. If a pigmented nevus causes symptoms, especially when it is large enough to obstruct the lumen of ESC and has the possibility of developing into an external auditory canal cholesteatoma, it should be excised. These are my references. Thank you, sir. Hello. Thank you, sir. How this was excised using a scissors or a cartridge? What? How did you excise this? Uh, using the scissors, sir, and after that, uh, the base is uh, cauterized, sir. Okay. Right. Next. Next candidate, Doctor Ravi Kumar. No. What? What is that number? Sir, uh, her number. Seven, sir. Oh, okay, right. Now 51. Now 51, sir. Dr. Ravi Kumar, please share your screen. Sojana, stop uh, sharing your screen. Dr. Ravi Kumar is there. If Dr. Ravi Kumar is not there, Dr. Davidson, are you there? Dr. Davidson. Yes, sir. Am I audible, yeah. sir? Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Share your screen, David. Is it visible, sir? Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Go ahead, uh, today, I am presenting a, a case report on unusual presentation of the rhinoorbital mucormycosis. Mucormycosis or zygomycosis is caused by fungi of order mucor mucorels, which contain species like rhizopus and mucor. High risk group who are prone to get mucormycosis include patients with diabetes mellitus, diabetic ketoacidosis, long term corticoid, corticosteroid use, cytotoxic drug therapy, immunosuppression. Patients having malignancy and patients with hematological, hematological disorders, including iron overload states. A 35 year male who is otherwise healthy male from Hyderabad, who is a salesperson in an electric shop, presented to the outpatient department of government ENT hospital with complaints of swelling on the inner end of the left eye from past one month and continuous nasal obstruction in the left nasal cavity from past one month. The patient was apparently asymptomatic one month ago when he developed swelling on the inner end of the left eye, which is acute in onset, rapidly progressed in the size and duration. Initially, it was of 1 into 1 centimeter and attained the later size of about 3 into 1 centimeter. Patient has got foreign body sensation and gritty sensation in the left eye, not associated with redness, itching or watering from that eye. Patient never had asymptomatic or symptomatic COVID-19 previously. And later patient developed continuous obstructive sensation in the left nasal cavity from past one month, which was acute in onset, rapidly progressed in the duration and also intensity without any aggravating and relieving factors. There was no complaints of bleeding or nasal discharge from the left nasal cavity. Patient had no other diseases or no co comorbidities or the, any other debilitating illnesses. On examination, on anti-rhinoscopy, there was C-shaped septal deviation to right side with enlarged left, left middle concha. There are polypoidal changes of the uh, mucosa of the mid middle, left middle meatus and the mucosa over the left middle turbinate. There is thick yellowish exudate over the lesion uh, over the left middle concha and over the adjacent nasal septum. On inspecting the left eye, there is solitary reddish fleshy swelling mass 
present at the left medial canthus, which is seen bulging the medial end of the left eye and with obvious cosmetic deformity. Right nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oral cavity, and oropharynx examination was normal. No other significant findings were present on general examination. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy examination was carried out, which showed enlarged left middle turbinate and thick white exudate covering the surface of the middle turbinate and adjacent lateral nasal wall with thrusting in the left middle meatus. And also bulging left bulla ethmodalis was seen. And enlarged right middle concha with cartilaginous spur to right side was also seen. Uh, both the nasal cavities had pale colored nasal mucosa. Then radiological investigations were done. Plain CT scan of the PNS and orbit was done, which showed soft, soft tissue density lesion measuring about 38 into 21 into 23 millimeter, involving both left ethmoid sinus, eroding lamina pressure with intraorbital extension into the extraconal compartment of the left orbit, abutting and displacing the medial rectus muscle. So these are the pictures of the patient, which shows the medial canthus swelling prominently, and also CTPNS showing maxillary uh, mucosal thickening in the maxillary sinus and anterior ethmoidal group of sinuses on left side. This is diagnostic nasal endoscopic video, which is showing polypoidal changes of the left middle concha and thick exudate in the left middle meatus with also crusting in the left mid middle meatus. Then orbital lesion was seen abutting the lacrimal cell and, and also the nasal lacrimal duct anteriorly. Patient was posted for endoscopic sinus surgery with left orbital decompression under general anesthesia. During surgery, punch biopsy was taken from the left orbital lesion and was visualized as lamina pressure. Endo, endoscopic sinus surgery with debulking of the left orbital lesion was done. And the biopsy specimen was sent for histopathological examination, KOH mount, and calcofluoride staining. This is the, uh, these are the intraoperative videos of the patient undergoing endoscopic sinus surgery. Histopathological report of the biopsy was given as acute invasive fungal sinusitis, as granulomatous sinusitis, suggestive of mucormycosis. Calcofloor white fluorescent staining showed aseptate hyphae with angles variable up to 90 degrees and irregular branching. The patient was kept on liposomal amphotericin B, 5 milligram per kg body fat per day for two weeks and was discharged. And he was referred to ophthalmic surgeon for the management of the orbital lesion. Discussion Mucormycosis is an Angioinvasive infection caused by saprophytic fungi belonging to mucorails. Humans acquire the infection predominantly by inhalation of the sporangiospores. Rhizopus arises is the most common etiological agent of mucormycosis in India. Rhinoorbital form is the most common form among the six types of mucormycosis. Confirmed diagnosis of mucormycosis requires the presence of characteristic hyphae in the involved tissues by histopathological staining or direct smear with potassium hydroxide. Invasive mucormycosis includes prominent infox and angioinvasion. Angio As fungal culture often yields no growth, biopsy is the mainstay of diagnosis. Clinical diagnosis of high suspicion is based on symptoms, signs, clinical examination, endoscopic examination, and radiological findings. Mucormycosis has significant impact on patient's standard of living, and therefore, the main aim is to elevate the patient's misery and also ameliorate recovery of the symptoms. Successful treatment of mucormycosis requires four steps. Early diagnosis, reversal of underlying predisposing risk factors, if possible, appropriate surgical debridement by endoscopic sinus surgery, prompt parenteral antifungal therapy. Conclusion, as the incidence of mucormycosis is increasing in the present era, that is post-COVID-19 era, early diagnosis and prompt treatment is needed so that it does not extend into the brain. Any patients presenting with facial pain or swelling or eye and also with loosening of teeth should prompt the treating doctor to, keep, to take prompt action. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Who is the next uh, presentation? Presenter, Dr. Akram Unisa. Dr. Unisa. Yeah. Huh? Unisa.
Share your screen. Hello, sir. Yeah. Is my screen visible, sir? No, no. But it is somebody else's screen, not yours one. Dr. Saujan, yeah, please log out. Your presentation is over. Please log out. Dr. Sufia, try sharing your screen. See, they are using the same laptop and she is unable to do that. Yeah. If they, but if they, next, next presenter, Dr. Mohammad Adnan. Uh, yeah, Sufia has okay, come back. Okay, right. Yeah, so, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, please no, go ahead. Dr. Sufia, you can start. No, I can. Can I start, sir, or like, uh, let Sufia continue? Yeah, Adnan, okay, you can uh, go ahead. Muhammad. Muhammad Adnan. Yes, the topic of the case report is cancer of the right maxillary sinus. A patient named Ravi, age 52 years female, housewife by occupation from Zahirabad, came to an OPD with the chief complaints of right sided, progressively increasing nasal obstruction since six months, blood tinged nasal discharge from the right side since six months, and uh, oriental fistula after extraction of the right second upper, molar, uh, upper premolar tooth. History of present illness a 52 year old female started to develop. Uh, started to look right sided progressively increasing nasal obstruction six months ago this was followed by blood tin nasal discharge from the right side as well due to looseness of the upper second premolar teeth uh, the patient consulted a dentist who advised extraction this resulted in an oriental fistula there were there were no aggro associated aggravating or relieving factors elevating factors Past history is not relevant. Uh, family history, no such uh, similar history. Personal history, diet is normal. Sleep is adequate. General physical examination. Patient is well oriented to player time, place, and person. Patient is of moderate build. Uh, vitals are normal. ENT examination, external examination of nose was normal. On anti rhinoscopy, there was reddish mass seen in right nasal cavity. On posterior rhinoscopy, was normal. Uh, Paranasal sinuses, there was tenderness at right maxillary sinus. An oral cavity and throat examination. Oriental fistula at the right upper second premolar tooth. Uh, in the neck, there was firm tender swelling in the right upper neck. You can see a CT scan uh, and uh, the swelling of the neck. This is oriental fistula, second premolar tooth. Diagnosis cancer of the right maxillary sinus because right tinged, uh, right blood tinged nasal discharge, looseness of the right upper second premolar tooth, swelling in the right upper neck. Explaining manifestations blood tinged nasal discharge is an early uh, common uh, manifestation of the cancer of the paranasal sinuses due to presence of necrotic infected nasal mass, looseness of the right upper second premolar tooth due to destruction of the root of the tooth by uh, malignant tumor as a tooth. And the first molar are very close to the first floor of the maxillary sinus. Oriental fistula due to destruction of the alveolus and the palate by malignant tumor, leading to escape of the saliva and food and drink from the mouth to, mouth to the maxillary antrum, then back out of the nose. Um, for, uh, there's a firm tender swelling in the right upper neck, uh, which denotes lymph node metastasis from the prim uh, primary maxillary tumor. It could be tender or non tender. Further, exa for further examination and investigations. Uh, other symptoms include orbital manifestations such as diplopia, blindness, uh, trisomenologic pain, or there may be Honor syndrome. CT scan must be done to diagnose uh, the extent of the malignant lesion and all. Nasal endoscopy and biopsy are to prove the to prove the malignancy prior to the treatment uh, to know the pathological type. General investigations to assess 
fashion operation treatment was done the there was uh, surgical excision was done by maxillectomy partial or um, radio radiotherapy should be done for the extensive uh, inoperable lesions radical neck dissection for uh, lymph node metastasis and chemotherapy for inoperable tumors that do not respond to radiotherapy palliative treatment for inoperable terminal cases Hello. Hello. Doctor Adnan, you are there. You are completed. Hello. Hi. Hello, Sai Pratisha. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yep. Present. Hi. Pratyusha, please share your screen. Good afternoon. Sir. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone, respected faculty. Today, my I'm Dr. Sai Pratyusha. Today, my topic is about an unusual presentation of invasive fungal sinusitis. Introduction: Invasive fungal sinusitis is characterized by is characterized by mycotic infiltration of the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. The most common presenting symptoms of patients with invasive fungal sinusitis as documented in recent study were facial swelling 64.5%, fever 62.9%, and nasal congestion 52.2%. Direct orbital extension is generally indicated by pain, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, or trigeminal nerve sensory loss. Nasal ulcerations occur in 38 to 74 percent of the patients with painful black eschar on the palate or nasal mucosa, which is considered a classic but non-specific sign. It involves the nasal cavity, sinuses, eyes, and then brain. They appear to have a marked predilection for vascular invasion, hence they cause infarction and necrosis, which is the pathological hallmark of mucomycosis. Some methods. A 40 year old male presented to the outpatient department with complaints of pain, puffiness, loss of vision in the right eye, inability to open the eyes since four days. General examination within normal limits, systemic examination normal, nasal examination including nasal endoscopy, deviation of the nasal septum to the left, hypertrophy in middle turbinate with mucor discharge in the right middle meatus, tenderness of right maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses. Ophthalmological examination, periorbital edema, ptosis with chemosis, fixed pupil, not responding to light, direct and consensual light reflexes were absent, and restricted extraocular movements. Fundoscopic examination, pale disc, and suspected central retinal artery occlusion. The patient was admitted and started on broad spectrum antibiotics. His blood sugars and renal functions were significantly deranged. A CT scan of the nose and paranasal sinuses showed polypoid mucosal thickening of right maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses with hypertrophy of right middle turbinate and a polyp or retention cyst in left maxillary sinus with features of sinusitis along with deviated nasal septum to left. Magnetic resonance imaging of the brain confirmed the CT scan findings and showed normal brain parenchyma, cavernous sinuses, optic nerves. On day 4 admission, during a nasal endoscopic examination, a small black eschar was noted, beginning to appear on the right inferior turbinate. It was promptly excised and sent for histopathological examination. The report indicated chronic sinusitis with areas of necrosis and fungal elements in the form of clusters of broad aseptate hyphae consistent with mucor. The patient was immediately started on systemic antifungal therapy and debridement done. Discussion, acute invasive fungal sinusitis is an aggressive disease with high mortality rate. Fungus causes osteitis and osteomyelitis of the sinus wall or pressure necrosis and subsequent erosion leading to the extension in anterior skull base. This makes the patient an atypical subject as he first manifested with ophthalmological symptoms with no symptoms indicative of nose or paranasal sinus involvement by the fungi such as fever or rhinorrhea, which are the some of the most presenting common symptoms. Loss of vision as an initial symptom is an atypical manifestation of this condition. Chopra have reported this feature in 22% of the patient reviewed in the study. The early ocular involvement with periorbital edema, chemosis, loss of vision, and restriction of movements of extraocular muscles 
commonly occur in cavernous sinus thrombosis, which this patient's presentation suggested. Nasal mucosal findings are considered to be the most consistent findings, and endoscopic examination is recommended in all, all high risk patients. Patients show nasal endoscopic changes eight days after the manifestation of initial symptoms. Features suggest of the aggressive nature of the disease, such as mucoperiosteal thickening, bone erosion, or orbital extension, were not present on the CT scans. No I'm features more... suggest of int intraorbital intracranial extension were found on the MRI either. These findings are suggest of vascular route of dissemination. The poorly controlled diabetes of the patient could be a significant okay. contributing factor in the rapid and fulminant progression of the disease with the atypical manifestations. Conclusion, invasive fungal sinusitis must be suspected in all high-risk patients despite absence of sinonasal symptoms and radiological features of the same. Serial endoscopic examinations with biopsy should be done when necessary and surgical debridement with empirical antifungal therapy should be part of the management protocol in such situations. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else is there? We have completed. Sir, oh, no, this sir. Is few of them are left over, sir. Huh? Uh, yeah, few of them are left over, sir. I'll call the candidates. Doctor Kapil, are you there? Sir, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Sir, Doctor Kapil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doctor Kapil, you share your screen first. Your number is forty. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Chebraka, sir, only three members are left over, sir. Mm, can't you? Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Sir. sir, good afternoon, sir. I am Dr. Dr. Kapil. Kapil. Hello. I am presenting sinonasal Hello. angiopericytoma, sir. Yes, sir. Kapil. Uh, hemangiopericytoma is a rare tumor of uncertain malignant potential. The incidence of the tumor in head and neck area is 15 and mostly seen in adults only. Uh, hemangiopericytoma is a soft tissue tumor arising from Zimmerman's pericytes, which are modified in the periphery, uh, periphery of blood vessels. These pericytes are located outside the reticulant sheath of endothelium. Hemo, uh, hemangiopericytoma can occur in any age group and there is no sex predilection. Uh, the diagnosis of uh, HPC is one of the exclusions and relies on the presence of characteristic histological features. Uh, coming to my case, sir, uh, a 40-year-old male presented to our OPD with complaints of nasal obstruction for the past two, uh, one year and bleeding from the nasal cavity two to three episodes. Uh, the patient was uh, apparently all right one, one year back. Then he developed nasal obstruction more on right side of nasal cavity, in, which is insidious in onset, progressive in nature, continuous with no aggravating and relieving factors. And it is associated with history of two to three bleeding episodes from right nasal cavity, which is sudden in onset, non-progressive and resolved spontaneously. And there is no history of allergic symptoms, nasal discharge, disturbance in smell, history of uh, no history of uh, ear and eye complaints, no history of facial swelling, and no past history of hypertension, diabetes, thyroid, epilepsy, tuberculosis, and asthma, no significant family history, and no past, uh, no history of addictions. On examination of the nose, there was a pinkish proliferative mass seen in right nasal cavity, not sensitive to touch, but bleeding on touch, and the probe could not be passed all around, with deviated nasal septum uh, to left. Rest of the nose examination was normal. Ear and throat examination were normal. Systemic examination was normal. On diagnostic endoscopy, there, were, there was a pinkish proliferative mass in the right nasal cavity, not sensitive to touch and bleeding on touch. Probe could not be passed all, all, around, the extend, uh, all around, extending from middle of right inferior turbinate to opposite coanus. And this is the mass. Uh, in the CT scan, uh, CTPNA showed soft tissue density in the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity and ethmoidal sinuses seen merging in the right uh, nasal turbinates and obliterating the right nasal cavity extending into po posterior into nas nas nasopharynx with a deviation of septum to the left. Soft tissue attenuation in right frontal and spinoid sinuses and all other uh, routine investigations were normal. 
uh, this is the uh, CT scan of coronal sections and uh, axial sections. In management, uh, patient was un uh, underwent uh, endoscopic ex excision of the right nasal cavity mass. On table, a dumbbell shaped pale pinkish mass was seen in, in right nasal cavity, which was attached to septum uh, medially and uh, laterally to uh, lateral nasal wall, extending into ethmoids and frontal and sphenoid sinuses. Devascularization of the mass was done using coblation. Bulk of the mass was excised and removed to, through the nasal cavity and sent for the HP examinations. This was the mass, sir. In micros on microscopy examination showed bits of tissues lined by surface respiratory epithelium with submucous uh, submucosa showing an encapsulated cellular tumor composed of fascicles, bundles of sheets of spindle cells in uh, numerous vascular spaces. No mitotic activity or necrosis was there. The vascular channels were, are varying size uh, lined by endothelium and uh, showing perivascular hyalinization. Features suggestive of hemangiopericytoma and uh, immunohistochemistry showed positive to women in CD19 and uh, negative for S100. Discussion is a uh, hemangiopericytoma is an uncommon mesenchymal tumor ac accounting 1% of uh, tumors, uh, neoplasms vessels uh, related to neoplasm. One more mostly found in parapharyngeal spaces, nasal oral cavity, and jaw. And, and uh, diagnosis of HPC is based on histological and uh, immunohistochemistry features. Recommended treatment is wide ex surgical excision. Prognosis of yet. HPC is favorable and depends on the mitotic activity. Thank you, sir. Sir? Sir? Yeah, Thank you, sir. Kapil, eh? Yes, sir. Kapil, sir. Excellent. Yeah, go to your first slide. Title slide. Title slide. Hello. Yeah. Go to your first slide. Yeah. Now, what is the mistake that you have made in this slide? Do you find any mistake in this slide, or you think this slide is correct? Sir, the my designation, Resi resident. Ah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Please share your number. Sir, 45, sir. Okay. 44 is absent, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dr. Lakshmi. I'm going to do a case report on rare case of the squamous cell carcinoma of temporal bone. Introduction. The malignant neoplasms of the external artery canal and middle ear are as such rare and squamous cell carcinoma being the most common of these sites. The reported incidence is less than six cases per million population and external artery canal is the most common site of origin. It usually presents between fifth and seventh decade of life. The risk factors includes long-standing chronic separative otitis media, and previous irradiation therapy to the head and neck. Surgery forms the mainstay of the treatment and the radiotherapy can be given for the advanced cases. History, this is a 55 year old woman presented to her OPD. Please go ahead. Presented to the ENT OPD with the serosanguinous right ear discharge since two months and a fungatic mass from the right ear canal for one month. And she also had a hard of hearing since one month. And there were no history of earache, giddiness, ringing sensation, or facial asymmetry. And there is no history of change in voice or dysphagia, or trismus, or headache. On the clinical examination, we noted a friable pinkish proliferative mass coming from the right ear canal 
which is extending up to the concave, which is bleeding on touch and non-sensitive. On uh, we were not able to pass the probe all around. On ECK examination, level two and level three lymph nodes were noted. On tuning fork test, negative Rini's test and Weber lateralized to the right side, which suggests right-sided conductive hearing loss. On investigation, otoendoscopy guided biopsy was done preoperatively to confirm the diagnosis. Pure tone audiometry, HRCT temporal bones, and routine blood investigations were done. And this is the preoperative histopathological examination, which is uh, showing polygonal cells with eosinophilic cytoplasm and keratin pearls, which suggests it is a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, probably arising from external auditory canal. The HRCT temporal bones was done to know the extent of the tumor and for the surgical management. This is the coronal cut, which is showing a hypodense lesion in the right external auditory canal. With the breach of the tympanic membrane, it invaded the middle ear and mastoid cavity. And the floor is also eroded. Floor of the external auditory canal is also eroded and suggesting the metastasis into the intraparotid uh, nodes also. Pure tone audiometry showed right sided moderate conductive hearing loss and left mild conductive hearing loss. The patient was staged clinically according to modified Pittsburgh staging, that is T3, N2, B, M0, and overall staging is stage 4, which is an advanced tumor. The surgical procedure which was planned was right lateral temporal bone resection plus superficial parotidectomy with selective neck node dissection followed by adjuvant radiotherapy. We started with giving a craniotemporal cervical incision, then mucopericondial flap was elevated anteriorly and posteriorly. The blind sac closure of the EAC was done. The mastoid drilling was initiated. Initiate was canal wall up, then later proceeded to canal wall down mastoidectomy. You can see the tumor tissue in the cavity. Then facial nerve was delineated and intraoperatively the decision was made to sacrifice the facial nerve due to the infiltration of the tumor. Then identify, uh, identification of the vital neurovascular structures was done. This is a facial nerve with upper and lower division and the, along with the parotid gland and um, great vessels of the neck like carotid, internal jugular vein, all that was delineated. Then finally the cavity was obliterated with abdominal fat. This is the resected specimen showing the end block removal of the uh, medial half of the EAC along with the superficial lobe of the parotid. Then finally, wound closure was done. On immediate post op, the patient developed grade 4 facial, facial nerve palsy, which was managed conservatively. The wound healing was delayed and wound dehiscence was noted on POD 10, and secondary suturing was done twice for the patient. And the patient was uh, referred to the radiation oncologist, and patient is currently uh, undergoing radiotherapy. Discussion, the warning sign alerting to the possible temporal bone carcinoma, especially in this case is unilateral otoria, yeah. which is zero sanguinous and not responding to the topical antibiotics. The diagnostic modalities include combining CT and MRI for the tumor and ultrasonography for evaluating the intraparotid and cervical lymph nodes. The prognostic markers are staging of the tumor, nodal involvement, positive surgical margin, dural invasion and facial nerve involvement. The best survival rates can be achieved with end block extended temporal bone resection along with post-operative adjuvant radiotherapy. Conclusion, so even though it is a rare, potentially devastating tumor with a surgery which is really challenging, the early stage tumor have, have a favorable outcome with most of the case series is reporting the survival rate of 80 to 100 percent, whereas advanced stage tumor will have a poor prognosis, which can be improved by having a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. Here are my references. Thank you. Oh. Ah, hello. Yes, sir. Uh, oh. Dr. Lakshmi, you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Dr. Lakshmi. No, I want to talk. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What Sorry, do you call this surgery as? Sir, this is a lateral temporal bone resection, sir. Lateral temporal bone resection. Okay. So, if instead of doing surgery, can you give the radiotherapy to this patient? What will be the outcome? The uh, outcome will be uh, not good as surgical management, sir, because the surgery, uh, because the mass, we 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 can see the extensive nature of the tumor in this in raw pictures. So, radiotherapy will, won't be as effective as surgical management. Mm -hmm. How did you treat this facial nerve conservatively? You said conservative treatment we given. What conservative treatment yeah. you give to this facial nerve? It is not going to recover anyway. 
It yes, sir, it is not. So what what advice you are giving actually? What are sir, the problems uh, of this patient actually post op? Post operatively, uh, yes, sir. We know that it is. It, uh, she is going to develop um, facial nerve palsy, but future uh, we plan no, no, no. to do a facial nerve graft. No, no, what are the problems of this patient post operatively? I'm asking. Sir, uh, radiation exo uh, radiation therapy can have the uh, surgery, own surgery. Like surgical problems. Sur surgical one hearing loss will be there, sir. Oh. Hearing loss, hearing loss, and uh, injury to the vascular structures. Okay, thank you. You're unable necrosis. to understand the question. Next. Anybody is there? Was is close? Yes, sir. Uh, Doctor Unisa is yes, sir. last. Huh? Doctor Unisa, last presenter, sir. So now, fifty one is absent. No. Good morning. Ah, uh, fifty one is absent, sir. Yeah, yeah. Let me clarify. Fifty one is absent. Then yes, uh, now she is fifty three. Good morning, sir. No, no, no. Just no, no. Who's absent? Just let me have this point. Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You can share your screen. We can see it. We can Hello, see you. Continue. Start. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Akramanisa Sofia, and my case report is cavernous hemangioma of the maxilla. So, sinonasal malignancies account for about 1% of all the tumors, and cavernous hemangioma constitutes about 0.01% of the tumors of the maxilla. Though hemangiomas are common in the head and neck region, they are rarely found in the sinonasal area. Cavernous hemangioma is a venous malformation that occurs due to endothelial dysmorphogenesis from a lesion present at birth. These lesions are slow growing, usually asymptomatic, and tend to be locally destructive due to compressive effort. Here is my case. A 48-year-old male came to the hospital with chief complaints of left-sided nasal obstruction since three months and left-sided nasal discharge since three months. There is no history of trauma or bleeding from the nose. There were no other ear, nose, or throat complaints. He is a known case of hypertension since five years on regular medication. There were no comorbidities, other co no other comorbidities. Personal history and family history was not significant in relation to the case. On general examination, the general condition of the patient was fair and vitals were stable. On local examination, the nose was normal externally. On anterior rhinoscopy, the septum appeared midline. A 2 into 3 centimeter pinkish, smooth, soft mass was present in the left nasal cavity touching the septum. It was not sensitive to touch, but it was bleeding on touch. Functional tests revealed that airway patency was decreased on the left side. Posterior rhinoscopy revealed no significant findings. The ear, throat, and neck were normal. On diagnostic nasal endoscopy, the anterior rhinoscopy findings were confirmed, and the mass was seen arising from the left to middle meatus. The nasopharynx was clear. Routine blood investigations revealed the blood group to be A negative and hemoglobin to be 13.5 gram. All other routine investigations were normal. A non contrast computer tomography of paranasal sinuses, a well defined soft tissue lesion was seen in the left maxillary sinus with bony margins of 37 into 38 into 41 mm, causing compression of the floor of the orbit superiorly, nasal septum medially, and posterior lateral wall of the maxilla posteriorly. The patient was apprehensive about magnetic resonance imaging and hence it was not done. The plan was excision by Cadwell-Luck approach. Here are the intro pictures of the patient. The excise mass was sent for histopathological examination, which revealed large endothelial line spaces filled with blood connected by fibrous tissue stroma and a diagnosis of cavernous hemangioma of the maxilla was given. The post-op follow-up was uneventful. The patient was given a course of antibiotics, decongestant, and analgesic, and was advised regular nasal douching. On the first follow-up, the patient was fine and did not have any other complaints. Discussion. Cavernous hemangioma of the maxilla. The age, the most common age of presentation is 40 years. The male-to-female ratio is 1 is to 3. It is usually asymptomatic, but it can present with nasal obstruction, fullness of cheek, and epistaxis. It is benign, slow-growing, locally destructive due to compressive effort. Effect. The differential diagnosis include inverted papilloma, mucosal, aneurysmal bone cyst, and maxillary carcinoma. 
It can be managed by doing diagnostic nasal endoscopy, computer tomography of the paranasal sinuses, magnetic resonance imaging, followed by excision of the mass. It can be managed medically by in giving injections of corticosteroids and alpha-2 interferon. In surgical management, endoscopic approach or cadavalac approach can be used or medial maxillectomy can be done. Radiotherapy is still under research. Conclusion, symptoms of cavernous hemangioma of the maxilla may mimic chronic rhinosinusitis. Surgery for soft expansile masses of the maxilla must be done with vigilance. Cadwell luck is a good approach for cavernous hemangioma of the maxilla. Adequate blood reservation is a must. The chance of cavernous hemangioma may be 0.001%, but 100% importance must be given to each case. Here are my references. Thank you, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. How much was the intraoperative bleeding? It was around 300 ml, sir. No blood transfusion was done for this patient, sir. But since his blood group was A negative, we reserved the blood uh, beforehand, sir. No. Uh, how did you control the bleeding? Yes, sir. Uh, on uh, we did uh, pressure. Uh, we put pressure over the uh, area, sir. Okay. You have not used any cartridge or anything. Pottery was also used, sir. Suppose if there is a bleeding from the bone while doing surgery, yes, sir. how yes, will sir. you control? Bone wax can be used, sir, if it is from the bone. Otherwise, not stopping. Surgery cell or surgery flow can be used to, to uh, seal off the bony area, sir. Not stopping. Ligation of the uh, artery which is bleeding can be done, sir. Oh my God. Have you ever seen drilling over the bone to stop the bleeding? Yes, sir. We usually, uh, in uh, I have seen it in canal wall mastoidectomy, sir. We usually put the bone wax uh, over the sigmoid plate to stop any bleeding coming from the uh, bone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jay Prakash, sir. Sir, I'm very sorry. Uh, so much of time. No, Ramesh, no problem. So we have to do so many responsibility work like this also is academic events. We have yes, to sir. support. Uh, otherwise, uh, this will, this cannot be carried out. So if everybody <laughs> says no, yeah. so you can't see you are doing so much of uh, work. So we have to support you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. all the participants have done well, extremely well. And it is actually difficult for us to judge. And we have done to the best of our abilities and this one, judgment. Uh, Ramesh? Sir? Uh, I'll just uh, photograph this and send you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. The list of the, this one. And uh, see, there is a... Uh, uh, 40... And 41, no, they have just put the marks upside down. I put the arrows. 